Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend. Let us head fanfics. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series of What if Deku could alter and copy Quirk? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Honey, dinner's ready. Izuku Midoriya looked up from the Silver Age All Might figure he was holding. He had failed. The last 10 months of his life had been the most punishing and grueling of his life, yet they had also been the best. There was no way Izuku would get into UA, when he didn't even manage to score a single point in the practical exam. But All Might ask for one for all back since Izuku had failed? Izuku's grip tightened around the figure, fear clutching at his heart. Izuku, the katsudan is going cold, pushing down all the negative feelings. Izuku forced himself to smile. His mom had even made his favorite food for him to celebrate. I am coming. Izuku stood up, the springs of his bed creaking as he did, before carefully placing the All Might figure down, pushing his bedroom door open. Izuku's nostrils were assaulted by the glorious smell of his favorite food. Inko Midoriya looked up, smiling at the sight of her son. He was looking more and more like his father every day. It smells great, mom. Izuku exclaimed. Thank you. Mother and son took their seats, digging into their food. So good. Inko glanced at her son. Slow down, honey, savor it. Izuku lowered his chopsticks, nodding at his mom. All right. Returning to his food, Izuku forced himself to eat slower. The intense training plan he had been on for the last 10 months had left no time to eat at anything less than full speed. Izuku hissed in pain. It felt like his fingertips were on fire. Dropping his chopsticks, Izuku held his hand up, staring as strange squarish pads protruded from his fingertips. Is something wrong, honey? Lowering his hands, Izuku looked to his mom. I'm f fine, Izuku said, trying to assure Inko. I just had a little pain in my arm. Let me have a look. Inko reached out to examine Izuku's arm. Izuku yelped, pulling his arm away. There's in no need. Recovery girl fixed it up right away. Well, that's what present Mike said happened. Inko frowned. Wait, were you unconscious? Well yes, Izuku admitted, before backpedaling. I wasn't for very long. It's fine, Izuku. You don't have to hide things like this from me. Yue, called me while you were out. Inko placed her chopsticks down and raised her hand to touch Izuku's cheek. I'm your mom, I will always worry about you getting hurt, whether you become a hero or a programmer who never leaves their bedroom. Izuku gave a weak laugh, hyper aware of the pads on his fingertips. I know training to be a hero holds a risk of getting hurt. But I'm not going to stop you and hide you away in bubble wrap. I failed. Inko smiled at her son, tears flowing freely. No you didn't, how could you when you saved that girl? Isn't that what a hero does? Izuku looked up, tears glistening in his eyes. I don't think you can be a hero, Izuku. You already are a hero. The tears spilled down Izuku's face. Really, really. Izuku wiped away the tears. Back then, what I wanted you to say was, you can be a hero. Inko nodded. I should have said it then. I'm sorry, Izuku. Izuku shook his head. Don't be sorry. Izuku, it's every parent's responsibility to encourage their child's dream, I didn't. Silence fell as Izuku processed his mother's words. Inko suddenly smirked. So, when were you going to tell me about this quirk of yours? Er, it had only just manifested. Izuku responded, taking care to hide the pads from his mother. I'm still figuring it out. It kind of breaks me when I use it. Izuku watched the waves gently lap against the beach, unconsciously rubbing two of the finger pads together. He just barely managed to hide his sudden mutation from his mom before fleeing to his room after dinner was eaten. Izuku had stayed in there until Inko had gone to bed. Then he had snuck out, to Dagaba Beach. What was happening to him? Was this one for all? A dull crash sounded, followed by a cloud of sand whipping past Izuku. Turning, Izuku watched as All Might straightened his garish yellow suit before suddenly deflating, releasing a mouthful of blood. I know you got seriously injured but throwing up blood is a sign of an open internal injury. All Might wiped his mouth with a branded handkerchief. How astute of you, young Midoriya. Every time I use one for all my internal injuries reopen. Izuku nodded mutely. So, why did you ask me to come here at this hour? Oh, all right. Izuku opened his hand and held it out for All Might to see. These appeared a few hours ago. Could they have a link to one for all? Like your muscle form. All Might inflated, stroking his chin. Unlikely, my muscle form used to be my natural state before my injury. Oh oh, never fear. Called All Might in a tone entirely too loud to have the intended comforting effect. I know someone with a quirk who could help us out with this conundrum. Meet me here again tomorrow morning at 8. With that, All Might was gone, leaving Izuku with more questions than answers and a mouthful of sand. The 27th of February 2179. Ten months of waking up at 4 a.m. had left its mark on Izuku. He could no longer sleep in. So he'd gone for a run, a three-hour run. A year ago Izuku would have collapsed before even getting halfway. Now, he barely felt tired. The run had given Izuku time to think about the UA. Entrance exam. Even if he didn't get in, Izuku would become a hero. 
He still had a number of options. He could petition to enter the UA. General Education Stream, who admitted based on the general exam taken by applicants to all courses, as well as trying out for Ketsubutsu Academy, a newer, less prestigious school whose entrance exam was in three weeks' time. That would give him time to start training his new quirk. If all might let him keep it that is. Izuku Midoriya. Izuku looked up from where he stood. Leant against the railing of Dagaba Beach to see a plain, black sedan parked in front of him. Inside was a man dressed in an equally plain, black suit. I'm Detective Tsukachi, a friend of All Might's. Izuku paused. Was this some kind of trick? How do I know that? Izuku questioned. I I mean I'm not trying to be rude. It's All Might, and it. It's all right, kid, assured Tsukachi. Izuku's phone lit up and began blaring the All Might theme. Holding it up, Izuku saw the grainy image of All Might he had set as the man's contact image. Hello, young Midoriya. I'm afraid I ran into a few dastardly villains on my way to meet you. Denver Smash. Izuku flinched as he pulled the phone away from his ear. Clearly All Might was still fighting said villains. Sukachi chuckled. Here I thought I was the only one he did that to. I've asked Detective Sukachi to give you a lift. Izuku bobbed his head. I I understand. See you soon. The call went dead. Hop in, kid. Sukachi reached into his suit jacket and tossed Izuku a leather wallet. Flipping it open, Izuku examined the shiny gold badge and police force license with a picture of Tsukachi smiling back at him. Right. Izuku nodded and opened the car door, climbing into the passenger seat, while handing the license to Tsukachi. Are we going to a police station? Izuku wondered aloud as the car set off. Tsukachi smiled. I thought that was obvious. I'm not in trouble am I? No, no, assured Tsukachi with a chuckle. The specialist who's going to have a look at your quirk is a colleague of mine, Tokisei Shikaku. Oh okay, don't worry, both Tokisei and I know about one for all and All Might's injury. Oh, I see. Sukachi smiled again. I can see why he picked you to be his successor. Why? You wear your heart on your sleeve. Sukachi replied. But you have an iron core. We're here. That was quick. Izuku and Sukachi exited the car, turning upon hearing a whistling sound. You might want to step back, Midoriya. Izuku frowned. Why's that? I am here. All Might slammed down in front of Izuku, a villain over each shoulder, both unconscious. Ah, young Midoriya, you're here. All Might greeted as he handed the villains off to the police force. Izuku blinked. He was covered in dust and his hair blown back. Apologies, my boy. All Might brushed the dust off Izuku, nearly knocking him off his feet. I am fine. Izuku exclaimed as his brain caught up with reality. This way All Might, Midoriya, Sukachi said, guiding the two one for all users into the station and into a private room. As soon as the door shut, All Might returned to his true form, accepting a tissue from Tsukachi. Afternoon, Izuku yelped and jumped, turning to see a navy-haired man sitting on the sofa, a tea tray on the table in front of him. I'm Tokisei Shikaku, greeted the man, standing and holding his hand out to Izuku. Izuku Midoriya, All Might, good to see you. And you, Shikaku, take a seat, Midoriya, Tokisei urged, returning to his seat. Izuku nodded, sitting down next to Tokisei, while All Might and Tsukachi took the other sofa. T, offered Tokusei. Please, those villains have left me parched. Black, one sugar. Izuku paused, before nodding. Yes please. After a series of passing cups around and much clinking, everyone had their tea. So, I heard from All Might you're having a problem with one for all, stated Tokusei. Right, All Might gave it to me yesterday. Then, that evening these appeared. Izuku held out his hand, showing Tokusei the pads on his fingertips. Um, interesting. Tokusei mused, examining the pads. I'll explain my quirk before I use it on you. It's called Quirk Space. It allows me to enter a visual manifestation of my quirk and the quirks of those I touch. I use it to log the quirks of villains after they've been arrested. Wow, Izuku exclaimed, barely managing to stop himself from bombarding Tokusei with questions. I'll take you into my quirk space first to let you get acclimatized. Tokusei placed his hand on Izuku's arm, his eyes turning solid gray and glowing. Brace yourself. Izuku was falling down a tunnel of multicolored beams of light. Before he suddenly found himself standing in a white void with Tokusei, in front of him was a gray ball of energy, glowing white. That's my quirk. Tokusei walked forwards, placing his hand on the quirk ball as his eyes glowed again. Quirk space, manifested in Tokusei Shikaku, aged 4, on November 4, 2147. Type, emitter, allows the holder to enter quirk space and examine the quirks contained within. Tokusei's eyes returned to normal. Any questions? Izuku looked around the void. A dome of loose energy strands of all colors surrounded them. What are those? Junk data. Quirk DNA I inherited from my parents but didn't become part of my quirk. Tokusei answered. It's how quirks and the characteristics can jump generations. It's amazing. Wait is that the date? Questioned Izuku. Pointing to where the time and data was printed midair in black, the seconds ticking slower than normal. 
Right, that's the other part of my quirk. It allows me to see the past of a quirk space? Watch. Tokise held up his hand and rotated his wrist, the date running backwards and stopping on November 3rd, 2147. The quirk ball had shrunk, now no more than a spark of white energy. This is the day before my quirk manifested. Just watch as I roll the date forward. Izuku nodded, keeping a close eye on the quirk spark as time moved forward. The spark glowed bright, drawing strands of gray, navy and black energy from the dome towards it, fusing with them to create a quirk ball. I have so many questions, breathed Izuku, staring in wonderment. Are quirks based on our personalities at the point at which they manifest? Or is it just random? Are quirks predetermined when we're born? If so, do quirks affect the holder's personality? Tokusei shrugged. As far as I've been able to tell, whether our personality affects our quirk, or our quirk affects our personality, it's actually a bit of both. Now, how about we have a look at your quirk space? Izuku was falling through the rainbow tunnel again, but this time he was ready for it, making him far less disorientated when they entered Izuku's quirk space. The first thing Izuku noticed was the void. It was a different color, black instead of white. The second thing Izuku noticed was that there wasn't one quirk ball. There are two. T that's impossible. Izuku stuttered in disbelief. I am was quirkless. Looks like whoever diagnosed you was wrong. A hack no doubt. Tokusei commented. Let me guess, the second joint test. Izuku nodded mutely, trying to process what he saw before him, one dark green quirk, the other a brilliant red. That test was notoriously unreliable. It was scrapped a few years back after a kid diagnosed quirkless turned out to have a quirk that gave them extra joints. Izuku couldn't help himself, he snorted. That was my reaction too. Tokusei stroked his chin. Now, let's see what we're looking at. Reaching out, Tokusei touched the dark green quirk. As I thought, that's one for all. I didn't expect it to be green, admitted Izuku. It wasn't. In all might it's yellow and from what little he's said about his predecessor it was probably some shade of purple for her. So what's the other quirk? Grasping the red quirk, Tokusei activated his own power. Quirksmith, manifested in Izuku Midoriya, aged 4, on July 7, 2168. Type, emitter, allows the holder to alter the state of quirks and permanently copy the quirks of others upon contact. Tokusei whistled. That's one mighty powerful quirk. It doesn't make any sense. If I'd had this quirk since I was four I'd have copied hundreds of quirks since then. I have an idea why. Tokusei raised his hand and rolled time back 48 hours. One for all vanished, leaving Quirksmith alone, smaller and its color dulled. Quirksmith, manifested in Izuku Midoriya, aged four, on July 7, 2168. Type, emitter, allows the holder to analyze the state of quirks and copy the quirks of others for 0.08 seconds upon contact. It changed. Tokusei nodded, advancing time back to the present, returning Izuku's second quirk. The power of one for all caused your quirk to mutate, it strengthened it. All this time I thought I was quirkless, I had one. Izuku looked down sadly, before forcing himself to cheer up. Now, those pads on your fingers, I think I can guess how you got them. Tokusei grabbed quirk space with both hands and stretched, expanding it and revealing four more quirks inside of it. A pale green quirk giving off wavy, equally green lines, a pink quirk emitting rainbow light, a plain white quirk and an exact copy of Tokusei's own quirk. Let's try this one. Tokusei touched the pink quirk. Zero gravity. Manifested in Achako Uraraka, aged 4, on March 16, 2168. Type, emitter. Allows the holder to remove the gravity of solid objects upon contact with the pads of their fingertips. Zero gravity. That must have been from the girl at the entrance exam. She used her quirk on me to stop my fall. Try sensing the other two quirks. You copied mine after all, just physical contact will do, encouraged Tokusei. Izuku nodded, reaching out and touching the white quirk. Heel, manifested in Chiyo Shuzenji, aged 9, on August 9, 2111. Type, emitter, allows the holder to accelerate the target's healing process at the cost of the receiver's stamina. That must have been when Recovery Girl healed me. Then that means this must be. Touching the green quirk. Izuku's eyes glowed gray. Attraction of small objects, manifested in Inko Midoriya, aged 5, on April 23, 2142. Type, emitter, allows the holder to attract objects of lower mass than themselves via telekinesis. Last night, she touched my face, that must have been when I copied it. Looks like you can toggle quirks you copied on and off, trying turning zero gravity off, suggested Tokusei. Izuku nodded, concentrating on zero gravity, feeling its power before turning it off. His fingertips itched again, but when Izuku looked down, the pads were gone. Well then kid, looks like you've got a lot of work to do. Toshinori Yagi sighed as he slumped down onto his battered sofa, dressed in casual clothes that fit his withered frame. It had been a trying day. He didn't know what to do. When he had first met young Midoriya and offered to pass one for all onto him, Toshinori had brushed aside the boy's resemblance to all for one as a mere coincidence. But now, knowing what Izuku's original quirk was, it couldn't be ignored. 
Opening his laptop, Tashinori navigated to the police force database, searching for his successor, Izuku Midoriya. Born July 15, 2163, parents Hisashi Midoriya and Inko Midoriya Nijasuido. Clicking on Inko's file, Tashinori scanned it before checking the files of her adoptive parents. They all checked out, moving to Hisashi Midoriya's file. The number one hero frowned at the lack of a picture, as well as minimal and formal prior to 2161 and nothing in the last six years, like he had fallen off the face of the earth. Six years ago, Tashinori checked the date on the file. Hisashi Midoriya had not been seen since the day he had fought All for One. Could it be? Could young Midoriya's father really be him? All for One. Tashinori needed help, serious help. He needed. Hitting speed dial. Tashinori raised his phone to his ear and sighed. Murai, I have a problem. I think All for One has a son. And I gave him one for all. Tashinori prepared himself for what was to come. One week later, Izuku soared through the air, rolling as he hit the ground and back onto his feet, sprinting across Dagaba Beach. Reaching out to where attraction was stored in his quirk space, Izuku activated and pulled on a distant building as he jumped. Instead of pulling the object towards him in the same way as his mother used her quirk, Izuku was shot towards the building, augmenting the distance and speed of his jump. Rolling back onto his feet, Izuku continued his run, jumping and pulling himself forward repeatedly until he reached a line of stones in the sand. Izuku reached behind himself with attraction and pulled, negating his velocity. 102.80 Izuku smiled to himself as All Might called out his time. A new personal best for the 500 meters. Excellent, young Midoriya. All Might was in his true form, holding a stopwatch. Izuku nodded, releasing his hold on attraction from where it resided within Quirksmith. After Izuku had told All Might about his quirk the man had grown stilted and distant, excusing himself quickly. Yet the next morning All Might had texted him, asking him to meet him at the beach. There he had given Izuku a temporary training license issued by his hero agency with his usual gusto. Even then, Izuku could see it in his eyes. All Might was wary of him. All Might didn't trust him. He only spent as much time as strictly necessary for training with Izuku. So Izuku threw himself into training with his new quirks, improving the time needed to call on attraction, the weight limit of zero gravity, which was far lower than Uraraka's, and his own quirk. Izuku had lost himself for hours with his quirk space, disassembling and reassembling quirks to see how they worked, weaving in junk quirk data to alter a quirk's properties. However, Izuku had found too many alterations to a single quirk caused it to denature and become junk data. Fortunately he'd found this out with attraction and been able to copy it again, instead of zero gravity or quirk space. In his new, 14th notebook Izuku had broken down the drawbacks of his quirk. Only one quirk can be used at a time. Quirk copying on contact cannot be avoided. However zero gravity pads do not count as skin contact and can be activated independently of its quirk, as can other passive attributes. Quirk space is limited, maximum about 10 quirks, denatured quirks still take up space. Are quirks overwritten or does quirk space expand? Does that cause strain on the holder? Armed with his new knowledge, Izuku had made his first quirk alteration, to heal. Instead of using his lips as contact for the quirks, which would copy the target's quirk, and be pretty awkward, he changed it to the quirksmith immune finger pads. You're muttering again, Midoriya. Izuku's head snapped up to look at All Might as he stood in front of him. S sorry, how about you take the rest of the day off? All Might placed a stiff arm on Izuku's shoulder. Izuku nodded. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. You start your independent training tomorrow. I have preterm planning for you, eh? To do. Oh oh, I see. Izuku's head fell and his shoulders slumped. Why? Why had All Might lost faith in him? Did he think Izuku had been lying when he said he was quirkless? Was it because he couldn't handle one for all without his bones breaking? Did All Might think his quirk was evil? Was Quirksmith evil? Don't worry, once you're at UA, I will be taking you and your class for plenty of lessons. Izuku raised his head. All right, see you then. With that Izuku raced away, leaving All Might alone on the beach, the setting sun lighting him with an orange glow. Nana, what do I do? Tashinori sighed. He felt like a monster for pushing the boy away. After seeing his reaction to Yue, acceptance letter and the fact Tashinori would be teaching there, he knew he wasn't faking it. Izuku Midoriya had the heart and spirit of a true hero. In him, Tashinori could finally understand what Nana had seen in him all those years ago. Yet Murai's research had only raised more red flags on the enigma that was Hisashi Midori. Red flags that Tashinori couldn't overlook. Therefore he had to keep Midoriya at an arm's length, even if it made him feel like a villain. But he needed to do it without hurting the boy, like he was now. Tashinori clenched his fist, shifting into his muscle form. Look, it's All Might. Where did he come from? Tashinori sighed. Not again. I am leaving now like a normal person. All Might crouched down and rocketed into the air, soaring away from the beach in manner distinctly unlike a normal person. Shota Aizawa rubbed his eyes. Hitting the enter key, Shota resumed the footage on his laptop. 
watching a blonde-haired boy destroy robot after robot with explosions from his palms, leaving destruction in his wake. Switching to a word processing program Shota began to type. To summarize, Katsuki Bakugo, quirk, explosion, powerful and versatile. He's using it well, possesses a modicum of enhanced strength, unrelated to quirk, moderate potential, strong, well-utilized quirk. However, he has severe anger issues, a possible superiority complex, poor team skills. We'll fix that. Expulsion, unlikely. Next, ah, the problem child. Playing the footage of Midoriya destroying the Zero Pointer, Shota made a sound of disappointment. Izuku Midoriya, quirk superpower, no description. Made no effort to use quirk prior to Zero Pointer then suffered two broken legs and a broken arm when used once. Can't use Quirk without breaking his body, despite heroic sentiments. No potential, would be reliant on support items. Expulsion, highly likely. Moving to the next student, Shota opened the respective file. Watching the attached video files. Minoru minded Quirk pop off. Underuses his Quirk. The balls have high elasticity, could be used as a springboard to enhance speed. Excellent for capture and detainment. Middle school file indicates a lack of confidence and insecurity over height. Reputation for making perverse comments seems to be quiet. Shota, it's three in morning, you should be in bed. Rubbing his eyes, Shota looked up to see his boyfriend standing over him. Term starts tomorrow, Hizashi, and I haven't finished going through the one of student files. Hizashi grabbed the laptop from Shota's lap as he flopped down next to him. You can sleep, I'll finish this. Class 2D doesn't get back from their internships until next week. Shota smiled, before kissing Hazashi on the cheek and standing with a stretch. Sleep well. Hazashi opened the footage of Minda fighting the entrance exam robots, pausing the video every few seconds to take notes. What did I do to deserve you? Hazashi beamed. I know, right. And I'm all yours. Well until something better comes along that is. Shota shook his head in amusement at his boyfriend's antics. But Hazashi wasn't finished yet. For me that is, you've pretty much peaked. Night, Hazashi, love you. With that, Shota turned and made moves towards the bedroom. I love you too. Shota stopped, looking back at Hazashi, who was still totally focused on the footage. Did he even realize? Realize that that was the first he'd said. Shota smiled. The 11th of April 2179. This place is huge. Izuku raced down the corridor of UA. The last thing he wanted to be on his first day was late. Reaching a corner, Izuku yelped as a black-haired boy rounded it, crashing into him. Both boys went sprawling, a stack of papers fluttering to the ground. Scrambling to his feet, Izuku bowed. I am sorry. The other boy brushed himself off. I it's fine. Izuku did a double take. The other boy, it was like looking into a bizarre mirror. He was near identical to Izuku. The only things that set him apart were longer, messier black hair and silver, metal backpack. I'm Izuku Midoriya, by the way. Mikumo Akatani. The boy bent down to retrieve the stack of papers. A cheer, let me help. Reaching down, Izuku began to collect the papers, a quick glance showing that they were schematics for what looked like some kind of robot. W wow, these look pretty cool. Mikumo snatched the schematics from Izuku's grip. They're not a finished. Taken aback, Izuku paused before bowing. Then I look forward to when they are done. You must be support, right? All right. I'm hero. I look forward to working together. Izuku held out his hand. Makumo stared at the hand for a few seconds, before grabbing it and shaking it. Yeah, and me too. I'd better get going then, don't want to be later on the first day. Sprinting off, Izuku left a windswept and somewhat shaken Makumo in his wake, skidding to a halt. Izuku looked up at the massive door with one it designed into it with trepidation. Forty students, four admitted on recommendation, divided equally into two classes. I hope Kakin and that scary tall guy are in the other class. Izuku held up his gloved hands, black material protecting him from copying quirks, he still didn't know what his limit was. Taking a deep breath, Izuku heaved the door open, revealing the side of a large classroom filled with desks. Remove your feet from the desk. You are insulting not only our predecessors who used these before us but also the craftsmen who created them. Izuku cringed. It was the tall boy from the exam, berating Bakugo for his behavior. Not that he could particularly fault someone for being aggravated by Kakan. And, Bakugo snarled at the tall boy. Do I look like someone who gives a shit about that, extra? The boy gestured wildly with his arm. Your profanity is unnecessary and gratuitous. Bakugo sneered. Which pompous, silver spoon, rich kid hell school did you dribble out of? Some private academy. My name is Tenya Ida. Bakugo leaned forward in his seat, snarling. Sumi, huh, figures for a stuck-up elitist like you. I should do you a favor and blow you to bits now. You'll never last in the real world. Blow me to bits. You're awful, Ada exclaimed, recoiling slightly. Are you sure you really wish to be a hero? The door creaked over further, alerting Ada to Izuku's presence. Izuku gulped as Ada approached him, completely forgetting Bakugo's previous threat. Good morning, my name is Tenya Ida. I'm from Sumi Private Academy. 
So I've heard. Izuku's eyes widened and he clapped a hand over his mouth at his frank reply. As sorry, I I don't know what came over me. I'm Izuku Midoriya. Midoriya, you accurately determined the true nature of the practical exam when I did not. Ida gestured again. I apologize, I misjudged you. Curly hair. The plain looking boy. Izuku wheeled around to see the girl from the entrance exam. The one whose quirk Izuku had accidentally copied. You passed. Like present Mike said you did. I'm Achako Uraraka. Izuku panicked. She was so close. That punch of yours was awesome. T thanks. Well it wasn't. But, er thank you for speaking I in my defense. Izuku rubbed the back of his head. Huh. How do you know about that? Bakugo sneered at the display before him. Deku was always there. Mocking him with his quirklessness. Katsuki couldn't shake him. Not at Aldera and not at UA. Now, two weeks earlier. How wonderful that two of our students have made it into UA. Especially you Midoriya. That's a miracle we never expected. Katsuki slammed Deku up against the wall of the alleyway, holding him by his collar. Why did you do it, you quirkless piece of crap? Katsuki tightened his grip on Izuku. What dirty tricks did you use to do it? K. Kaken, I. Shut up. I was supposed to be the first one, the only one, to get in from this shitty middle school. My grand plans, you've torn them to shreds. Katsuki watched Deku's face change, hardening with resolve. I got in on my own merits. I earned this. Deku grabbed Katsuki's hand with his gloved fingers. Your grand plans. You're just selfish and mean and arrogant. Deku yanked at Katsuki's hand, freeing himself. How can you be a hero when you don't ever care about others? Katsuki staggered back. You fucking piece of shit. Lashing out, Katsuki punched Deku in the face, sending him sprawling to the ground. Deku held his cheek, looking up at his former friend. For as long as he could remember, Katsuki had always seen admiration in Deku's eyes, whether layered with excitement or fear. For the first time in his life, Katsuki Bakugo looked into Izuku Midoriya's eyes and saw hatred. For the first time in his life, Katsuki Bakugo didn't feel like a hero. Katsuki continued to glare at Deku. The spineless freak had actually stood up to him. Something fishy was going on with Deku and soon everyone at UA. See how useless he was. Round face continued to talk Deku's ears off. So we've got our entrance ceremony and guidance sessions today, right? I wonder what our teachers will be like. I'm so nervous. Are you? Am I rambling? I think I'm rambling. If you're here to socialize, then get out. Useless Deku yelped as he and round face turned around. Katsuki examined the bizarre yellow caterpillar lying on the floor of the corridor. This is the hero course. The caterpillar gave a sucking noise, a juice pouch peeking out of the hole. I, I think there's someone in there. You don't say, raccoon eyes. Bakugo slammed his hand against his other palm. Izuku jumped, broken from his thoughts. The caterpillar sprung upright, silencing the class, before unzipping to reveal a long-haired man with a gray scarf wrapped around his neck. It took eight seconds for you to quiet down. Time is a precious resource. Izuku tilted his head. Their teacher looked familiar, could he be an underground hero? The teacher stared back at the boy. Izuku felt like he was being judged. Was it because he was the one who blew three limbs to hell in the entrance exam? Yuraraka looked back and forth between Izuku and the teacher as the seconds began to drag on. I'm your homeroom teacher, showed Aizawa. Pleased to meet you all. A stunned, somehow even quieter silence fell over the classroom. This raggedy, exhausted-looking man was their homeroom teacher. Aizawa pulled a bundle of cellophane packets out of his sleeping bag. Now, put on your gym clothes, then head out into the grounds. But what about the entrance ceremony? Izuku looked across at Yuraraka, the girl looked distraught. Or the guidance sessions. You want to be a hero, don't you? Aizawa stared at Yuraraka, eyes boring into her soul. Yuraraka gave a timid nod. Then we have no time to waste on stuff like that. You have ten minutes to get changed. With that, Aizawa set off, leaving everyone scrambling to catch up to him. Mikumo kept his head low as Power Loader introduced himself to the class. Here in Class 1H you represent the next generation in support. Power Loader walked over to his desk come workbench, placing a briefcase down on it. That means something. When you leave here in three years' time you will be responsible for creating and testing the costumes and support gear of Pro Heroes. Power Loader slowly opened his briefcase. Pro Heroes that rely on that gear to keep them safe. Therefore, I have one rule, just one rule. Go nuts, design whatever you want, push the boundaries of technology, but the result must always be safe. Otherwise, it meets Dusty. The briefcase slammed shut, making all nine students jump, some rather more than others. In Power Loader's grip rested a large, red and silver fire axe. A pink-haired student raised her hand. Why's it called Dusty? Power Loader smiled. Cause you better hope it stays dusty. A round of titters passed through the classroom. That wasn't a joke. Silence reigned. Power Loader turned around, placing Dusty on a wall mounting behind his desk. Any equipment that doesn't meet both UA. And my own personal standards for safety goes to the great junkyard in the sky and you start over. Understood. A vague mumble was his only reply. I said, understood. 
Yes, power loader. Better. Now one by one you are all going to show off the equipment you presented at the entrance exam and the improvements you have made since then. A wave of agreement passed through the classroom. Right then, let's go in class order. Who's first? Makumo paled. Number one, Makumo Akatani, you're up. All right, okay. Placing his metal backpack on the workbench, Makumo pressed a glowing button on the front. The panels of the backpack lifted away from the main body, shifting to open up two ports, metal handles protruding from each. Gripping the metal, Makumo pushed his hands into the backpack, causing a section of the backpack to detach as he pulled them away. Gear word at the panels shifted into their final positions, revealing a set of gauntlets. Hum, so you've streamlined the deployment process since the exam then. Makumo nodded, acutely aware of his classmates' eyes analyzing him, before he held up his left hand. Why yeah, the backpack storage system also makes them more portable. I changed the alloy composition of the grappling line to increase its tensile strength. Power loader nodded with approval. Do they meet the safety standards? Makumo nodded quickly. Absolutely. I added a shock-absorbing polymer weave to both gauntlets to lessen the impact on the user's arms. Give them a go then. Power loader gestured to an open space at the back of the classroom with a dummy placing in the center. Taking a deep breath, Makumo paused. Before walking into the testing space, the metal soles of his orange sneakers clanging with every step. Raising his left arm, Makumo aimed at the far wall and fired his grappling line. Pressing down the button on his palm to line retracted, shooting Makumo towards the wall. Turning in midair, Makumo recalled his grappling line, aiming his metal sneaker soles at the wall. Before he could crash into the wall repulsor blasts fired from Makumo's metal soles, propelling him back away from the wall and directly at the dummy. Pulling back his right arm, Makumo punched the dummy in the chest as he shot past, snapping it in two. Firing his grappling line at a pillar, Makumo swung in an arc around it and landed on his feet, repulsor blasts slowing him to a halt. Makumo turned back to face his class to see their shocked faces. How are we supposed to follow that? Nehatsum stared at Makumo with a predatory look in her yellow eyes. Together they would make amazing babies. A test of quirks. Izuku was panicking, his hands clenching the material of his new UA. Gym kit. The class came to a halt in the middle of an athletics field. Izuku couldn't use one for all. Well, not at first, his bones would break again. He'd have to rely on his other quirks then. An elbow dug into Izuku's ribs, startling him. Quit mumbling, Deku. Izuku nodded, suddenly feeling for all over again. All right, here are UA. We don't operate like a normal school, our education is more freestyle. Aizawa paused for what Izuku could only assume was dramatic effect. Perhaps the teacher had more in common with the sparkly boy than he thought. Today we will be doing the standard no quirks allowed test. I'm sure you all did them in middle school. Japan is woefully out of touch. The government still insists that the test must be carried out by all students before high school without use of their quirks. But it's just not rational. The Department of Education is just scared of change. So now, you'll be doing them again. This time with your quirks. Whispers shot through the class, before being extinguished by a glare from Aizawa. Back Hugo, you came top in the entrance exam. What was your score for the softball throw in middle school? 67 meters. Back Hugo soaked in the wave of impressed murmurs coming from the extras around him. Well then, do it again, except this time don't hold back, use your quirk. A manic grin split back Hugo's face, before he shoved past Izuku, almost knocking him over. Do whatever you want, just say inside the circle. Whatever, I'll add a bit of boom to this snooze fest. Back Hugo palmed the softball, before pulling his arm back and throwing it, releasing an explosion as he did. Die. The flaming softball rocked through the air, becoming little more than a speck in the distance, a wave of dust blowing over the class. I know what you're all thinking, is it a bit gratuitous? But, you'll never be an effective hero if you don't know your limits and how to surpass them. Aizawa held out a digital display. 705.2 meters. Izuku paled. He hadn't been expecting this. He would just have to hope attraction and zero gravity could carry him through while still looking like super strength. The last thing Izuku wanted was for everyone to find out about his quirk on the first day. A quirk even All Might thought was evil. Over 705 meters. That's so manly. This is going to be awesome. Awesome, you say. Do you think this is going to be fun? The pink-haired girl with the horns gulped. And Mr. Aizawa. Being a hero isn't a joke, it's dangerous. Every time you go out on patrol you have to know you might not be coming back. Aizawa stared at the pink girl. So then, whoever finishes in last place will be expelled. Do you think that's awesome? Izuku's widened with fear, a low hiss escaping his lips. Shit. Clapping a hand over his mouth, Izuku dropped it when he realized his expletive had gone unnoticed in a sea of shouts and comments from his classmate. Aizawa's eyes flashed red for a moment, silencing the class. You're here to be heroes aren't you? Did you think it would all be fun and games? Yuraka spoke up. But it isn't fair. Of course it isn't fair, life isn't. 
It isn't fair when a villain attacks a school or an uncontrollable quirk causes a train to crash. Aizawa's eyes bored into Uraraka, making her shuffle nervously. Life isn't fair, life isn't kind, that's why a hero must be instead. Nobody spoke, nobody even made a sound. Not even Bakugo. But that's settled we can start. First up is the 50 meter dash, Minta, Sato, Shoji and Todoroki, you're up first. Izuku watched the four students line up as he formulated a plan. He could use zero gravity to remove the weight of his clothes, as they weighted far less than his 10 kilograms limit, then use attraction to look like a super strength powered long jump. He's so intense. Izuku looked up to see Uraraka and Ida had congregated around him. Who's that? Aizawa or Kakin? Uraraka tilted her head to one side. Who's Kakin? Izuku flushed red. Er, Bebek Hugo. I've known him all my life. Our mums have been friends since before we were born. How cute. Ida frowned. Cute would not be the word he would use to describe Bek Hugo. Volatile, that would be sufficient. W well it's not really. We used to be friends when we were kids, until we got our quirks. After that, we never saw eye to eye again. Ha, huh, your quirks, explosions and super strength, they seem pretty on par with each other to me. Uraraka smiled. Izuku was panicking. This was not how he wanted his quirkless past to come to light. Hagakure, Bekugo, Ashido and Midoriya, you're up. Looks like it's my turn. Izuku awkwardly excused himself and made his way to the start line. Taking a deep breath, Izuku prepared to reach into his quirk space. I'm going to crush you, Deku. Bakugo glared at Izuku. His voice alone has so only he could hear it. I'm going show them all what a quirkless waste of space you are. Izuku flinched. Aizawa sounded the buzzer. Was Bakugo right? Izuku had no power of his own. It was all given or copied. It didn't belong to him. Bakugo and the two other competitors started. The former blasting off with his quirk, while the pink girl with horns slid along on a liquid secreted by her feet. The invisible girl sprinted as fast as she could, her quirk useless in this event. You can do it, Deku. Something ignited inside of him. Izuku's feet moved before he could think, activating attraction and pulling on the far building. Shooting forwards, Izuku flew past the two girls, crossing the line just behind Bakugo. Bakugo, 4.13 seconds. Midoriya, 5.47 seconds. Izuku sighed in relief, not noticing as Aizawa's eyes zeroed in on him. Moving to the sidelines, Izuku kept his distance from the other students and especially Bakugo, left with only his thoughts, who had encouraged him. Using that name, probably one of the girls considering the high pitch. Had he imagined it, Izuku pushed the thoughts away just in time for the second event, grip strength. On his turn, Izuku again turned to attraction. Pulling on the handle to enhance his natural strength, using one for all right now would probably break his arm and the grip tester. 113 kilograms. Izuku wiped the sweat from his forehead. Hopefully a good score like that would keep him out of last place. Whoa, 504 kilograms. What are you, a gorilla, an octopus? Izuku wheeled around. The six-armed boy was crowded by other students, all marveling at his score. He suddenly felt a lot less confident about his own score now. The purple ball boy was staring at his six-armed classmate, murmuring under his breath. Octopuses are sexy. Tentacles. Rubbery. Izuku shuddered, deciding to give that guy a wide berth. The third and fourth events passed quickly, with Izuku again using attraction, this time on the long jump. But his enhanced distance was still not enough to clear the sandbox. The sidestepping event had been even more of a disaster. Attraction couldn't alternate that quickly and zero gravity was too weak for Izuku to cancel anything more than his clothes. A wave of applause rippled through the class, jerking Izuku back to the present. Hiroraka had used zero gravity on her softball throw, earning her a score of infinity. Aizawa sighed. That's not coming down, is it? Hiroraka shook her head. Everyone was excelling in at least one event. Even the boy with purple balls for hair, Minta, was doing well. His quirk had allowed him to ace the sidestepping event, beating everyone else in the class. Midoriya. Izuku nodded, taking off his right glove as Aizawa handed him the softball. Stepping into the circle Izuku formulated a plan. Attraction was useless for this. His other quirks were either irrelevant or too flashy. It would have to be zero gravity. Midoriya doesn't look like he's doing too well and he started so strong. Ida gestured wildly with one arm. You should not be talking about a fellow student behind their back. But yes, Midoriya is doing very poorly. Bakugo snorted with derision. Of course a quirkless runt like Deku can't keep with me. Quirkless. Uraraka tilted her head, looking at Bakugo. What do you mean, Kakan? Don't call me that. What the fuck have you been telling people, D.E.K.U.? Izuku ignored Bakugo, before pulling his arm back and calling on zero gravity. He'd have to release it quickly. His limit with the quirk was much lower. If he threw up it would be obvious he was using the same quirk as Uraraka. You can be a hero. All might, I'll make you proud. I'll become a hero. Izuku threw the ball. 48 meters. Izuku couldn't feel his quirks, reaching out for his quirk space. He found nothing. His quirks were gone. Izuku threw the ball. 
48 meters. His quirks were gone, Izuku couldn't feel them. Reaching out for his quirk space, Izuku found nothing. His breathing was getting faster and shallower. I erased your quirk. Izuku looked up, seeing Aizawa staring back at him, his eyes glowing red and his hair floating above his head. Why your eraser head? Aizawa continued to stare directly at Izuku, before his eyes returned to normal and his hair fell limp. Izuku felt his quirks return. So cool. Izuku's fanboy nature eclipsed the panic he'd felt at being quirkless again, especially since he could feel them resting comfortably in his quirk space. You are a prime example why the UA entrance exam isn't fit for purpose, said Aizawa, just loud enough so that only Izuku could hear him. A small squeak slipped from Izuku's lips. You were going to use your quirk just then, weren't you? The green-haired boy nodded. He wasn't technically lying. He had just decided not to correct Aizawa about which quirk he was going to use. Izuku wouldn't, couldn't, tell anyone about Quirksmith. Aizawa sighed. Then you would have turned the bones in your arm to dust. Izuku felt affronted. But, then you'd be no help to anybody. A liability in every fight you'd be in. Aizawa paused. Like that, with your impractical quirk, you have no potential as a hero. His cheeks ablaze with shame. Izuku hung his head. So I'm going to make this simple, you're expelled. Izuku's heart dropped as he fought back tears. The months of training, all for nothing on the first day. He's been looking forward to learning and training with the next generation of heroes, like Uraraka and Ida, and working with support students like Mikumo. His life's dream, it was crushed all over again. Because Izuku was scared to show his real quirk. He felt like an idiot, a failure. Aizawa stared down at the boy, seeing the look in his eyes. He knew that look, guilt mixed with fear. Midoriya was holding back, he'd seen it in the other tests, glancing down at the spare softball resting in his palm. Ready for the next student to throw, Aizawa took a careful breath and made a decision. That is what I'm going to say after you throw the ball again. Izuku's head shot up to stare at Aizawa. Unless your throw manages to convince me that you have potential as a hero. Izuku took the offered softball, staring at it. He could use one for all, breaking his arm and being expelled from UA. Or he could use Quirksmith and maybe not get expelled. His decision wasn't even hard. Izuku would choose to be a hero, even if he was hated for his quirk. Lifting his arm back, Izuku began his throw and entered his quirk space, glancing around the black void. Izuku looked to the time, activating another facet of quirksmith. Time dilation. While inside a quirk space Izuku could slow the time he experienced. His current maximum was 30 seconds for every one second in the outside world. That meant he had a minute before the ball left his physical hand. Izuku rushed forward and expanded Quirksmith to show the copied quirks it contained. I'll have to hold zero gravity on the ball for as long as possible, around 15 seconds. Izuku rested his chin on his hand, activating the quirk in his physical hand and negating the ball's gravity. Izuku continued looking through his quirk, disregarding heel and quirk space immediately. Attraction's no use, that just leaves. Explosion. Izuku had copied it from Bakugo when the other boy had punched him in the face. He'd only tried it out a few times in the last two weeks. His explosions were far weaker. After all, Bakugo had been using and training with it since they were four. But it would just have to do. While Izuku could normally only use one copied quirk at a time, this didn't extend to passive parts of a quirk. Thus, Izuku would be able to use explosion to propel the ball while maintaining its lack of gravity. He just wouldn't be able to remove or return the gravity to the ball or anything else. But that wouldn't be a problem. Confident in his strategy, Izuku prepared to exit quirk space when his eyes landed on one for all. Should he use it? No, he couldn't. Izuku couldn't afford to break his arm, but he did have 30 seconds. He could at least have a look, expanding one for all. Izuku examined the structure of the quirk, smaller energy spheres connected by strings of light. Huh, that's a passive trigger. Izuku cocked his head. That must be the power accumulation aspect of the quirk. Izuku knew Aizawa was right about one thing. He couldn't be a hero if one punch left him a liability. He had to focus his power on what he could do. Wait, focus my power. That's it. Izuku knew what to do. Returning to the physical world. Izuku charged his arm with the red energy of one for all, focusing it all in his index finger as the ball left his hand, before activating explosion. The ball was consumed by a massive orange explosion, larger than what Bakugo had produced earlier, before it broke free of fire and rocketed away. A massive gust of air blasted back at Izuku and the rest of Class 1A. Calling on attraction, Izuku pulled on the ground below him to counter the backdraft. Aizawa has made it clear he had to stay in the circle while his classmates were knocked off their feet behind him. As the backdraft cleared away, Izuku straightened up, staring in disbelief as the ball vanished into the distance. He felt like he was forgetting something. Izuku's stomach made an odd jolt. Oh right, zero gravity. Releasing his hold on the ball, its gravity returned, barely giving Izuku time to stop himself from retching. Looking down at his right hand, Izuku examined his index finger, 
It was clearly broken, but not as badly as his arm and legs had been during the entrance exam. Clenching his fist, Izuku turned to a windswept Aizawa. My arm's not broken. I can still fight. 1,672.9 meters. Of all the things Izuku was expecting his homeroom teacher to do, grin like a madman was not one of them. So, your quirk isn't super strength then. Izuku paused before scrunching his face, mostly in pain. Well kind of, but also not at all. Well, did he just use Kakan's quirk? Don't call me that, round face. Turning to face his classmates. Izuku prepared himself to see disgust and hatred. He was a quirk stealer, just like the ones in the cartoons he had watched as a child. That was Trez stylish. 1670 meters. That's super manly. You say everything is manly. It's over double Bakugo's score, Kiro. Bakugo clenched his fists. Izuku could practically see the flashback to their fight in the alley in his eyes. Fucking explain yourself, you lying shit. Rocketing forwards, Bakugo aimed his explosions behind himself. I'll fucking kill NGG. The scarf around Aizawa's neck had moved, restraining Bakugo in midair, his quirk erased. Bakugo struggled in vain. This cloth, it's stiff. Izuku heard a giggle from Maita. Aizawa sighed. This is my capture weapon. It's woven from special alloy wire and carbon fiber. Let me go. Damn it kid, would you stop using your quirk already? My dry eye is bad enough as it is. Deku, what the fucking fuck did you do? You had no power of your own so you took it from someone else. Izuku hung his head. So you can copy quirks. That's super cool. Uraraka gave Izuku a peace sign as his head shot back up. Well I guess it is. Izuku rubbed the back of his neck. I I thought I was quirkless. Until I touched someone with a power amplification quirk. Uraraka threw her fist up into the air. Wow, that means you copied my quirk as well, at the exam. Izuku held up his hand to show the pads on his fingertips. Why yeah, that's how I realized what my quirk was. I thought it was just super strength before the pads appeared. Your weight limit must be pretty low then. I can show you how to increase it if you want. Really? Uh-huh, isn't being a hero all about teamwork? As riveting as this conversation is, let's get on with the rest of the tests. Aizawa dropped Bakugo to the ground, keeping his capture weapon wrapped around the teen's wrists. Am I gonna crush you, Deku? Aizawa glared at Bakugo. You're going to do no such thing. Either you shut up and get on the tests, or you keep on acting out and I disqualify you from the remaining events. Then I'd be in last. Aizawa grinned. Exactly. Bakugo grunted. TCH, whatever, Chidi Deku isn't worth it anyway. Izuku sighed in relief as Bakugo was released from Aizawa's scarf and went to sulk at the back of the class. Aizawa sighed. What a waste of time. Now get on with the rest of the tests, before I expel you all. Is your finger okay? Izuku smiled at Yuraka's earnest expression. Why yeah, I'm fine. Fine, your finger is broken. Ida was waving his arm again. Are you sure you can continue? It's not as bad as it looks. I think it's just fractured. Using explosion at the same time as my strength must be why. Of course, Bakugo's quirk must come with some kind of shock absorption for his hands. Ida gave Izuku a serious look. Izuku nodded. All right, otherwise he'd be breaking his hands all the time. Aizawa wouldn't expel all of us, would he? Iraraka tilted her head. Of course not. He just wants us to give our all. Izuku, Yuraka and Ida turned to see a tall, dark-haired girl. Yeyurazu, I'm glad to see you got into UA. Thanks, Ida. Yeyurazu nodded her head. Yuraka bounced on the ball of her feet. You two know each other. We met at the recommendations exam. Yeyurazu smiled. Izuku lost the ability to talk. But you were at the normal entrance exam. Pondered Yuraka. I placed sixth in recommendations. Ida looked downcast. They only accept the top four. You still made it in didn't you? Ida perked up. You're right, Yuraka. Ada, softball throw. Coming, Mr. Aizawa. The last three events passed quickly, with Izuku managing decent results in each of them. For the endurance running attraction had allowed Izuku to place seventh, while in the upper body training and seated toe touch none of his quirks were applicable, forcing him to fall back on All Might's training. Aizawa cleared his throat to get the class's attention. Be quiet, it's time for the results. Izuku clenched his right fist, squeezing his fractured finger. He just had to hope he had managed to stay out of last place. Aizawa pressed a button on his phone, activating a hologram that displayed the final results. 17th. Izuku sighed in relief. It wasn't impressive, but it would be somewhere to work from. The purple boy cried out at the sight of his name in last place. Also I was lying. No one's getting expelled. A wave of shouts came from the class as Aizawa grinned, his scarf floating around his neck. It was a logical ruse. How else were you going to give it your all? Izuku tilted his hat. Huh, Yeyurazu was right. Third, I got fucking third. Bakugo's hands crackled with explosions. Aizawa ignored the explosive team. Your curriculum and orientation packs on your desks. The rest of the day is free for you to explore the school. Lunch starts at half twelve. Don't miss it. Lunch rush won't cater for your tardiness. The class stayed where they were, still in shock. 
What are you still doing here? Aizawa's eyes suddenly shone. Do you want homework or something? In seconds the class dispersed, heading for the changing rooms at speed. Midoriya, stay behind. Izuku peeled away from Yuraka and Ida, walking back to his teacher. Go see recovery girl. Aizawa held out a medical slip, with Izuku's name written on it. Should I be keeping a stack of these on hand pre-written for you? Izuku shook his head. Don't worry Mr. Aizawa, I'm going to find a way to overcome the recoil. Aizawa chuckled. I'll hold you to that. Now clear off, problem child. Izuku blushed at the nickname, before racing off after his newfound friends. This kid, Aizawa sighed and shook his head. Setting off for the faculty lounge, Aizawa pulled out a bottle of eye drops. Aizawa, you liar, acting on instinct. Aizawa flicked the eye drops at the source of the voice, turning. Aizawa rolled his eyes at the sight of All Might, the tiny bottle comically small in the number one hero's giant hand. You appear to have lost this. Aizawa took the drops back. For such a large man you are remarkably quiet. All Might coughed. Well, what can I say? I don't care, HM. Well then, what I was going to say was, you lied. All Might held up the UA. Faculty registry. You expelled the entirety of your last class. I later readmitted them. Aizawa used his eye drops, blinking rapidly. I did it to be kind, they had no potential. Giving them that shock is what they needed. Another of your logical ruses, then? Aizawa ignored All Might's question. All Might fidgeted at the heavy silence. And this year, better than average. Nedzu must have put all the ones with no potential in Vlad's class so he can coddle them. Aizawa slipped the eye drops back into his pocket. They didn't need the same kind of wake-up call as the last lot. Just an idea of what would happen if they thought being a hero is fun and games. That's a bit harsh. Will you still be saying that if one of them dies? All Might gave a muffled grunt. Guys, Aizawa glanced back at the symbol of peace. Aburo Shurikumo. Aburo Shurikumo. We were classmates, here at UA. We interned together with his purple highness. Aizawa paused, hanging his head. We fought a villain, Garve, protecting a class of elementary kids. Aburo died protecting them from a collapsing building with his quirk. All Might frowned. If your friend had been expelled then the children. Aburo had plenty of potential. The one with no potential was me. Aburo died because I wasn't good enough. Silence fell as All Might processed Aizawa's words. Anyone can become a hero, but not everyone can be a hero. That's why I expel those with no potential to be a hero. With that, Aizawa began to walk away. All Might sighed. He knew that pain, that guilt. He had bared it for years after Nana's death. Only truly letting go after the fight with all for one that had crippled him. Aizawa, it wasn't your fault. That villain chose to attack those schoolchildren. Never blame yourself for the decisions of others, decisions you can't change. Aizawa snorted, as touching as that is, encouraging mantras don't save lives. All Might held his tongue as Aizawa left, his left hand subconsciously touching his injury. S-M-O-O-O-C-H. Izuku flexed his hand, marveling at his healed finger. Tut tut, classes haven't even started yet and I've had to heal you twice already. Oh, right, thank you recovery girl. You're welcome young man, just try not to come back again soon. Recovery girl reached into his pocket. Here, accepting the small packet of gummies, Izuku stared at them. Thanks, um, I I actually had a question about your quirk. My quirk, you certainly can. Er, well, my quirk permanently copies other quirks on contact. I copied it when you healed me at the entrance exam. Izuku paused, rubbing the back of his head. Can your quirk heal yourself? I didn't want to risk trying it in case it backfired on me. Interesting quirk you've got there. And no, I can't heal myself, it has no effect. Oh, okay, thanks for telling me. I assume that this is a recent development? Izuku nodded. Could you describe your quirk to me so I can update your quirk data on the UA? Internal system. As sure. It's called Quirksmith. When I touch someone I permanently copy their quirk so long as I don't already have a copy. I can also manipulate and alter the quirks I copy. Recovery girl looked interested. What is the limit of your alteration of a quirk? My mom's quirk allows her to attract objects. I tried to alter my copy to repulse objects instead, and the quirk just kinda fell apart. HM, there we are, quirk description updated. Although, I do have a suggestion for you. Izuku looked up. You do, find a quirk to negate the damage from one for all. What? One for all? What's that? Never heard of it. Have you? Why am I still talking? Why can't I stop? I know about one for all. Recovery girl sighed. Who do you think treats the great Lumux when he pushes himself too far? Izuku remained still as recovery girl waved her cane in front of the boy's face. I believe you've broken him. All might. Izuku spun around to see his idol enter the nurse's office. Young Midoriya, your throw. Before he could continue, recovery girl wrapped him with her cane. No encouraging the boy to injure himself again. Shio, you hear me, no more injuries. Izuku jumped up to his feet. I it's fine, recovery girl is right. I need to find a quirk to reduce the damage from one for all. All Might flinched. Izuku noticed, pushing down the feeling of fear that pulled at his heart. 
I'm going, going to go now, I don't want to miss lunch. Izuku bowed in thanks to Recovery Girl and fled at speed. The sound of Izuku's footsteps hurried faded, leaving Recovery Girl and All Might alone in the office. Phew. Oh. Absolute. Oh. Idiot. Oh. Recovery Girl punctuated each word by hitting All Might with her cane. All Might deflated, wiping blood away from his mouth. Are you trying to give the boy a complex about his quirk? Toshinori sighed and hung his head. I know, I know. I can't help it. Every time he mentions his quirk, all I can think of, all I can see is that quirk, that man. Recovery girl lowered her cane. I know I've said this time and time before. You need to consider therapy. You suffered a life-changing injury, like the rest of the faculty hound dog is aware of your injury. I'll do it. So sensitive information isn't at risk. I'm sorry, pardon. I'll do it. Turning to her computer, recovery girl began typing. I'll book you in for a session with Ryo next week. Thank you, Chio. May I ask you, why now? After I've asked so many times before. Tashinori balled his fist. I'm hurting him, I'm hurting Midoriya. I need to be better, for him. Deku, Izuku flinched, nearly dropping his tray. Over here, it was Yuraka. Walking over to the table, Izuku slowly sat down, across from Yuraka and next to Ida, with Yeyurazu at one side of Yuraka and the frog girl, Suyu, at the other. It was you, the 50 meters, you know you can do it, Deku. Yuraka tilted her head. Yeah, your name is Deku right. It's what Bakugo called you before the test. Izuku clammed up. W-well, my name's actually Izuku. Deku is another reading of my name, Kaken, I mean Bakugo, he uses it to mean useless. Yuraka blushed. I'm so sorry, it just gave me a you-can-do-it feeling. That is a mean thing to say. But I am not surprised considering Bakugo's conduct today. He seems unstable, Kiro. Izuku resisted the instinct to tell Yuraka that it was fine for her to call him Deku. He had left Bakugo behind. He would leave Deku behind too. I it's fine, you didn't know it was an insult. What about Dekaru? Yeyurazu offered. Dekaru, wondered Izuku as he turned his head to look at the black-haired girl, noticing the sheer amount of food on her plate. If Bakugo uses Deku as an insult, take it back from him. Dekaru, I like it. It's super cute. Ida chopped the air. Bakugo really is disrespectful and arrogant. I can hear you, you fucking extra. Izuku turned to see Bakugo sitting at the next table, eating his lunch alone. Being at Ue. Felt so surreal. Izuku was with others while Bakugo was by himself. Don't ignore me, you fucks. A pang of pity shot through Izuku for a few moments before the memory of Bakugo punching him came to mind. Do you mind if I ask a question about your quirk, Midoriya? Izuku looked to Ida, nodding his head. I was curious if you can copy mutant-type quirks like mine. Oh, I don't actually know, B, but I don't think so. Izuku was taken aback with the question, still surprised that his classmates had awed at his quirk as opposed to fearing it. I, I was researching online. Every paper I found said that copy quirks can't handle mutant types, s sorry. Yeyurazu placed her cutlery down, her plate empty. How many quirks do you have? Er, other than my own quirk, I have six, they're all emitters. Yuraka counted on her fingers. So, one is the first quirk that mutated your own, two are mine and Bakugo's, what are the other three? My mom's, attraction, and recovery girl's heel. Oh, and one that analyzes quirks? Yeyurazu was interested. Analyzing a villain's quirk would be pretty great for a hero. Izuku shuffled slightly. Well, it's not that useful in battle. It requires skin contact and reduces your awareness of your surrounding. I can't really copy too many quirks. I haven't tested yet but I think my limit is 10. Yuraka, Ida and Yeyurazu chatted amongst themselves as a smile formed on Izuku's lips. All might. Making friends. It's so much more than I could have asked for. Izuku flicked through Kokoro three social media pages on his phone, searching for someone whose profile mentioned them having some kind of self-healing quirk. Unfortunately, Izuku was finding nothing. Healing quirks were rare in general, but ones that affected the holder as well were even more unheard of. Closing the social media app, Izuku instead opened his contacts list. After just one day at UA, Izuku's contacts had doubled. Yeyurazu had given hers just before her chauffeur collected her, while Yuraka and Ida had swapped with him while they waited for the train to arrive. Yuraka and Ida had both gotten off at the last stop. The former was almost to her apartment, while the latter had to switch trains. Izuku smiled, scrolling down past his three new contacts, All Might and his mom to the bottom. Dad, pressing the call symbol, Izuku held the phone to his ear. The number you have called is no longer in service. Hi Dad, I'm sorry I haven't called in a while. I've been super busy getting ready to go to UA. Mom's been so stressed about it you'd think she was the one going. Izuku gave a hollow chuckle, holding back tears. I really miss you, Dad. I know it's selfish, but I hoped I'd wake up and you'd be there to wish me luck for school. I wish you'd come home. Whenever I ask mom where you are she gets really quiet. Sometimes I can hear her crying after she thinks I'm asleep. The number you have called is no longer in service. Izuku sighed, hanging up. 
Taking a deep breath, Izuku locked his phone and returned it to his jacket pocket. The train car Izuku was in was nearly empty, as to be expected since the UA. Orientation day was a Sunday. He didn't imagine the train rides being quite so relaxed from tomorrow onwards. Maybe he'd run instead. Boy, quirkless, what do you think you're doing wearing that uniform? Izuku flinched, jumping to his feet, expecting to see someone from Aldera Middle School here to harass him. But it wasn't him they were after. It was the boy Izuku had bumped into earlier. The support student, Makumo. He had been surrounded by three boys in Umbaru High uniforms. Clearly Quirkless has finally lost it. He actually thinks he got into UA. Who did you steal the uniform from, Quirkless? Yeah, like you could even afford to go there. Who's gonna pay? Your parents. Oh wait, they don't have any. The boys laughed, while Makumo tried to ignore them. Izuku watched in horror and anger, for the first time seeing how cruel Quirkless discrimination was when not on the receiving end. When Bakugo and his classmates had belittled him, Izuku had just bared it with a smile, just like All Might. All the while a dark, nagging voice in his head told him he deserved it for the pain he caused his mom by being quirkless. But now, with his training from All Might, his place at UA, and his new friends, Izuku knew he hadn't deserved it, and neither did Makumo. Small explosions issued from Izuku's palms as he slammed his fist into his other hand, allowing Bakugo's familiar motion to give him confidence. Shut up. The three boys looked up to see Izuku, his eyes glowing. Who the hell are you? Izuku took a step towards the boys, someone who's telling you to shut up. Feeling Bakugo's quirk strumming in his veins, Izuku's resolve hardened. What's it to you, is quirkless your basket case? Oh, I get it, quirkless must be the class pet. Gross, someone as useless as him stealing a seat from someone worthy like us. Yeah, quirkless cost us our place at UA. Izuku clenched his fists. Bakumo earned his place in support, you three would never belong at UA. The expression on the three boys' faces darkened, their ire turning to Izuku. Strength doesn't make a hero. A true hero is someone with a selfless heart. The argument was starting to get attention from other passengers. You three, looking down and being vile to someone you think is weaker than you doesn't make you heroes. It makes you villains. All at once, the three boys exploded into action, charging at Izuku. Before Izuku could react, a weak explosion sent the three boys flat on their backsides. Fuck off, you losers. Bakugo glared at the three boys, his red eyes striking fear into them. The boys scrambled to their feet, bowing to Bakugo. We're so sorry. No you're not. Bakugo quirked an eyebrow. You're just scared cause I can fight back. The boys fled. Izuku rubbed the back of his neck as his confidence abandoned him. T thanks, Bak. Shut up, Deku. Don't think you can act like me just cause you copied my quirk. Bakugo stormed off. Anger suddenly burnt in Izuku's chest. All those years Bakugo had bullied him for being quirkless and here he was. A regular old defender of the downtrodden. Was it just Izuku that Bakugo hated? Not his former quirkless status. Had it just been a good excuse. You didn't need to take pity on me. I've put up with those three for years. Pulled from his thoughts, Izuku felt the fire in his chest dim. Izuku turned to Makumo. My eye wasn't taking pity. Makumo rolled his eyes. Of course you weren't. The big shot hero student standing up for a poor little quirkless. Looking at Makumo, Izuku saw a reflection of himself. Someone who had faced the same discrimination as he had, without someone as kind as his mom to support them. In that moment Izuku made his decision. He would support Makumo just as his mom had supported him. Izuku sat down next to Makumo, smiling. I didn't do it out of pity. Makumo shot him a wary look. Then why did you do it? Well, until a couple of months ago I thought I was quirkless. The breath caught in Makumo's throat. You thought you were quirkless? Izuku nodded. Yeah, it was a bit of a shock when I started copying other people's quirks. Then, you applied to UA. As a quirkless, Makumo's hand gripped his backpack strap. You were planning to take the exam without a quirk. I was. Makumo paused, before making his decision. Do you think it's possible for someone like me to be a hero? Izuku smiled, filling Makumo with warmth. Makumo, you can be a hero. For the first time in years, the flicker of hope within Makumo burnt brighter. And I'm going to help you. See you later, mom. Good luck today, stay safe. The door closed, leaving Inko sitting alone at the kitchen table. Inko had hoped that UA would be a clean break, that the new school would finally allow Izuku to make friends. But she certainly hadn't expected a friend over for dinner after only the orientation day. And she certainly hadn't expected the friend to look like a teenage version of the husband she hadn't seen in six years. It could only mean that the boy was one of his. But Inko would not hold that against the boy. After all it meant that he and Izuku were brothers. Although, she would not be telling Izuku that. Gripping the mug of tea Inko smiled. Watching Izuku and Makumo poring over the latter's designs last night had reminded her of a time when Izuku was little, when they had planned to have two children. Not one. But times change. What has been done could not be undone. Sneakers slapped the pavement as Izuku jogged down the street, weaving past pedestrians as he made his way towards the UA. 
campus. After breaking his arm and legs in the entrance exam Izuku had redoubled his focus on his physical training. The more muscle mass he built the less backlash he received from one for all. Even if Izuku did manage to find and copy a regeneration quirk, he wouldn't be able to rely on it for every punch. Morning, Midoriya. Izuku smiled and waved to Yeyurazu as he came to a halt. Good morning, Yeyurazu. Yeyurazu nodded, slipping on her shoulder bag as the limo drove away. The two hero aspirants fell in step as they entered the UA campus, thankfully unaccosted by reporters due to their earliness. Do you mind if I ask you a question about your quirk? Yeyurazu pointed at herself. My quirk? Why yeah? Sure. Izuku smiled. I just wondered since I saw you creating that bicycle for the long distance run yesterday, does your quirk have a limit? On size and material composition? Yeyurazu tapped her chin with her finger as she thought. HM. In terms of physical size I am limited by the area of my skin it's produced from. As for composition I have to know the molecular structure of what I am creating. But I am also limited by the lipid content of my body. So your quirk transforms the lipids in your body into other materials, right? Yes, it is why I need to eat so much, to replace it. Why do you ask? Izuku looked bashful. Oh, er, I was asking for a friend really. Hei's part of the support course here at UA. But some of the materials he needs are beyond the budget support students are given. I see. If you introduce me I would be glad to lend him my aid. Izuku beamed. T thanks. I'd better go get washed and changed. I'm not sure Aizawa would appreciate the unique odor I've currently got. Yeyurazu hid a chuckle behind her hand. Sure, I will see you in the classroom. With that, Izuku set off for the changing rooms, quickly peeling off his sweaty workout gear and hopping in a shower. As he soaked under the stream of hot water Izuku allowed his mind to drift back to what Bakugo had said the day before. Don't think you can act like me just cause you copied my quirk. It had barely bothered Izuku at the time. But hours later when he was in bed, trying and failing to sleep, it had come back to him. The second Izuku had activated explosion on the train a wave of confidence and bravado had surged through him. After that realization sleep had evaded Izuku entirely. Instead, Izuku had spent hours experimenting with his quirks, cataloging the effect each had on his personality. Similarly to explosion, zero gravity had boosted his confidence, while also filling him with a frank honesty. Attraction had made him nervous, and even more prone to crying than he already was, while heal had augmented his compassion and protectiveness. Initially, when testing the effect of Quirksmith on his personality Izuku had found no effect. That was until he realized the effect was an urge to analyze quirks. Finally, Izuku had tried one for all out of curiosity, finding it had no effect except odd green sparks when he held the power in his arm without using it. Drying off, Izuku pulled on his uniform, fumbling with his red tie until it looked halfway decent, albeit very short and very wide. Checking the time, Izuku's eyes widened into saucers. He was going to be late. Grabbing his back, Izuku activated attraction, pulling himself along as he raced toward the one homeroom. Help me make babies. Mikumo flushed red as he leapt into the air. H help why you do what T. Make babies. I I was W worried that was W what you you said. Hatsum, can you please stop referring to your projects as babies? Mikumo's head turned. It was Power Loader who had spoken. Why's that? Hatsum tilted her head in confusion. Power Loader sighed before muttering to himself. Oh god, it's going to be one of those years. Clearing his throat, Power Loader composed himself. Hatsum, why are you bothering Akatani? This is free workshop time. Hatsum nodded. Right, you never said we couldn't work together. I wanted to ask Makumo if we could. Makumo, eh? That's pretty forward of you. Power Loader chuckled. Fine, I'll allow it. That is if Akatani agrees of course. Just keep the explosions to a minimum. I make no promises. Hatsum grabbed Makumo's arm and pulled him over to her workstation. I didn't agree. SHH, that doesn't matter. Help. Power Loader smiled wryly as Hatsum dragged the poor boy off to his doom. Those two, working together, was going to be interesting to watch. I call this the wire arrow. It was my submission for the UA. Exam. Mikumo looked down at the invention. A silver, metal harness with two grapples either side, the straps red and gold. If he had to guess, Mikumo would say the grapples would be located either side of the user's stomach. It looks good, although any sudden pulling could cause the user a back injury. HM, maybe I should incorporate the wire arrow with chest armor, increase surface area, decrease the backlash. Why yeah, sounds like a good idea. Hatsum smiled, making a chill go down Makumo's spine. Good, cause you can help me do it. May, help you do it? Hatsum nodded. Well, we are going to be working together. We are. Of course, silly. We're going to have to work together if you want to get that power suit of yours built in time for the sports festival. Makumo blanched. How do you know about the power suit? I got the designs out of your bag and read them when you went to the bathroom. You stole my designs. Hatsum shook her head. It's only stealing if you take something, I put them back. But, Mikumo paused, he had no answer for that. So, why do you want to help me? 
What are you getting out of this? Hatsum beamed, she almost had him. Publicity. Think of all the support companies clamoring after me if I help you become the first ever quirkless UA. Hero student. W what? H how? What? Your designs had hero suit for my future written on each page. Mikuma wasn't satisfied. How do you know I'm quirkless? You're not as stalking me, are you? Hatsum laughed. A wild sound that only managed to terrify Mikuma more. Of course I'm not stalking you, Hatsum paused. Which, of course, is exactly what a stalker would say. Then H how do you know? The train, yesterday afternoon, I was at the other end of the carriage. My quirk, zoom, lets me see up to 5 kilometers like I'm right there. Mikumo nodded, before dropping into thought. He had known that he didn't have the time to build the entire suit by the festival. He'd been planning on focusing on the gauntlets, boots, chest armor and visor, with the hope it would be enough. But now, with Hatsum's help, he had a chance to get it done. A chance to be a hero, just like Midoriya had said he could be. Mikumo nodded, smiled. All right, I'm Mikumo Akatani, and I'm in. Hatsum grinned, her eyes almost looking like they were glowing. Great, I'm Mei Hatsum, your new partner. We're going to make so many babies together. From the other side of the room power loader side, Izuku placed his backpack down next to his desk and sat down, fiddling with the hem of his gloves. The morning had dragged by. Not to say that Izuku wasn't excited to have a pro hero like Midnight teaching him modern hero art history, but after the orientation day it felt almost anticlimactic. Lunch was good though, but now, it was time. Hero Basic Training I am coming through the door like a normal person. He's here. All Might burst through the doorway, filling the room with his sheer presence. Wow, it's still so amazing that All Might is teaching us to be heroes. Kaminari's grin was nearly as wide as Izuku's. That's his Silver Age costume. So retro, so manly. All Might flexed in front of the digital whiteboard. Hero basic training. All Might's voice rattled the windows. This is the class that'll put you through your paces. All sorts of special training will mold you into the heroes of the future. Therefore, today you shall begin with a bang. Quite literally in your case, young Bakugo. Bakugo rolled his eyes. All Might paused, allowing tension to build. Battle training. The class cheered. Izuku gulped, watching as Bakugo's grin grew disturbingly manic. And so, you will be needing these. All Might pulled a remote from his eye searingly red costume and pressed a button. Four racks whirred as they extended out of the far wall of the classroom, revealing five metal briefcases set in each rack. Using the quirk registry and the special request forms you submitted when you applied to UA, costumes were developed for each of you, created by a design agency associated with the school. Costumes. Hell yeah. All Might cleared his throat, silencing the class with his presence. Now, once you've changed, meet me at ground beta. Now, looking spiffy is all well and good my young zygotes. But remember, from this day on, you're all heroes. Izuku's heart felt like it would burst, a few stray tears leaking from the corners of his eyes. Stealing himself, Izuku wiped them away, slinging his backpack over his shoulders and grabbing his case, number 18, with his classmate. This is so exciting. I hope they got my costume right. Siro retrieved the case marked with a 13. Me too, cheered Minta, case 19 in his grip. Look, Minta's case is almost as tall as he is. Kaminari pointed to the struggling Minta. Izuku watched as Minta deflated, somehow making him look even smaller than he already was. Now, now, chop, chop. At All Might's prompt the rest of the class retrieved their cases and made their way towards the changing rooms, splitting by gender. Izuku set his case down next to his backpack, opening the ladder to reveal a handmade costume. The costume his mother had created for him, in her words, it was her apology for not encouraging him in his pursuit of becoming a hero. But to Izuku it symbolized something entirely different, his mother's love and support. How could he wear anything else? However, he had commissioned one piece of gear from the UA. Designers. After all, he didn't want to be copying the quirk of every villain he fought, removing his UA. Uniform, Izuku pulled the costume on, before pulling the gloves off his hands. Izuku opened his costume case, and it rest a pair of thick, white gloves, with royal blue palms. Izuku had asked for the same gloves as Bakugo, allowing him to use explosion, with just one change. A thin, gold-colored membrane over his fingertip pads, allowing him to use zero gravity and heal. They're perfect. Midoriya, you're the last. Hurry up before you're late. Izuku jumped at the sound of Ida's loud voice and spun around to find the changing room empty the door slowly swinging shut. Damn it, he must have been muttering. Pulling the gloves on and securing the wrist straps, Izuku pulled his mask and mouthguard into position before sprinting off after his classmate. At ground beta a patient All Might waited for class wanted to emerge from the tunnel in their costumes. As much as he wanted to conserve his time with one for all, All Might had to stay in his hero form, he couldn't afford to be caught off guard by a student. They're certainly taking their time. All Might coughed up blood, almost deflating in surprise. Aizawa, what are you doing here? I'm not here to check up on you if that's what you're worried about. Aizawa sighed. 
I'm here to keep an eye on Bakugo after his behavior yesterday. Ah, oh, yes, now I see why. The sound of many footsteps reached the two pro heroes. Before Class 1A entered Ground Beta, each dressed in their hero costumes, All Might scanned the gathered hero aspirants, finding it was missing young Midori. Where could he be? Is he absent today? Did I not notice? All Might turned his head to ask Aizawa, but found only empty space where the teacher had been. Izuku sprinted into Ground Beta, the horns of his mask fluttering. He wore a pale teal jumpsuit, with white strips sewn onto it, a matching ski mask, a black and white mouth guard, black elbow and knee pads and a red utility belt, pouches filled with various supplies. All Might coughed, noting the resemblance to himself. Shall we begin, my wards? All Might smiled and struck a pose. Who's ready for some battle training? The class cheered. On the roof of a nearby building, Aizawa rolled his eyes and sighed. After all he'd done to light a fire of seriousness under this class, All Might was undermining it with one of his silly grins and a flex of his muscles. This class showed potential, definitely more than the last lot, hence their expulsion. At least this class was interesting, especially the problem child. Of course the problem child. The ghost of a smile slipped onto Aizawa's lips. Back on the ground the members of class 1 were admiring each other's costumes. Deki, looking good. Izuku looked to see Uraraka approaching. Her costume pink and black with large gauntlets and boots, as well as a wizard helmet, the jumpsuit was skin tight, making Izuku's cheeks flush. Why would the UA designers do that for a 15-year-old's costume? It's kind of worrying. Dideki, Uraraka nodded. Like Aorazu said, Dekaru is similar to Deku, but Deki is just easier to say. That's okay, right? Izuku smiled. He'd never had a non-offensive nickname before. Of course it is. Your costume L looks great too. Uraraka smiled. Thanks, it's a bit tighter than I asked for though. Mr. All Might. Turning, Izuku and Uraraka watched a silver suit of armor approach their teacher, the arm chopping the air making it very clear that Ida was inside. Yes, young Ida. This is the same area that the entrance exam took place in. Are we going to be performing sit escape maneuvers again? All Might beamed. Absolutely. Not. Today you will be moving on to step 2, indoor anti-personnel battle training. Everyone waited on bated breath. While the vast majority of villain attacks occur outdoors, the truth is that the villains you face indoors tend to be far more dangerous and deadly. Izuku's eyes strayed to All Might's left side, looking at where he knew a starburst scar marred the number one hero's skin. Therefore you'll be split into hero teams and villain teams, and face each other in a 2 versus 2 style. Unlike all your previous experience, you will be facing living, breathing, thinking opponents who can adapt to your actions organically. Now, any question? What about basic training, Kiro? Does this cape look Trez stylish? Are you going to threaten to expel someone like Mr. Aizawa? How are teams selected? All Might struck a pose, silencing the class. Now, now, one at a time, I don't have super hearing like young Gyro here. The questions were repeated, allowing All Might to listen and reply. This is your basic training. We, not at all. By lots. Ada's arm reached maximum chopping speed, making mine a duck. By lots. Is that really the best way? In the real world we won't get to choose who you team up with, you just have to adapt. Right you are, young Midoriya. Izuku blanched. I I said that out loud. All Might drew a sheet of paper. Listen up. The villains will be hiding a nuclear weapon in the hideout building. And the heroes have to go in and take care of it. Each round is 15 minutes long. If the heroes capture their opponents or touch the bomb, they win. If the villains capture their opponents or run out the clock, they win. Understood. The class murmured in agreement. All Might clapped his hands together, the sound almost deafening. Excellent. Now, let's draw teams. Producing a box with the hole on the top. All Might passed it around the class, each member taking a white ping-pong ball from it, a letter from it to J written on them. Izuku turned his ping-pong ball around, reading the letter he just hoped he wasn't paired with Bakugo. Or worse, fighting Bakugo. Looks like we're a team, Midoriya. We are. Izuku's brain overheated at the sight of Yeyarazu's hero costume. Or lack thereof. Izuku averted his eyes. Why Yeyarazu? Where's the R rest of your costume? Aren't you cold? Yeyarazu shrugged. I need the exposed skin for my quirk to work. Although it was supposed to have a pair of shorts. Don't worry, Yeyarazu. I love your costume. Wanna switch teams, Midoriya? Be quiet, you pervert. Suyu slapped Minda with her tongue. Thank you, Asui. Yeyarazu smiled at Suyu, but shifted uncomfortably nonetheless. Call me Tsuyu. A zipper. Izuku exclaimed suddenly. Yeyarazu tilted her head. A zipper. Why yeah? That way you can unzip it when you need to make something. Traitor. Minda glared at Izuku, earning himself another tongue slap from Tsuyu. That's not a bad idea. Thank you, Midoriya. Why you're welcome. The first match will be. All Might pulled a ball out of two different boxes. Team G vs. Team C. Kyoka Gyro and Tenya Ida will be the heroes. Denki Kaminari and Minoru Minta will be the villains. Kaminari turned to Minta and gave him a thumbs up. 
before being surprised to see the small boy glaring at him. Tamsi, head on into the building. You have five minutes before the heroes begin their assault. Heroes, begin. Minter removed another ball from his scalp, completing the line of spheres across the doorway to the bomb room. Closing the doors, they stuck in place against the balls, before another line was placed along the seam between the doors. Boy, stop ignoring me. Kaminari waved his arm wildly. Gyro and the glasses guy are already in the building and we haven't discussed strategy yet. Here's a strategy for you, follow mine. What's your problem with me? Kaminari grabbed Minta's shoulder. Hey, shorty, I'm talking to you. Minta spun around, punching Kaminari in the kneecap. Don't call me that. What the hell was that for? Kaminari hopped around the room, holding his leg. Shut up. You're pretty strong for someone so small. Minta growled, punching Kaminari's other knee. Shut up, moron. Hey, don't call me that. Kaminari continued to hop around the room, alternating his leg each time. Finally stopping, Kaminari rubbed his now aching knees, glaring at Minta. You've got no right. All you do is go around leering at the girls, like you're any better. There's a difference between flirting and just being a pervert. You make them uncomfortable. What's wrong with me showing my appreciation of them? Kaminari snorted. Cause it's creepy the way you do it. And what are you, Casanova? Minta retorted. You got shut down by Gyro and Ashido just this morning. Pathetic. Pathetic. Kaminari jabbed his finger in Minta's shoulder. While I'm not the one the whole class hates, even Midoriya gives you a wide berth and he's an absolute cinnamon roll. Minta's face flushed red with anger. Then at least they're noticing me. That made Kaminari pause. You're a pervert, to get attention? Of course I do, what else have I got? I'm three and a half foot tall and wearing armor that looks like a diaper. Kaminari had no reply for that. I didn't even ask for it. You know, they added it to improve the appeal of my childlike appearance. Do you know embarrassing that is? I'm 15. My entire life I have been mocked and dismissed because of my height. I'm so short I'm not even allowed on roller coasters. Just last week, someone asked me if I was excited to be starting middle school. Kaminari shrugged his shoulders, trying to deflate the situation. Surely you're just a late bloomer. Maybe you'll have a growth spurt soon. Minta snorted in disbelief. Sure, maybe then I can be four feet tall instead. Hey, I'm just trying to cheer you up. I don't need your pity. I'm not pitying you. Minta glared at Kaminari. Of course you are. Pitying me and my weak quirk, like yours is any better. Kaminari recoiled. My quirk is weak. All you can do is stick a few balls to the door. I'm the lightning rod badass. Gyro continued to listen in on Team C's argument, enjoying the show those two idiots were putting on. They're an absolute mess, though Minta has stuck the door shut though. Aiden nodded. I shall smash through the door with a kick and capture those bickering ne'er-do-wells. Gyro smothered a laugh at Ida committing to his role, before removing her earphone jack from the wall. Ida, you go in first, grab Kaminari and stick him to some of Minda's balls, while I feel gross just saying that. Ida frowned. How so? Ada, so pure. Gyro smirked. I'll take the purple pervert. Team G set off for the fourth floor, the sound of muffled shouting reaching Gyro's enhanced ears on the second floor and Ida's on the third. Reaching the door to the bomb room, Gyro and Ida could hear every word Minda and Kaminari were yelling at each other. Ready, Ida. The armored teen nodded in reply, before igniting his engines and launching a kick directly at the doors. They smashed off their hinges, still stuck together, as Ida landed in the room, finding it empty apart from the bomb. Those dastardly villains must have run off in fear of us. Ada made to walk towards the bomb and claim their victory. He couldn't, his feet were stuck. Looking down, Ada saw purple balls stuck to the floor of the entire room. Gyro, it's a trap. Like those two idiots are that dangerous. Gyro made her way into the room, before extending an earphone jack and plugging it into the wall. Now, Kaminari dropped from the wall above the doorway. A purple sphere stuck to the inside of his palm, before grabbing the wire of Gyro's earphone jack, sticking them together. Indiscriminate shock. 5,000 volts. Electricity ran up Gyro's earphone jack, shocking her and sending her to the ground. Mind to let go of the spheres stuck to the wall above the doorway, landing and throwing five spheres at Ida, sticking them in a line up his back. Kaminari smiled. Turns out Minda's balls, Minda sniggered, are really good at conducting my electricity. Kaminari slammed his hand down on one of the spheres stuck to the floor. Indiscriminate shock. 10,000 volts. The lightning surged through the spheres, jumping from one to the next and up Ida's back. Ada groaned and fell backwards, his armor smoking. The speakers in the building crackled into life. Villains win. In the basement surveillance room, the gathered members of Class 1A watched as Team G and Team C entered, the former commiserating and the latter celebrating. All Might clapped his hands together. Can anyone offer any suggestions on why the villains won? Ears and glasses underestimated them. Correct you are, young Bekugo. Although you would do well to refer to your classmates with respect. TCH, when they earn it. All Might paused, wasn't really sure how to respond to that. Yeyorazu raised her hand. Yes, young Yeyorazu. 
All Might pointed to the girl, seeing an out from the awkwardness Bakugo had created. While Team C's plan did actually work, if Gyro had used her quirk to scan the building again before Ida entered they would have discovered the trap. Hence, Minda's strategy required a lapse in judgment a pro hero would not make. Kaminare's attack required Gyro to not heed Ida's warning of a trap. An excellent point. All Might beamed. The teen had said it even better than he could. Who do you think should be the MVP of the match? Yeyorazu tapped her chin. Hum, the MVP should be Ida. What? Ida was taken aback. He kept his head throughout the match, and acted to the best of his ability and information he had been given. All Might gave a thumbs up. Well said, young Yeyorazu. The MVP of match 1 is young Ida. A smattering of applause sounded for a shocked Ida, with Yuraka and Izuku the loudest among them. Now, on to match 2. Team B vs Team I. Toru Hagakure and Shoto Todoroki will be the heroes. Mizo Shoji and Mashirao Ajira will be the villains. Teams B and I left the surveillance room. Chatter breaking out among the students. Ida breaking off to approach Izuku and Yuraraka, while Jairo moved to stand with Tsuyu and Yeyarazu. Minta, what you said during our fake argument. That was made up right. Yeah, it was. Minta walked away, leaving Kaminari standing alone. Jairo watched as Minta melted into the background. His heartbeat, Minta lied. Tsuyu followed Jairo's line of sight and tilted her head. Hiro, how do you think we should do this, Sho-chan? Hagakure struck a pose, appearing as nothing more than a pair of gloves and boots. Don't call me that. Todoroki remained impassive as the seconds ticked by, leaving Hagakure feeling awkward. Shouldn't we have a plan? Heroes, you may begin. Todoroki walked towards the door to the building. You should stay out here. It's going to get very cold inside. I'm not sure your costume would be well suited to it. With that, Todoroki took one step inside the building and slammed his right foot down. I screw out from the impact and up the building, encasing it entirely. Hagakure wrapped her arms around herself as chill seeped into her bones. Even at the distance she was away from the building. Team B has secured the bomb. Heroes win. Hagakure sighed. This was supposed to be her first chance to actually be able to make use of her quirk. For the tests the day before she'd had to fall back on her natural abilities, which were far less impressive when compared to her classmates than she'd been expecting. The MVPS should be Todoroki. In a real-life situation a hero should do all they can to end the fight as quickly as possible. A villain attack isn't a chance to show off. It's about protecting civilians from harm. Right you are, young Midoriya. The MVP of match 2 is young Todoroki. Hagakure's gloved fists tightened as she stood next to Todoroki in the surveillance room. This was supposed to have been her chance to show off, to establish herself as a budding hero in training, an honest, ditzy girl with no hidden depths. It was vital that she do so. Her mission depended on it. Team J, begin. Siro and Sato entered the building, covering each other's backs as they made their way up to the top floor. Sato produced a sugar capsule from his belt and swallowed it as he walked towards the closest window. Grabbing the frame, Sato pulled the window clean from the wall, setting it down on the floor. Siro, you're up. Right. Climbing through the hole in the wall, Siro jumped out into the open air as he fired his tape, latching onto the outside wall and swinging. Starting from the top floor, Siro checked each window as he swung around the building. Found them, third floor, room at the northeast of the building. A reply came via the micro-transceiver in Siro's ear. Understood, meet me back on the top floor. Siro angled his arm and fired, his swing giving him the height to slip in through the hole where the window used to be. Are they both with the bomb? Siro nodded. Yeah, Ayama's hiding to the side of the door, ready to ambush. Then we'll have to make our own door. Where's the bomb? Corner of the building, Koda's directly in front of it. Sato paused, thinking. I'll smash in via the ceiling, away from the bomb so it doesn't get damaged. You swing in through a window at the same time. I'll wrap up Ayama. You should take Kota, you're about the same size. Good idea. You wait here and I'll let you know when I'm in position. Siro nodded in agreement. Got it. Sato made his way down to the fourth floor and found the correct room, moving to stand at the opposite corner from where the bomb sat in the room below. Sato activated his micro-transceiver. I'm in position. I'll head out now, give me 20 seconds, then go in. Sato made a grunt of agreement, taking another sugar capsule and stealing himself. Go. Sato slammed his fists down on the floor below him, landing in shower of rubble and dust. Grabbing a smashed section of floor, Sato held it up, blocking a shot from Ayama's naval laser. Using his enhanced strength, Sato hurled the concrete block at Ayama, forcing him to dodge and stopping him from firing again. Siro smashed through the window, firing off three strands of tape, sticking Ayama to the wall. Zut, Siro skidded to a halt next to Sato as the two turned to face Kota, only to be met by the sight of two bears protecting him in the bomb. Bears, Siro took a step back. Sato nodded. Bears, Siro sighed. That's not good. The bear on the left charged at Siro, forcing him to swing out of the way, while Sato met the other bear head-on, entering a battle of strength. Sticking to the wall, Siro aimed at the left bear. 
Coda spoke. Lefty dodged the tape. The newly named Lefty avoided Ciro's tape. Five minutes remaining. The sound of All Might's rattled the room, drowning out Coda's next set of orders. Ciro landed back on the floor and fired again at Lefty twice. Each strand was dodged, but the bear didn't attack. Why didn't it attack? It couldn't, because it couldn't hear Coda. That's it. Sato opened the doors. Sato punched the other bear, forcing it back, before glancing at his partner. Really? I've got a plan. Sato paused for a second before nodding. On it, aiming an arm at each bear. Ciro prepared to fire as Sato heaved the doors open. Lefty, righty, dodged the tape. Ciro suddenly changed target with his left arm, aiming at Koda and firing. The strand of tape wrapped around Koda's mouth, silencing the already very quiet boy. Turning his focus back to the bears, Ciro fired a short burst of tape either side of Lefty and Righty, watching as they both dodged away from it. As Koda tried in vain to remove the tape over his mouth, continuing to fire, Ciro pushed the two bears further and further back as they dodged his tape, until they moved all the way back into the corridor. Now, Sato slammed the doors shut, holding them there as Ciro taped it securely. Turning back to Koda, Ciro fired two final strands of tape, binding the mock villain's hands and feet. Villain team is captured. Bomb secured. Heroes win. Izuku watched on as the MVP of the match was debated among the class, while teams J and F stood at the front of the surveillance room. Koda should be MVP. It's impressive where he got those bears from. Yeah, I'm kind of worried that UA has bears so nearby. Nah, Sato was better, he's so strong. How about moi? Was I the MVP? No one answered. Sero should be the MVP. The class turned to look at Izuku, feeling fear seeping into his bones at suddenly having the entire class attention. Izuku called on Quirkspace, feeling Tokisei's confidence in his analytical ability wash it away. Siro was the most able to adapt. The plan he and Sato had went to pieces, but he deduced Koda's weakness and exploited it. Yeirazu spoke up. But isn't it the same as match 1? Siro was just lucky that it worked. Match 1 was totally different. Their Team C's plan relied on being underestimated, something no pro hero should do. Izuku paused. But Siro's plan wasn't luck. In a real battle there's always going to be plenty of loud noises. Well said, young Midoriya. All Might flashed a toothy smile. Young Siro, you are the MVP of match 3. With the focus of the class shifting back to All Might, Izuku released his hold on Quirkspace, breathing a sigh of relief. The next match will be Team H versus Team E. Izuku crossed his fingers, hoping that Bakugo was on one of those two teams. The last thing he wanted to do on his first proper day at UA was to fight his former friend. Fumikage Takoyami and Tsuyuasui will be the heroes. The villains shall be Achako Yuraka and Mina Ashido. Izuku cursed whatever power had decided to have him fight Bakugo. Heroes, you may commence. Tsuyu tilted her head. He's so loud. Takoyami nodded in agreement as Dark Shadow carried him up to the third floor. Think how Gyro must feel. Clambering up the wall of the building, Suyu made a sound of agreement. Try this window, Kiro. As Dark Shadow kept him in place, Takoyami pulled on the window, opening it. The two heroes in training slipped in through the window, careful not to make any loud noises. Let's split up and search this floor first. Dark Shadow returned to its resting place inside Takoyami. Radio if you find them. With that, Team H went their separate ways. Suyu strained her ears as she made her way down the same corridor for what felt like the fourth time. She was lost. A shout sounded from behind, prompting Tsuyu to turn. Ashido was sliding towards her on acid at high speed. Tsuyu dodged Ashido as she flew past, the pink girl's hand brushing her ear. Ashido continued to slide on and around the corner. Need to get back to Ochako. Hearing Ashido's statement to herself, Tsuyu bounded after her. Takoyami. I'm following Ashido. She's on her way back to the bomb room. No reply. Reaching up to touch her microtransceiver, Tsuyu found it missing. Ashido must have knocked it out on her way past. Tsuyu didn't have time to go back and look for it, she'd have to do without. At the other side of the building Takoyami was repeatedly attempting to contact his teammate. With no success, he had found the bomb room pretty quickly. Yuraka and Ashido had made it so obvious Takoyami was surprised there wasn't a sign on the wall outside. Asui wasn't replying. Takoyami could only think of two reasons why. She was fighting either Yuraka or Ashido, or she had already lost. Making his decision, Takoyami summoned Dark Shadow and smashed through the wall of the bomb room. Hiroraka was standing at the opposite side of the room, the papier mash bomb floating behind her. Between them, rubble from a broken pillar hung in the air. Pressing her finger to her ear, Hiroraka spoke. Mina, Takoyami is in the bomb room. Takoyami sighed. It was a trap. Hiroraka agreed with Ashido's reply and turned her attention to Takoyami. Dark shadow rushed at Hiroraka, who struck a floating section of rubble right at Takoyami, returning its gravity at the last section. Takoyami called Dark Shadow back to him, using it to shield himself. Two more concrete projectiles fired at Takoyami, forcing him to dodge one and block the other. 
He was stuck on the defensive. Every time he got any ground, Yuraka would force him back again. All Takoyami could do was wait for her to make a mistake. Five minutes later, it came. One of Yuraka's projectiles went wide, hitting the outside wall, allowing Takoyami to charge at Yuraka, using Dark Shadow as a shield. The outside wall where the projectile hit crumbled, allowing light to flood into the room. The sudden change in light level startled Dark Shadow, forcing him back inside Takoyami, leaving the hero in training open to a projectile. Takoyami grunted as the rubble struck him in the chest, driving the air from his lungs and knocking him to the ground. Capture tape wrapped around Takoyami, binding his arms and legs. Sorry, Takoyami. Gravity left Takoyami, before Yuraka threw him out of the hole in the wall, leaving him floating in the blinding sunlight. He had lost. Time's up. The villains have defended the bomb. Team A wins. Takoyami was still floating in the air five minutes later when Yuraka returned with Siro in tow. A strand of tape attached to Takoyami before being pulled back, taking the teen with it. Sorry about that, Takoyami. Capture tape removed. Takoyami landed back on solid ground as Yuraka returned his gravity. Takoyami bowed his head. There is no need to apologize, Yuraka. You bested me, but I do have the question. Takoyami, Yuraka and Siro set off for the surveillance room. Shoot. The wall. Why did it collapse then? Dark Shadow deflected a number of your projectiles into the walls before that. Yuraka beamed, bouncing on the balls of her feet. I asked Mina to weaken it with her acid during our setup time. Takoyami nodded as he processed the information. Yuraka, you should be the MVP. You figured out my weakness and exploited it. Yuraka was flustered. No, and not at all. It was Mina's idea to split the two of you up like that. In the end, Takoyami was proven right. Yuraka was declared the MVP of the match, in time for the final battle to begin. Izuku was standing outside the training building, next to Yeyurazu, trying to keep himself calm. You do not need to be so worried. Yeyurazu placed a hand on Izuku's shoulder. All Might is a far less demanding teacher compared to Mr. Aizawa. It's not that. Izuku paused. It's facing Kaken, I mean Bakugo. All my life every time I've stood up to him I've ended up losing. Then change that, beat him. Today, right here, right now. Izuku clenched his fists, calling on the confidence explosion provided. You're right. I can't live in his shadow any longer. Yeyurazu raised an eyebrow, taken aback by the fire that had suddenly burst into existence within Izuku. We need a plan. Izuku slipped straight into analysis mode. Bakugo will come straight for me. He wants to prove he's stronger than me. He knows you have super strength, right? Izuku chuckled, breaking the tension he was feeling. Yeyurazu smiled. Not literally stronger, he wants to prove his quirk is stronger than mine. Besides, super strength isn't that impressive these days. Who doesn't know someone with super strength? Like Sato. Not quite. Most strength quirks only provide a passive boost, double or triple the holder's base strength. Sato has to consume sugar to activate his strength. But what he was doing earlier was more like six times, or five times boost if I'm underestimating Sato's base streak. Izuku looked up at the sound of giggling. It was Yeyurazu, with her hand over her mouth. You were distracting me from worrying about Ka Bakugo. Yeyurazu nodded. Of course, there was no way you'd be able to focus while stressing like that. You seem to enjoy analyzing quirks. Beside I find what you say quite insightful. Izuku felt his cheeks heat up. Normally I just get told to stop muttering. I'm going to need your muttering if we're going to come up with a plan to beat Bakugo and Kirishima. Izuku nodded. Right, so Bakugo will come for me straight away. That's your chance to slip away. Yeyurazu nodded. Bakugo will leave Kirishima to guard the bomb. He is pretty straightforward. I doubt he will make any attempt at setting traps. I don't think he'd consider traps very manly. Yeyurazu laughed again, making Izuku smile. He wasn't used to laughter not being at his expense. I was watching Kirishima at the test yesterday. His hardening doesn't apply to his whole body. Yeyurazu nodded. Then I need to overwhelm his defenses. A flurry of rapid strikes could be faster than Kirishima could adapt to. Izuku nodded in agreement. You have weapons training. Of course, I am trained in bijutsu mainly, but I am proficient with many other weapons as well. Izuku suddenly felt very small. His combat skills were pretty much limited to aim and punch, as well as a few basic throws. What is your plan for fighting Bakugo? Izuku shrugged slightly. I'm not really sure. Not without breaking my bones again. Yeyurazu looked confused. You cop at his quirk, you can at least match his power. Not really. When I copy someone's quirk it manifests as it did when they first received it. My copy of Bakugo's quirk is little more than Spark right now. I've still got a lot of training to do to improve it. But yesterday, the explosion you used when you threw the ball, that wasn't too different from Bakugo's. Izuku was panicking internally, searching for something to say that wouldn't reveal the existence of one for all. Alright, I did. My quirk is kind of hard to explain. We still have five minutes before the match starts. Rubbing the back of his head. Izuku nodded, covering his internal screaming. 
T the first quirk I copied, it's less power amplification and more like a stockpile of power. I can use it to enhance my body. It can also enhance my quirks for a few seconds, but I've not really explored that yet, though. And I can only use one active quirk at a time. Passive quirks don't count. Stockpile is the only passive quirk I have. Gayarazu nodded. You were right, your quirk is complex. I know, I'm still working trying to understand it. You said yesterday you used to think you were quirkless. When did your quirk manifest? Izuku blushed again. It was, er, I was the day of the entrance exam. The entrance exam. Yeyarazu questioned in disbelief. So you were trying to get in without a quirk? Why yeah, they removed the rule disallowing quirkless applicants a few years ago. Yeyarazu smiled at Izuku. You know, I thought you were pretty shy, but to go into the UA. Entrance exam without a quirk is pretty courageous. For the third time in as many minutes, Izuku's cheek lit up like he had a furnace in his mouth. T thanks. And reckless, Izuku stammered. I I I, W will. Tame, you may begin. Yeyarazu watched as Izuku's entire manner suddenly changed. The green-haired pulling his mask over his face and putting his mouth guard in place. Izuku looked to Yeyarazu. Let's go. Ignoring the main door, Izuku and Yeyarazu moved to the side of the building. Can you use your Araka's quirk to float me up to a window? Izuku shook his head, making the ears of his mask flop around. Your Araka gave me some tips, but I haven't managed to increase my weight limit beyond 15 kilograms yet. Frowning, Izuku looked over to see Yeyarazu repressing laughter. What's wrong? Yeyarazu shook her head. Nothing, right? I have an idea, but I need some rope. Then you'll have some rope. Yeyarazu held her palm out to Izuku, creating 10 meters of rope in seconds. Izuku coiled the rope around his shoulder and nodded. Thanks. Activating attraction, Izuku pulled on the building, his comparatively much smaller mass sending him flying up, allowing him to catch himself on a windowsill. Opening the window, Izuku slipped inside and threw the rope back down to Yeyarazu. Izuku kept watch as his partner climbed the rope, helping her through the window when she reached the top. Pulling the rope up, Izuku coiled it diagonally around his torso in case it was useful later. This place has lots of blind corners, we need to watch out. Yeyarazu created two heavy, ornate mirrors, clearly made of some kind of metal, handing one to Izuku and keeping the other for herself. Tima set off down the corridor, working together to check around each corner before making a turn. Izuku clenched the mirror in his hand. There was no way he could use one for all. He still couldn't regulate its power. 100% would kill anyone who didn't have some kind of physical resistance. So, all he had was explosion, zero gravity and attraction. It would have to be enough. Izuku heard it before he saw it. Bakugo leaping out from a corridor, an explosion already blossoming from his palm. Pulling on the wall behind himself, Izuku shot back to where his partner stood, leaving Bakugo's attack to disperse in empty air. Like Izuku had predicted, Bakugo had completely ignored Yeyarazu, gunning for his former friend instead. Yeyarazu, go now. Pausing for a few seconds before nodding, Yeyarazu turned and ran, away from Bakugo and Izuku. Nice dodge, Deku. Izuku watched carefully, ready to go on the defensive as Bakugo stood and turned towards him. That was Auntie's quirk, right? Bakugo's eyes bored into Izuku. I guess it's just like you then, not as weak as it looks. Izuku was confused. Was Bakugo complimenting him? It'll make me look that much stronger when I crush you. I'm going to mess you up, but not just enough for you to be disqualified. There was the kakan that Izuku knew and tolerated. Bakugo charged at Izuku, right hand aimed right at his head. Twisting, Izuku grabbed Bakugo's outstretched arm, negating 15 kilograms of the boy's weight and flipped him over, smashing him into the floor hard enough to crack the tiles. Izuku raised his guard. You always lead with your right. Deku, you read my fucking moves. Bakugo pushed himself into a crouch, glaring at Izuku. I never had a quirk, so I analyzed the quirks of the pro heroes I looked up to. Izuku was vibrating with tension. At some point half his mask had been ripped away. You were in that notebook, the one you blew up. I looked up to you, we were friends once. Fuck you, Deku. Bakugo launched himself at Izuku again, kicking off the wall to flip over his opponent, calling on attraction again. Izuku pulled on Bakugo's gauntlets, slamming him down into the floor. Bakugo growled as he pushed himself back to his feet. What the fuck was that? I negated part of your weight earlier. That makes you lighter than me. Still relying on aunties and round faces quirks? Use mine, so I can prove I'm better than you, Deku. A hot feeling in Izuku's chest rose to a crescendo before the dam burst. Stop calling me that. Izuku charged one for all into his left arm and released the weak explosion, barely more than a few sparks supercharged by All Might's power to larger than one of Bakugo's regular explosions. The large fireball nailed Bakugo in the chest before the other boy could react, sending him tumbling away. Wincing, Izuku flexed his arm experimentally. He hadn't broken it since he hadn't hit anything and had only used a weak explosion, but he'd definitely given it a rattling. 
He could probably only do that again once or twice before he broke his arm. I'm not Deku. Launching himself at Bakugo. Izuku suddenly pulled himself to the ceiling, kicking off it and pulling himself back down behind Bakugo, kicking him in the back. Not anymore. Sparks danced around Izuku's palms as he glared at Bakugo. I'm Deku no more. Releasing zero gravity's hold over Bakugo. Izuku rushed at the other boy as he was caught off balance by his weight suddenly increasing. What I said about not trying to compete. Izuku placed his palms against Bakugo's chest, before releasing two weak explosions, sending Bakugo flying onto his back. I take it back. I'm going to crush you. Bakugo growled in frustration, igniting his palms to propel him backwards and give himself some space. He had underestimated Deku. As the dust cleared, Bakugo prepared himself to launch at Izuku, but found the corridor empty instead. The coward had run away, releasing a roar of rage. Bakugo sprinted away in the direction he assumed Izuku had gone. After a few seconds had passed, the window slid open, allowing Izuku to climb back into the building. Taking a few deep breaths, Izuku recentered himself. He had let Bakugo get under his skin. The other boy wouldn't make the mistake of underestimating him again. Pulling his ruined hood off, Izuku let his mouth guard fall to rest on his collarbones. Careful not to make too much noise, Izuku set off after Bakugo. He had to keep him distracted, to give Yeyorazu the time to beat Kirishima and secure the bomb. Momo moved her mirror out, using it to survey the bomb room. Kirishima was pacing in front of the bomb, clearly on edge. No doubt Bakugo wasn't communicating, too focused on Midoriya to think critically. Lowering the mirror, Momo created a metal staff, hardened steel to match Kirishima's quirk. She cursed the fact she had not mastered the tear gas and smokescreen grenades yet, they were still liable to go off the second she created them. A hand suddenly smashed through the wall, grabbing for Momo, acting on instinct. She twisted her body and brought her staff down, the force great enough that anyone without a quirk like Kirishima's would now have a broken wrist. A pain grunt sounded, before the hand retracted. Falling back, Momo moved into a defensive position, waiting for Kirishima to make his new move. The wall burst into a spray of rubble as Kirishima smashed through it, his arms hardened, creating a circular shield to protect herself from the rubble. Momo charged at Kirishima, bashing him with it. The shape of Kirishima's hardened face appeared in the shield, the metal buckled and bent. Planting her foot, Momo spun on it, slamming the edge of the shield into Kirishima's chest. The red-haired boy wheezed as the air was knocked out of him, his hardening failing under the amount of damage he had taken. Capitalizing on Kirishima's broken guard, Momo drove one end of her staff into the same spot on the red-haired boy's chest, sending him stumbling back through the hole in the wall. Pressing her advantage, Momo delivered a flurry of strikes with her staff, each one targeting a different part of Kirishima's body, forcing him to constantly switch where he hardened. With one final strike, Momo smashed the end of her weapon into Kirishima's knee. Momo was winded from the effort. You can switch your hardening faster than I can hit you. Kirishima dropped to one knee, before cheering. Momo paused. Of everything she was expecting her opponent to do, this was not on the list. Standing, Kirishima hardened both his forearms and charged at Momo. Swinging her staff, Momo barely managed to block Kirishima's forearms. I thought I would only be able to go all out on Midoriya since you don't have a physical quirk. Kirishima hardened his fingers, holding his hand with a flat palm, before chopping clean through Momo's staff. But you're way stronger than I was expecting. The dark-haired teen blocked a hardened punch with one half of her staff, now reduced to a baton in each hand. Momo took a step back, swinging her batons. I would not want it any other way. Izuku was starting to regret including sneakers in his hero costume. He had been following Bakugo, waiting for an opening to launch a sneak attack, and then his sneaker had decided to squeak, alerting Bakugo to his presence. All this had led Izuku to where he was now, standing with a blown-out wall behind him, a three-story drop waiting for him to make one wrong move. You've been laughing at me behind my back this whole time. Bakugo fired an explosion, Izuku dodged. More of the wall was blown away, hiding that broken-ass quirk of yours. Izuku used attraction to pull himself out of the way of another explosion. Do you really think I would hide a quirk? Izuku snapped back at Bakugo. I wanted a quirk more than anything else, to not be mocked and derided for something I couldn't control. You're lying. Stop looking down at me. Izuku sighed. Bakugo was beyond reason. The next explosion came faster than Izuku could fully dodge, clipping him and nearly sending him out into the void, if not for a well-placed pull from attraction. The sweat glands of my palms secrete some sort of nitroglycerin. That's how my explosions work, although I'm sure you know all about that, quirk thief. Akugo raised one of his gauntlets at Izuku, pulling the handle backwards, arming it. If the support idiots honored my request, then this has been storing up sweat since this started. All Might's voice boomed through the speakers. Bakugo, don't do it. You could kill him. Only if he doesn't move. Akugo pulled the pin. A massive explosion surged at Izuku, ready to consume him. Ilnyamidoriya.
The students of class wanna watch the video monitors with bated breath. All Might activated the microphone. Young Midoriya, are you okay? Todoroki noticed the panic tone to All Might's voice, beyond what was expected for a teacher. The monitors swapped to an angle from inside the building, behind where Bakugo was standing, his outline visible through the smoke and debris-filled air. Bakugo, stand down, the matches paused. All Might had gripped the microphone so tightly it had bent. This did not escape Todoroki's attention either. The dust slowly settled, allowing the class to see Bakugo properly. Standing at the edge of the building, Izuku nowhere to be seen. Where's Deki? Momo and Kirishima had stopped their fight before All Might's announcement, the massive explosion worrying both of them. Do you think Midoriya is okay? Kirishima rubbed his forearm awkwardly. Momo gave a worried sigh. I do not know, I hope he is safe. Bakugo doesn't do things by halves, does he? Raising her eyebrows, Momo turned her head towards Kirishima. Kirishima rubbed the back of his neck. All right, but he is pretty strong. Strength doesn't make a hero. Back in the surveillance room, All Might made a decision. Young Ada, please run and get recovery girl. Ada charged up his engines. Yes, Mr. All Might. I am fine, I can go on. All Might activated the microphone. Young Midoriya, are you okay? I got out of the way. Grunting with exertion, Izuku pulled himself up a rope, the same rope he'd tied around his body ten minutes earlier. Izuku gave a small smile, muttering to himself. Thank you, Yayorazu. Reaching the top of the rope, Izuku gripped the mirror the rope was tied to, buried deep into the concrete of the wall. The concrete around the mirror suddenly crumbled, forcing Izuku to pull on the building with attraction, lifting himself up to grab the edge of the building, the rope falling to the ground below. Releasing a sigh of relief, Izuku clambered up and into the building, revealing his burnt and ruined costume. The elbow guards were completely gone, blown off, along with the torso of the jumpsuit, the material hanging around his waist, revealing Izuku's bare chest. Young Midoriya, are you safe? Izuku nodded, before realizing All Might was speaking over the tannoy. I I mean yes, I am. Bakugo growled. Young Bakugo, if you use that attack again I will be forced to disqualify your team and declare team of the winners. Sure, whatever. Izuku sighed, that wasn't encouraging. Well then, the match shall recommence. Go, come at me, shitty Deku. Pulling to one side, Izuku moved behind Bakugo, launching a kick. I'm not falling for that. Bakugo ignited an explosion in his left palm, spinning his body out of the way of Izuku's kick, before delivering one of his own. Izuku rolled away, forcing himself to a stop. Get up and fight me, tightening his fist. Izuku pulled himself towards the wall, reaching out with both hands. With a mix of his natural strength and twin explosions from his palms, at the right angle, Izuku launched a powerful kick at Bakugo. Firing off an explosion, Bakugo tried to move out of the way, but was too late, getting clipped in the shoulder. Dropping to one knee, Bakugo glared at Izuku. Stop fucking looking down at me. Igniting both palms, Bakugo shot at Izuku. Izuku pulled on the wall behind Bakugo, surging towards the other boy. Kirishima smashed his hardened fists together. Let's get back to this. Momo nodded. Let's. Racing at Kirishima. Momo swung a baton to meet Kirishima's fist, before jabbing him in the gut with her other baton. Kirishima stumbled back, closer to the bomb. You won't get the bomb. Kirishima hardened his cheek as a baton smashed into it, bending as it did, looking at her now useless baton. Momo tossed it aside and attacked with its remaining counterpart. It bent over Kirishima's shoulder, sending the last baton to join its twin. Momo dodged a hardened punch from Kirishima, creating a pair of thick rubber gloves around her hands, stretching up to her elbows. Lashing out with her left fist, Momo winced as it struck Kirishima's hardened chest, the thick rubber covering her hand protecting it from serious harm creating a new, stronger staff covered in purple crystalline powder from her left inner upper arm. Momo grabbed it with her right hand and pulled it clean from her skin. Heroes, you have five minutes left. I'm sorry about this, Kirishima. A flurry of blows struck Kirishima, who met each with her hardened skin until he eventually managed to chop it in two, taking one of the halves in the process. Both Momo and Kirishima threw the staff half they were holding away. Momo rushed at Kirishima with her fist. Kirishima raised his arms in an X block activating his quirk. It hurt, making distance between himself and Momo. Kirishima looked down at his arms, finding them covered in red chemical burns, checking the rest of his body. He found his bare torso covered in burns. I coated the second staff with potassium permanganate. In the right quantities it burns the skin. Momo turned her left arm to reveal a burn where the staff had been created from. I guess your quirk would not work if your skin was damaged. It paid off. Rushing at Kirishima, Momo swung at him, her fist slamming into the red-haired boy's forearm, his instincts betraying him. Crying out in pain at both the force of the punch and the burnt skin, Kirishima stumbled back, dropping onto one knee again. Kirishima wasn't cheering this time. He was losing, his quirk, as weak as it was, was beyond his reach. Unless, dot 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 he went beyond. 
Instead of focusing his quirk on the largest possible area, Kirishima focused instead just on the small area of his knuckles, managing to harden them slightly beyond his normal level. Surging to his feet, Kirishima struck out at Yeirazu, hitting her rubber-armored forearms, knocking her clean off her feet. Momo stared up at her opponent. Your quirk, it's pretty strong. Kirishima was taken aback. All he'd ever been told was that his quirk was weak, not when common quirks like steel or shield could do what his did better. But you need better situational awareness. Momo pushed herself up, onto her knees, reaching out to touch the bomb. The heroes have secured the bomb. Tima wins. Izuku gave a sigh of relief as he came to halt, wiping the sweat from his forehead. Phew, at least I didn't break anything this time. Bakugo stared blankly ahead, unable to process All Might's announcement. I lost. Izuku took a step backwards. He knew that tone. I fucking lost. All Might, I think we might have a problem. We fucking lost. Young Bakugo, please calm down. Bakugo growled, his eyes boring into Izuku. Stop looking down at me. You hid your quirk, you mocked me. Was I not worth using your quirk on? Explosions danced in the palms of Bakugo's hands. You wouldn't use your quirk then. And now you won't acknowledge me with your full power. Bakugo raised his gauntlet, lifting the handle. Young B-A-K-U-G-O, no. So I'll make you use it. A supercharged explosion blossomed from Bakugo's gauntlet, surging towards Izuku. Izuku entered his quirk space. Time slowed. Taking a deep breath, Izuku stared at his quirks. He had three minutes to find a solution, preferably one that avoided falling three stories. Zero gravity is a no-go. Even if I weighed 15 kilograms less the drop would still be potentially fatal. Explosion is the same. Even with both palms the explosions won't be strong enough to counteract the force of Bakugo's explosion. Izuku scratched his chin, supercharging them with one for all at his maximum would break both his arms immediately. He needed a sustained force. Attraction was too weak for it to be able to pull him back into the building, but it might be able to get him to the building at the opposite side of the road. Doing the calculations, factoring the force of Bakugo's supercharged explosion, an estimated weight of the building and the width of the average road, Izuku sighed. Izuku sighed. Even with zero gravity as well I would hit the ground before I could cross the distance. That left Izuku with two options. Use one for all in his legs, breaking them, and jump to the opposite building. Use attraction to pull a nearby piece of rubble into the path of the explosion to shield himself. Putting the first option on the back burner, Izuku began to troubleshoot the second. The first, and largest, problem was the weight of the rubble. By Izuku's calculations, factoring in the average density of concrete and an estimated volume, any piece large enough to shield him was so close to his own weight it would require multiple pulls and time he didn't have. The second problem was that a single piece of rubble would not be able to shield Izuku entirely. He'd have to use attraction to pull himself back into the building, and even then that might not be enough. This plan would require unlikely amounts of luck to work, an amount of luck Izuku wasn't comfortable with. Izuku's eyes drifted to the representation of one for all. Its structure was far more complex than any other quirk he had, even quirksmith. It was almost like it was two quirks in one. Izuku's eyes widened. It is two quirks. That meant that merging quirks was possible. This changes everything we know about quirks. But Izuku didn't have time to think about that. Expanding attraction and zero gravity. Izuku took a deep breath and pinched the node that represented attraction's weight limit, equal to the holder's own weight. Pulling, a strand of light appeared from the node, leading to Izuku's fingers. Reaching out with his other hand, Izuku snapped the strand within zero gravity that led to its own weight limit node. Plucking the loose end of the strand, Izuku moved the two strands, one green, one pink, towards each other. The two strands bonded together, glowing with silver light at the joint. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief. He had been worried that the quirks would. Attraction and zero gravity began to denature. No, no, this has to work. Panic surged through Izuku's veins as the nodes began to fade, the strands between them loosening. With one last desperate idea, Izuku called on one for all through the mental representation of his arms and plunged one into each quirk. Light blue lightning surged down Izuku's arms and into the quirks, crackling all around them. A flash of bright light forced Izuku to look away, only dimming after a full ten seconds, blinking the spots in his eyes away. Izuku turned his head back to attraction and zero gravity. The two quirks were gone. In their place was a single quirk, larger than any of his other copied quirks, colored silver. I did it. Izuku smiled, reaching out with one of his aching arms. Izuku activated Tokusei's quirk, Slingshot, created by Izuku Midoriya, age 15, on April 12, 2179. Type, Emitter, compound of attraction and zero gravity, allows the holder to manipulate a maximum of four objects below their weight limit with their mind. That was unexpected. The merged quirk had mutated, more into a moderately powerful form of telekinesis than attraction of small objects and minor gravity manipulation, more than the sum of its parts. Izuku smiled, 
returning to the real world. Izuku activated Slingshot for the first time, pulling on the four largest pieces that were below his weight limit, 116 kilograms. It was higher than Izuku expected for the composite of the two quirks, as Attraction had used his weight, 81 kilograms, and the limit he had cultivated with zero gravity had been 15 kilograms. Izuku moved the four blocks of concrete between himself and the explosion, creating a shield. The fireball struck Izuku's shield, shattering the concrete and forcing him back. As the dust settled, Izuku glanced over his shoulder to see he was at the absolute edge of the building, the heel of his back foot overhanging. You'll have to try harder than that. Izuku leveled a stare at an enraged Bakugo. Bakugo roared with rage, his hands popping with explosions, rushing at Izuku. Izuku's feet moved. He didn't even think. The sound of Bakugo's raving and All Might's shouts fading to muffled noise. Racing to meet Bakugo. Two more explosions were fired at Izuku in quick succession, each one intercepted by a piece of rubble. Fucking die already. Bakugo lurched forwards, releasing the strongest explosion he could at his former friend, reaching out to points on opposite walls. Izuku pulled on the much heavier objects, slingshotting over the explosion with ease and landing behind Bakugo. Reaching out with one hand, Izuku pulled a piece of rubble directly at himself, while attracting the far wall with his other, tugging his body out of the way. The rubble slammed into Bakugo as he turned towards Izuku, knocking him off his feet and sliding close to the edge of the building on his front. Bakugo gasped, sucking air back into his lungs, his arms under him. Before Bakugo could react, Izuku placed his sneakered foot on his chest, using his foot as the anchor point to gently pull on the floor below, trapping his former friend's arms under himself, negating the use of his quirk without injuring himself. Young Midoriya. Izuku looked up. All Might had appeared at the doorway to the destroyed room, Yeyarazu and Kirishima standing a few steps behind him. All Might. You can let him go, kid. Aizawa dropped down, landing on the edge of the building, his eyes glowing, his hair floating around his face. And Mr. Aizawa. All Might gestured to Izuku as the boy released Bakugo. Young Midoriya, your arms. Izuku looked down, finally seeing that his arms were purple and bruised, aching like they'd been run over. At least they weren't broken. All Might wrapped a blanket around Izuku's shoulders. Young Yeyarazu, would you please accompany your teammate to see Recovery Girl? Yeyarazu nodded, leading Izuku away. Young Kirishima. We shall rejoin your classmates in the surveillance room. Now, Aizawa was left alone with a fuming Bakugo. The cameras used to monitor the building disabled at the underground hero's command. Bakugo stared at his palms. I'm erasing your quirk. Aizawa sighed. Are you going to calm down now or do I need to make my dry eye even worse? Whatever. Aizawa's scarf lashed out, binding Bakugo's hands against his chest. What the fuck? You didn't give me a straight answer. Bakugo growled, before calming down. Fine, I won't use my quirk. Aizawa cancelled his quirk and recalled his scarf. That's a start at least. Aizawa moistened his eyes with drops. Let me say this, if you do anything like this again, you will be expelled. Immediately. Bakugo didn't respond. Understood. Yeah, sure, I understand. Bakugo fumed quietly. Fucking Deku. You're going to stop calling him that as well. Aizawa made his eyes briefly glow for emphasis. Call him by his actual name or not at all. Bakugo growled. I'll do what I got him want. No, you won't. As I said, this is your final warning. With your current behavior you have no potential as a hero. Bakugo didn't react. You clearly have issues you need to sort out. Aizawa sat down on the edge of the blown out wall. Hound Dog provides counseling at UA. If you talk to him I'm sure he can find a slot for you, you should give it a try. Or what, you'll expel me? Aizawa sighed. No, I can't and won't force you to go to counseling. The only person who can improve you is yourself. No one else can do it for you. To CH. Fine, it's up to you. If you're not going to talk to a counselor, at least talk to someone, anyone you trust. With that, Aizawa dropped out the side of the building, using his scarf as a grapple to swing away. Landing on the top of the building opposite, Aizawa rested on the edge, watching as Bakugo slowly climbed to his feet, rage pouring off him in waves. It was a shame. After he got Midoriya to stop holding back the day before, Aizawa had thought that class may finally be the class where he didn't have to expel any of them. And then Bakugo had gone and proved him wrong. The boy was self-destructing. Ironic considering his quirk, Aizawa doubted he'd be able to overcome his pride and ask for help. He wouldn't last the week. Katsuki lashed out, punching a wall, pain blossoming through his fist despite his rubberized gloves. He'd waited until he knew Aizawa could no longer see him to do it. Fuck. He swung with his other fist. Shit. You okay, Bakugo? Katsuki turned his head. It was Kirishima, with a fucking dopey as shit smile on his face. Fuck off, shitty hair. Kirishima chuckled. That's not a nice thing to say to your teammate. Anyway, All Might dismissed us for the day. I came to let you know. The sharp barb on the tip of Katsuki's tongue died before he could speak it. The two boys set off back for the changing room. 
The red-haired boy was watching him with an unguarded look. Nothing to hide, nothing to gain. An open book. Is this what that fucking scarf weirdo meant? Someone he could trust. Can I talk to you? Hiroshima beamed. Aren't you all ready? Don't get mouthy with me, you crimson riot knockoff. Katsuki groaned both internally and externally as this only seemed to make Kirishima happier, if such a thing was even possible. Thanks, Bakubro. That's totally what I was aiming for. I know he's pretty retro, but Crimson Riot's my favorite hero. All Might is a pretty close second though. Katsuki twitched at Kirishima's nickname. Don't call me that. Kirishima shrugged. You give everyone nicknames. I thought you might want one as well. Katsuki pinched the bridge of his nose. Those aren't nicknames. They're meant to be in Seoul. Kirishima's innocent face stared back at Katsuki. You know what? Fuck it. Never mind. Kirishima slung an arm around Katsuki's shoulder, ignoring the audible growl, as they walked down the tunnel towards the changing rooms. So, what is it you wanted to talk about, Bikubro? Katsuki gave a reluctant sigh. Goggles gave me a final warning. Kirishima patted Katsuki on the shoulder. I'm sure Mr. Aizawa was just trying to scare you so you don't go too far again. No, if I slip up, he'll expel me. Katsuki's palms fizzed with sparks. He said I should be counseling. I don't fucking need therapy. Can't hurt though, right? What? Kirishima shrugged. It can't hurt. You just talk to someone for a while. You don't even need to talk if you don't want to, and it'll get Mr. Aizawa off your back as well. Katsuki stopped in the doorway of the changing rooms. Everyone else had long since changed and left. Even Deku's bag and clothes were gone. Shitty hair was right. Katsuki begrudgingly admitted to himself, but it was more than that. Katsuki knew he'd gone too far. He'd known it the first time he used his supercharged explosion, but he'd kept on going. He couldn't stop himself. See you tomorrow, Bekugo. Katsuki looked up, watching as Kirishima waved to him, changed back into his school uniform. TCH, whatever. T thanks for bringing me. Why Yeyarazu? Izuku bound to Yeyarazu, his bruised arms hanging limply at his sides. See you tomorrow, Midoriya. With that, Izuku was left with a less than impressed recovery girl. Three times. Izuku chuckled nervously as he sat down on the bed. This is only the first day of classes. Why yeah? Recovery girl sighed. Well, at least you didn't break any bones this time. Oh oh, well, that's something at least. Your muscles are shredded. They're basically mush. I have no idea how you managed to do it or keep moving your arms. Izuku shuffled slightly. I used one for all in my quirk space. I managed to merge two of my copied quirks into one, stronger quirk. Smooch. The purple faded from one of Izuku's arms, leaving it aching but functional, a wave of tiredness washing over him. So what you're telling me is that you and I are going to be doing this often. Recovery girl watched as Izuku spluttered a response. Fine, watch what I do when I heal your other arm carefully. You might as well learn how to use my quirk while you're here. Recovery girl's lips extended, kissing Izuku's still injured arm. Slipping into his quirk space, Izuku felt the energy emitted by Recovery Girl, comparing it to the ambient energy given off by his copy of Heal. He could feel it draining his stamina, burning through at astounding speed. No wonder Recovery Girl had to heal her patients in individual sessions. Izuku wondered if there was some way he could make it more efficient, surely a more reliable power source than the target's stamina. There was, of course there was, and it was staring him in the face. One for all, by its very nature it was a stockpile of power, just waiting to be tapped into. Reaching out, Izuku's turned the drain caused by Recovery Girl's quirk from his stamina to one for all. Immediately, Izuku felt the stamina drain vanish. Instead Heal was pulling on one for all's reserve of power, unable to use it faster than it replenished. Opening his eyes, Izuku returned to the physical world to find Recovery Girl watching him, his arm fully healed, with no aching tiredness left in place of his former injury. I thought All Might made the right choice in you at the entrance exam. Recovery Girl paused. Now I'm certain of it. All that Musa Boundo fused one for all for was to point and smash, but can do so much more with it. Izuku blushed, unused to praise coming from anywhere other than his mom and more recently, All Might. Well then, we're done here, I'll leave you to get changed. Just leave your costume behind, I'll have it sent down to support for repair. Recovery girl patted Izuku on the head and turned to leave. Oh, and by the way, I'm afraid there's no gummies for you today. If I give you them every time you end up in here I'll end up rotting your teeth. Izuku smiled. Ryo was finishing up for the day, submitting the report Nedzu asked for just after lunch. A knock sounded from his door. Clicking send, Ryo minimized his email, leaving the desktop on screen. Come in. The door slammed open with more force than was necessary, revealing Katsuki Bakugo. Ryo didn't even blink, gesturing for Bakugo to take a seat on the couch. What would you like to talk to me about? Bakugo shrugged. Aizawa told me I should see you about counseling or whatever. Did he? No. Ryo scratched behind his ear. Do you want counseling? Bakugo looked. TCH, sure, I'll do it. Despite his arrogant words, Ryo knew the teen was pushing his pride to one side to ask for help in his own way. 
What kind of hero would he be if he didn't take the hand that was reaching out to him? I've got half an hour free. What do you want to talk about? Back Hugo growled. Aren't you supposed to be the one asking me questions? About feelings and shit like that. Ryo shook his head. We'll talk about what you're comfortable talking about. It can be about your day, interests, or nothing at all if you want. Huh, what about the whole lying on the couch shit? Ryo chuckled. I mean, you can if you really want. I don't feel like I can be a hero. So we're going to cut straight to chase, then? Ryo paused. Can you tell me why you feel that way? Back Hugo seethed. When I was growing up, all my teachers and classmates would tell me was that my quirk was perfect for being a hero. I was told it again and again until I believed it. I would be the perfect hero because I had the perfect hero quirk. Ryo nodded. And then something happened. Deku, the little shit went and saved me. Back Hugo paused. He had heard what All Might had said that day. When the sludge villain had taken him hostage, that Deku had been the one who spurred him into action. Deku, Midoriya. Back Hugo grunted through clenched teeth. Ah, from class 1A, Aizawa was complaining about him yesterday. He doesn't usually warm up to a new student so fast. But you said he was complaining. Back Hugo groused. That's how you know Aizawa likes you. Sounds like he needs therapy as well. Ryo chuckled. He wasn't expecting the teen to actually have a sense of humor, no matter how sarcastic it in fact was. This Deku, Midoriya, how did he save you? Back Hugo growled. Okay, we don't have to discuss that. How about what led you to come here today? Clenching his fists. Back Hugo forced himself to speak. I went too far. I was just so angry. I couldn't stop myself. Back Hugo sighed. The tension melting from his body, his head falling. I lost control. What kind of hero can't control their temper? Ryo cracked his neck. My quirk means that if I get too angry I lose the power of speech. All I can do then is bark. Back Hugo's head rose to look at Ryo. Anger isn't inherently a bad thing. Just so long as you control it, or it'll control you. Ryo scratched his snout. Anger can be a weapon, honed to perfection, to give you that drive to win when you're on your last legs. Back Hugo stilled. How do I do that? You need to know what is making you so angry. It's fucking Deku, looking down at me all the time. Ryo sighed. I can assure you it isn't. That is a lie you tell yourself. You need to look deeper. What exact moment today made you realize you'd lost control? Back Hugo paused. The costume. Silence hung heavy in the air, almost deafening. The costume that Auntie and Co. made for Deku. The one my old hag said she worked so hard on, I destroyed it. For the first time in years, shame filled Katsuki Back Hugo, threatening to swallow him whole, with anger rising to meet it. Then fix it. I'm sure there is someone in the support department who can. The shame in Bakugo didn't falter or diminish, but he didn't feel like he was drowning anymore. He knew what he had to do now. Shota didn't bother to knock as he entered the principal's office. Come in, Aizawa. Take a seat. Nedzu continued to sort through paperwork, not even batting an eye. This was a common occurrence, after all. Aizawa sighed. Before sitting down across from the rodent principal, Nedzu laid his paperwork down, turning his attention to Aizawa. So, is this about the Katsuki Bakugo incident? My calculations gave a 41% chance you would immediately expel him. I haven't expelled him. Nedzu nodded. Since I know you would not allow him to continue without punishment I assume you gave him a final warning. Aizawa gave a noise of agreement. Well then, are you here for the 37% chance Katsuki Bakugo would immediately take an action that would have you expel him or the 58% chance that that he will not seek help? Neither, I just got an email from Inui. Bakugo came to see him, they have another session scheduled for next Monday. Menzu placed his paws together. So, if you are not expelling Katsuki Bakugo, why did you come to see me? Costumes. Costumes. Aizawa nodded. Or more accurately, the costume designers who work for UA. What is the problem with the designers? They appear to be taking certain liberties with the design of costumes. Aizawa placed an image on Nenzu's desk, a professionally produced piece of concept art. It showed a different version of Yeyarazu's costume, complete with shorts and a thinner window in the torso. This is what Yeyarazu submitted to the design agency. This is what she received. Aizawa added a second image, concept art of the costume the girl had worn earlier that day. Nenzu studied the two images. Hem, this is troubling. Yeyarazu's costume has been altered to show the maximum amount of skin allowed for a pro hero. But Yeyarazu isn't a pro hero yet, as she is still a minor she is subject to different regulations. Her draft costume was already showing the maximum allowed skin for a minor. Aizawa sighed. This isn't the only example. Another pair of images landed on Nedzu's desk. Uraraka, costume changed to be skin tight. Two more sets joined them. Ashido and Asui, skin tight costumes again. With the same designer as Yeyarazu. More images. Hagakure, literally a pair of gloves and boots. Takoyami, just a black cape and boots. Jairo and Kaminari, same designer, almost identical costumes barring support items. Aizawa drew one final image, handing it directly to Nenzu. And possibly the most egregious, apart from Yeyarazu's, is Minoru Minta's costume. 
Nedzu stared at the image. Is that a diaper, themed after a fruit bowl? Aizawa inclined his head, with a small sigh. I assume this is not what Minoru Minder requested. Nedzu placed the picture down, joining the others. It isn't. I looked at his request. That diaper bowl should be a pair of white shorts over the rest of the costume. Um, ah uh, yes, as a homage to a fictional pre-quirk hero. Aizawa shrugged. He'd never bothered much about fictional heroes from before superpowers were a reality. It always seemed too unrealistic for each hero to have four or five separate powers. Then again, Aizawa had to admit it was a bit more realistic now he had a quirk like Midoriya's in his class. Nedzu sighed. It seems the design agencies must be taken in hand. Inappropriate. Mocking and lazy costumes not only undermine our integrity as an educator of heroes, but the integrity of these future heroes. What course of action do you want to take? Aizawa questioned. A worryingly maniacal laugh slipped from Nenzu's lips. I will handle the agencies by myself. I will also send a request to Power Loader to alter Yeirazu's costume. Aizawa shrugged and stood. Fine, I'll inform the rest of class that they are allowed to wear their gym uniforms for now if they want. Nedzu nodded. An excellent idea, have a good evening, Aizawa. Katsuki pushed the door to the 3G support workshop open, deafening noise greeting him. This was where Dogface had said Deku's costume was sent to be repaired. Boy, where's Deku's costume? Katsuki's yell was lost to the droning of machines, the banging of hammers and the grinding of metal. Deaf fucks. Katsuki watched as the support students went on with their building, forging and tinkering. He could see at least two sets of powered armor, three flamethrowers, countless grapple guns and what looked like a ten feet tall armored robot. Finding the emergency stop on the wall, Katsuki pressed it. Instantly the sound of the workshop went dead, replaced with shouts of disbelief and anger. What the hell did you do that for, newbie? Katsuki ground his teeth together, forcing himself to stay on topic instead of raging at the stupid extra. You thick-skulled extras couldn't hear me over your stupid toys. Did he just call us extras? Thick-skulled. These aren't toys, you fucking. Katsuki released a small explosion. I don't care what you shitstains have to say. I'm just looking for the costume from one of that got wrecked. One of the support students stepped forward. Oh, that piece of crap. We trashed. All it was good for was junk. Katsuki's fists tightened. You fucking dick bags. Another student joined the first. Was it yours, newbie? Did your mummy make it for you? Katsuki growled, his palms dancing with weak explosions. Stop being dicks to the kid. A tall student, dressed in oil-stained overalls, stepped in between Katsuki and the other students, his pale red hair smudged with grime. No wonder all the other classes don't like us when you guys go round acting like this. The first student rolled his eyes. TCH, whatever. Katsuki frowned. With that, the machines restarted, the support students going back to their work. Follow me. The red-haired student set off towards a side room. Katsuki shrugged. Why should I listen to an extra like you? Follow me. Katsuki's clothes lurched, dragging him off after the student. What the fuck? My quirk, limited fibrokinesis, allows me small-scale control over fabric and its fibers. It's the perfect support quirk. The red-haired student glanced over his shoulder. I'm Matsuro-sen. Matsuro-sen, sounds like dumb fucking name. Sin laughed. You must be Katsuki Bakugo then, the whole of you eh? Is abuzz with what happened today. Katsuki sighed. Great. Sen released his hold on Katsuki as they entered the side room, the door dulling the racket from the workshop. I saw those clowns throwing that jumpsuit away. Sen moved over to a workbench, so I took it, to give it back to the kid it belongs to. Katsuki stepped forward, seeing Deku's jumpsuit on the workbench, each scrap of cloth laid back in its correct place. Could you repair it? It was barely a whisper, the words forced from Katsuki's lips with all his might. Sen glanced over at Katsuki. Huh, what did you say? Katsuki growled. I said could you fix this stupid jumpsuit? Sen chuckled. No need to shout, kid. Don't call me that. Sure thing, kid. Katsuki's eye twitched. Can you do it or not? Sen shrugged. Sure, why not? Holding out the first two fingers of his left hand, Sen moved them in line with the tear of the mask. Fibers from each half reached out, reconnecting and joining the mask together seamlessly. As if Katsuki had never blown it apart. Sen moved on, repairing each tear and rip until the jumpsuit was whole once again. Here you are. It may look like whatever happened to it never happened, but it's still pretty weak. The kid will need a new one, made here with better materials. Sen folded up the jumpsuit. I can tell this was made with a lot of love. Sen held the jumpsuit out to Katsuki. Make sure it gets back to the Midoriya kid safely. Katsuki grunted, stuffing the jumpsuit in his back. Thanks or whatever. Sen sighed, before smiling. Good luck, hero in training kid. Katsuki snarled. Izuku stared at the wrecked fridge freezer in front of him. Even after all the work he'd put into cleaning up the beach junk kept on washing up from the sea. But that just meant Izuku wouldn't stop. After all the hard work he'd put into this beach, he wasn't going to let it slide back into being a dump now. It also gave him plenty of chances to work on his quirks. And right now, he was focusing on his newest quirk. 
slingshot, reaching out with his hand. Izuku pulled on the fridge, receiving only a slight wobble for his effort. Too heavy, how about? Holding his hand out again, Izuku activated two of slingshot's strands. The fridge rocked and fell over. Then this should work. Using all four strands, Izuku latched them onto the fridge and lifted it into the air. Grunting at the exertion, Izuku realized this was the same effort it required him to carry the fridge to this spot in the first place. That was it. The weight limit of slingshot was not a combination of the two quirks' weight limits, but the force he could produce with his limbs. 94 kilograms, exactly half of what Izuku's could bench comfortably, when using two of his limbs. That meant that by increasing his strength and muscle mass the weight limit for slingshot would increase, just like how one for all would become less harmful to his body with greater strength and muscle mass. The fridge dropped into the sand, but that wasn't to say Slingshot didn't come with disadvantages of its own. Izuku had quickly found he couldn't alter Slingshot at all. Any attempts to even manipulate the inner workings of the quirk had threatened to denature it. While Slingshot was now a single quirk, it still took up the quirk's base of its constituent parts. Similarly, any attempts he had made to recopy attraction from his mom had failed. The last, and most annoying, limitation of the new quirk was its lack of effect on people and animals. Attraction had held a similar limitation, but Izuku had hoped it would take after zero gravity in that respect. But at least the nausea from zero gravity had vanished when the two quirks had merged. Here mumbling again, young Midoriya. Izuku was shaken from his thoughts, raising his head to the side of All Might standing in front of him, in his true form. All M. Izuku cut himself off. I mean, mister. It was at that point Izuku realized he didn't know what to call the man. Yagi, Izuku stared at astonishment at his idol, his worries about All Might's fear of his quirk momentarily forgotten. All Might had told him his name, well, just his surname, but it wasn't any less amazing. All Might's identity was a closely guarded secret, no one knew it, just like one for all. All right, All Might nodded. I thought I might find you here. Izuku shrugged nervously. That pass to train with my quirks you gave me is still valid until next week. I thought I'd get some practice with Slingshot before it ran out. All Might guided Izuku over to a bench, the two taking a seat. I actually wanted to talk to you about that quirk, if you don't mind. As sure, All Might smiled. I was just curious where you got it from. I have an idea but I didn't want to be presumptuous. Izuku's thoughts turned negative for a few seconds, before he forced himself to banish them. I created it. During the fight, I merged my mom's and Uraraka's quirks. All Might hummed in agreement. As I thought, I never knew it was possible. It was a bit of Hail Mary. Izuku paused. But now I've seen what a merged quirk looks like, I've realized something. One for all is a two-in-one quirk. Izuku's head snapped round to look at his mentor. Why you knew? All Might sighed. I did. The only reason I chose not to tell you was because I didn't want to burden you with one for all's history. One for all's history. It's not a pleasant one. All Might ran a hand through his hair. As you know, you and I are the eighth and ninth holders of this quirk. The first holder wasn't born with one for all, but one of the two quirks that formed it. The ability to pass on his own quirk, he was believed to be quirkless. Izuku nodded, listening intently, and raptured by the story. The first holder, he had a brother. All Might's voice caught in his throat. His name was All for One. All for One. Izuku frowned. Surely no one would inflict their child with a name like that. It's an alias. After his quirk, his real name has been lost to time. More than one holder of our quirk has been forced to choose a successor during battle. Doesn't exactly leave much time for training or learning its history. All Might stopped, giving Izuku time to process what he'd just said, well aware of the somber tone he'd set for the conversation. One for all is derived from all for one, a quirk that can steal the quirks of others and make them the holders. But it can also give quirks as well. All for one, everything for one person. All Might nodded in agreement. This all happened at the dawn of quirks, before society collapsed. The law and order of that era could not adapt to cover the quirks that began to appear. Progress ceased and decay set in. Izuku followed All Might's eye line up the moon, hanging in the twilight sky. If superpowers had never appeared, then humans would be taking interstellar holidays by now. I remember hearing that once, on the TV. That's true. In that age of chaos, all for one united many of the quirked peoples, promising them a future without discrimination, freedom from the quirkless. All Might lowered his gaze. Izuku's eyes widened. The first demon, I thought that was just a myth. All Might shook his head. I'm afraid it isn't. All for one, he stole the quirks of any who stood in his way, even from those who didn't, and sometimes just because he wanted one that interested him. He offered the quirkless of that era. Those who wished to be quirked, the power they wanted, in exchange for servitude, and so he built an army. He ruled Japan, he had sights set on the rest of the world as well, until he made a mistake. All Might looked to his protege. He forced a quirk onto his brother. He was ashamed of someone as almighty as himself having such a weakling for a sibling, a sibling that resisted his rule, so that created one for all. 
Yes, the core golfer one forced on the first holder allowed the user to stockpile power. It merged with his natural quirk to become one for all, far weaker then, but still a potent force, stronger than most quirks of that era. So one for all is kind of like a compound quirk, like Todoroki has. All Might nodded, exactly like that. Compound quirks are rare, a union of both of the parents' quirks. All compound quirks have one commonality. They have dual functions, like young Todoroki's ice and fire. Izuku frowned. But Slingshot only has one function. I can manipulate a maximum of four objects with my mind. Perhaps you just haven't found its second function yet. All Might offered reassuringly. But back on topic. All Might laced his hands together. Many quirks all for one passed on mutated or were influenced by natural quirks, harmonizing with them. But, one for all was the first time, and until today, the only time two quirks have become one. Izuku looked down at his hands, thinking back to the muscle damage he'd caused by activating one for all inside his quirk space, right as zero gravity and attraction began to denature. Then that makes sense. All Might raised an eyebrow at his successor's words. When I tried to merge those quirks today, I was failing, they were falling apart, I activated one for all in the hope I could stop it. So that's how they merged. All Might tapped a finger against his chin. One for all's power was the source, it provided the energy. See could it be? Izuku stopped, worried to continue. You can say it, young Midoriya. Could it be that your description of the first holder's original quirk is wrong? Very possibly. What do you have in mind? Izuku paused. You said his quirk could pass itself on, but what if it had another dimension to it? All Might realized what Izuku was thinking. The ability to merge quirks. Izuku nodded. Why yeah? Or maybe it was just because the power you use from one for all has the signature of a merged quirk. Izuku started, thinking over his mentor's words. A template for slingshot to work from, it could be. All Might shrugged. Maybe. I'll leave the deep quirk analysis up to you. It was never my strong suit. A silence fell over the mentor and mentee. Heavy and cold, freezing Izuku's lungs. All these weeks of seeing the distrust in All Might's eyes. Now Izuku knew why. You think my quirk is like all for ones, don't you? All Might flinched. Young Midoriya. Why? Why would you fear my quirk just because it's similar to his? Izuku's outburst took All Might by surprise. The boy was surprisingly loud when he wanted to be. I'm not afraid of your quirk, young Midoriya. Then what else is it? You trusted me with one for all. Then as soon as you find out about my quirk you shut down, I can see it in your eyes. All Might stayed silent. That's it, isn't it? You think I'm related to him, to all for one. Izuku's hand tightened, gathering fistfuls of his tracksuit pants. Just because all for one may have been one of my ancestors, why does that mean I can't be trusted? Because of a man who's been dead for decades. All Might spoke. I killed all for one six years ago, the same day he gave me that injury. Izuku felt the world drop out from below him. Six years ago. It was six years ago. That day when Izuku had gone to bed and woke up to find his dad was gone. Whenever he'd asked his mom where he was she'd just cry and tell him that his dad got a job overseas. Izuku collapsed forward onto the sand, on all fours. No, that's impossible. All for one stole a longevity quirk during his reign of terror. He used it to remain unaging. All Might placed a hand on Izuku's shoulder. Don't say it. I hoped it wouldn't come to this, that I would be wrong. All Might paused. I'm sorry, Izuku, but your father was all for one. No. Izuku slammed his fist down, spraying up sand, mixing with the tears streaming down his face. Young Midoriya, it's okay to be angry. Angry, this isn't angry. Izuku stopped, his arm hanging limp. Angry is what happens when you get punched by a bully. Angry is what happens when you get told to kill yourself for being quirkless. Izuku pushed himself to his feet. My dad is kind. He loves me, I know that. All Might reached out to his protege. Izuku slapped his hand away. If what you say is true, then I'll never get to see him again, because you killed him. Before All Might could react the boy was gone, racing away from him as fast as his legs could carry him. Tashinori sighed, seeming to deflate even more than he already had. Well, that was a fine mess, wasn't it? Tashinori froze. That voice. The same voice he'd heard every time before he had his ass handed to him when he was still in training. Gran Torino. A short, grey-haired man with a cane walked down the stairs and onto the beach. We meet again. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Tashinori nodded glumly as Torino hopped onto the bench next to him. Torino chuckled. The circle is now complete. When we last met you were but the learner. Now, you are the master. The master of screwing up, you mean. Torino rolled his eyes. Don't be so dramatic Tashinori. Some of the arguments we had during your training were far worse than that. Tashinori looked at his former mentor questioningly. I just told him I killed his father. That seems to be a bit more than an argument. He's a teenager, he'll get over it. Torino paused. Besides, if you're right, and his father is all for one, he's going to need your support. The two men fell into a companionable silence. Tashinori could almost believe the last 30 years hadn't happened, that he and Torino were just taking a break from his training. Tashinori's wound ached, reminding him that wasn't so. 
those days were gone, and they were never coming back. Since he'd finished his training with Torino, Tashinori had seen him maybe five or six times, only ever in a professional setting, one of those being that day. Funny to think this place used to be a dump. Tashinori nodded in agreement. Six years. Feels like longer since we fought all for one on this beach. It's why I chose this as Midoriya's project. Tashinori looked down at his hand, not just to make him a suitable vessel for one for all, but to change the place I got this injury into something else. Tashinori closed his hand into a fist, something better. Hopeful. Torino chuckled. You're still the same idealistic idiot I used to beat up, aren't you? Tashinori started. Good. Torino paused. Don't ever lose that. A small smile crept onto Tashinori's face. I promise. Quirkless. Bang. What a freak. Bang. No wonder his parents abandoned him. He's less than nothing. Bang. Mikumo slammed the hammer down harder, trying to drown out those words. The words he heard every day. The words that threatened to shatter his hope, his ambitions. Mikumo couldn't let them. Bang. He had been hesitant at first, partnering with Hatsum. But already Mikumo knew it had been the right choice. With her insane building speed and his eye for design flaws, together they had managed to design a 3D model for a set of armor. It was only for a prototype, but it was the next step on Mikumo's path to being a hero. Tatsum had left to go home, but Mikumo had stayed, starting work on the first piece of the armor, a new set of gauntlets. Each was equipped with grapple units, upgraded shock absorption and multiple repulsors along the back of the forearm. They would boost both his punching power against villains and his lifting strength for rescue work. Mikumo lowered his hammer. The metal plating for between each of the fingers was now bent over to meet the palm of the gauntlet. Moving over to the welding station, Mikumo secured each metal strip to the palm. Mikumo would rather be here, working on his project, than go back to that place. For long as possible, filing the excess metal on the joints down. Mikumo returned to his workstation, slotting the hand section of the gauntlet into the rest. Wiping the sweat from his brow, Mikumo smiled. Creating this kind of stuff was how he felt at home. Hammers didn't mock you. 3D printers wouldn't tell you to jump off the roof. Plasma cutters didn't wish you'd never been born. Here, in his work, Mikumo was safe. Mikumo twitched, someone was in the workshop. Spinning around, Mikumo scanned the semi-lit room, but there was nothing to be seen. A chair moved minutely. Someone without Mikumo's years of watching out for the fists of his tormentors would never have seen it. I, I know you're here. Nothing. Something in Mikumo's mind clicked. You're that invisible girl from 1A. I heard the others talking about you guys. Aw, jeez. The voice came from the left of Mikumo, making him jump. I was hoping you wouldn't notice me. Mikumo's face flushed at the realization of what the girl's lack of corporeal form meant. W-Y's that. I'm training. With my quirk being a stealth hero is my only option and I can't really train with people who know I'm there. Mikumo rubbed the back of his head. I guess that's true. Huh, you kinda remind me of someone in my class. Are oh, really? Yeah. You're not Midoriya's brother or something, are you? What? Does that mean you're not? Cause guys practically look like twins, except the eyes, his are more innocent. Mikumo sighed. I only met Midoriya yesterday. And he's already made such an impression on me. So that's not a no then. Mikumo started, going to react, before coming to realization. Was he related to Midoriya? But Mikumo couldn't imagine someone as caring as Midoriya's mother dumping a child on the streets. Even then, he'd seen the look she was giving last night. Almost like she knew there was a chance he existed and seeing him had just been confirmation. Could he and Midoriya share a father? The main lights of the workshop came to life, illuminating Mikumo's surroundings and making him blink rapidly. You still in here, kid? Mikumo turned. It was Power Loader, Sans costume. And Mr. Power Loader. IW was just putting a bit of extra work on mine and Hatsum's project. Power Loader's eyebrows quirked. It's 7.30, don't you have a home to go to? Mikumo didn't respond, but Power Loader could see he'd hit a sore spot. Power Loader changed the subject. You hear by yourself then? Hatsum gone home. Why yeah, she did. Mikumo nodded. But I'm not alone, I was talking too. Mikumo's eyes widened. Sorry, I didn't ask your name. There was no response from the invisible girl. Mikumo tilted his head. Hey, are you still here? Power Loader frowned. You talking to yourself, kid? Shaking his head, Mikumo pointed to the left of himself. The invisible girl from Class 1A, I was talking to her. Power Loader opened his phone, scrolling to the right app. Hagakure left campus hours ago. Her ID logged it on her way out the gate. Mikumo was at a loss. He knew he'd been talking to her. You must be pretty tired if you're imagining things like that. I can't really train with people who know I'm there. Mikumo's eyes widened, before he nodded, deciding to let the matter drop. Power Loader moved over to Mikumo's workbench. Damn, you and Hatsum designed this in an afternoon, and you've already started building it. I couldn't have done that at your age. Hell, I don't think I could do this now. Mikumo nodded mutely, taken aback by Power Loader's sudden change in behavior. 
how our loader picked up the designs. These are pretty impressive. I don't get many first-year students who can come up with this sort of stuff. Hatsum came up with most of the ideas. I just made sure that they were possible. Makumo activated the screen built into his workstation and pressed a button. A hologram made from blue light appeared above the workbench, showing a 3D model of the prototype suit. Kaur Loader whistled in appreciation. Designed for both combat and rescue work. That's a lofty goal if I've ever seen one. Mikumo shrugged awkwardly. Kaur Loader straightened up. So, kid, you guys got a name for this thing. Nodding, Mikumo stared at the 3D model. Yeah, I've come up with one. Porkless. The armor, I call it. Die already, you waste of space. Mikumo's fists tightened. Shatterproof. Four-year-old Izuku beamed as he tucked into the ice cream cone in his hand, his other holding tight to his dad's much larger hand. Thanks, dad. Isashi Midoriya smiled back at his young son, before ruffling his curly hair. You're very welcome, dad. Izuku made his best attempt at looking indignant. Isashi laughed, prompting him to do it again. Izuku pouted. H how would you like it if I did it to you? Continuing to laugh as he reached up, Hisashi ran a hand through his curly black hair, identical to his son's, except for the color. Hifumi Shigaraki. Hisashi froze. Jairo Takahashi. Koji Ito. Ryuji Takabana. Kenji Akatani. Gripping his son's hand tightly, Hisashi turned around. A tall, unnaturally white-haired man stood behind them, dressed in an expensive gray suit. With the man were three thugs. One had a shark's head, one had spikes down his arms and the last was unremarkable apart from solid purple eyes. You're a hard man to track down, Shigaraki. The white-haired man spoke with an American accent. Partly, you're alive. Hisashi moved Izuku behind himself. Despite your best efforts, the thugs behind Hartley did their best to look intimidating. Hartley rolled his neck. It's been a few years, hasn't it? 20, 30, finally decided to settle down again. Play the family man once more. D-Dad. Ice cream ran down Izuku's arm. Now forgotten. It's going to be okay, Izuku. Asashi squeezed his son's hand, trying to reassure him. Hartley sighed. Don't worry Shigaraki, we have no interest in the boy. He's quirkless, isn't he? Just like your brother was, before you killed him. Asashi stilled. Hit a nerve have I. Hartley glared at Asashi. Hatred burning in his eyes. Father. Asashi didn't reply. The purple-eyed man blinked. A haze passed over them, transporting them to an abandoned industrial area, the warehouse behind them long since demolished. Stepping forward, smoke slipped from between Hisashi's lips. Fine, you want to kill me, go on try it. Flicking his wrist, Hisashi created a blue force field, made of interconnecting hexagons, around Izuku. Shark head charged at Hisashi, getting a face full of flames in reply. Oi, Deku. Izuku started, peeling his face from the book he'd fallen asleep on. Fucking nerd. Looking up, Izuku frowned at the sight of Bakugo, the teen holding a balled-up cloth in his hand. W what is it, Bakugo? Izuku stifled a yawn. Bakugo blinked. The sound of his name coming out of Izuku's mouth seemed so unnatural to him. Here's your fucking dumbass costume back. Bakugo slammed the cloth down on Izuku's desk, allowing him to see it was his costume, fully repaired. K Kaken, TCH, whatever, nerd. Bakugo rolled his eyes. More on it support said you need a new one. This repair is just cosmetic. And don't fucking cry about it. Izuku brushed the tears away. T thank you. Shut up. Bakugo stomped to his desk, in front of Izuku, and sat down, his arms crossed. Looking around, Izuku realized everyone else had arrived, chatting among themselves before homeroom started. Rubbing his face, Izuku thought back to the dream. That dream, the same one he'd had last night, that had woken him up at two in the morning. He hadn't gotten back to sleep after that. Two nights of little to no sleep and yesterday's battle trial had taken their toll on Izuku. It was almost definitely the reason why he'd fallen asleep before homeroom. At least he'd gotten to UA. Early enough to avoid the rabid crowd of reporters swarming anyone who went to enter the school with questions about All Might. You look tired. Ye Arazu sat in Siro's seat, to the right of Izuku. Class 1A's resident tape dispenser was currently sitting on Kirishima's desk. T thanks. Izuku was unsure how to respond to that. Ye Arazu chuckled. I don't think that was a compliment. Right, I'm just tired. Let's hope we don't have another training exercise today, then. Yeyarazu smiled at Izuku. Her confidence was infectious. Izuku matched her smile, nodding his head. Yeah. The classroom door opened and Aizawa entered. Everyone rushed to get back to their seats. Aizawa sighed. Five seconds, still too long. As homeroom started Izuku pulled out his latest hero notebook. Number 15, reserved for his classmates and himself. Opening it up, Izuku began writing in it. All the while his left hand was using a grip trainer under the desk, just to distract himself from that dream. From the fact that his father was probably dead. 
sketching Ayama in his hero outfit. Izuku wrote a description of the blonde boy's quirk, as well as its potential uses and disadvantages. Leaving space to add more detail later, Izuku turned the page and began on Ashido. All the while, Izuku continued to bat away his own thoughts. He wouldn't think about it. All Might had to be wrong. Whoa, is that Ashido? Siro leaned over to look at Izuku's notebook. While Izuku covered the page with his hands, Siro pulled the notebook out, reading Ashido's page. So cool, can you do me? Izuku was like a deer in the headlights, unsure what to say. Midoriya. Izuku jumped at the sound of Aizawa's voice, his head whipping around to look at his homeroom teacher. You injured your arms again. Izuku was relieved. Aizawa was talking about the battle trial. He didn't seem to have noticed that he hadn't been paying attention. Also, you should be paying more attention. Shit. Izuku rubbed the back of his head. He knew it was a bad habit he knew he'd have to break at some point. But right now wasn't really the time. At least I didn't break my arms this time. Aizawa gave Izuku a piercing look. Your muscles, to quote recovery girl, were mush. Murmurs spread through the class, making Izuku feel even more nervous than he already did. However, good work with furthering that telekinesis quirk of yours. Izuku shuffled anxiously in his chair. I it's actually a different quirk. I got the attention of the class, as well as Aizawa. I kind of fused my telekinesis quirk and Yuraraka's quirk. Aizawa managed to hide his surprise almost immediately, returning to his normal, passive expression. The rest of class again burst into a whispered frenzy, while Bakugo grunted, just about managing to restrain his temper. Sure, good work anyway. Aizawa nodded his head, eyes on Izuku. Keep this up, and there's hope for you as a hero yet. Izuku beamed, tears welling at the praise he so rarely received. Now, moving on to the next matter. Aizawa stared intently at the class. Sorry about the late notice, but today you have to do something very important. The whole class was tense, worried that Aizawa would spring another test on them like he had on the first day. You have to select class representatives. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, before bursting into yelling and shouting. This job is made for me. I'm the Parfait representative, Aisai. I want to be class rep, it's super manly. Kaminari and Sato announced their interest as well, raising their hands. Minta began to yell a perverted comment about what he'd do as class representative. I'll be the leader. Mina interrupted Minta, drowning him out. Izuku looked around at his classmates. In normal school being the class representative was a lot of work for pretty much nothing. But at UA, it was a symbol that you had the potential to be the leader of the next generation of heroes. Even Bakugo was yelling his desire for the role. Izuku steeled himself and raised his hand, as the noise only increased in volume. Silence, please. The shouts ceased at Ida's call, the class turning their heads to look at the tall, bespectacled boy. The role of class representative is one with a serious responsibility for leading others. It is not a job for someone to accept on a whim. It requires conviction. Ada had the full attention of the class. It is a calling that requires the trust of those around you. We should vote for our class representatives using democracy. An election, don't you agree, Mr. Aizawa? Aizawa was already cocooning himself in his garish yellow sleeping bag. Sure, just be sure to get it done quickly. Kaminari was the first in the class to speak up. Why did you suggest that? Suyu placed a finger to her cheek. We haven't known each other very long, have we, Ada? Kirishima stood up. Won't everyone just vote for themselves then? It just means that whoever gets more than one vote will be a representative. Everyone turned to look at Izuku, making him shrink back slightly. T that's just what I thought anyway. Ida chopped the air. I agree entirely. Midoriya, please help me distribute voting slips. Reaching into his jacket, Ida pulled out a number of small, blank cards. The entire class was taken aback by Ida's preparedness, wondering if he had been expecting this. They all quickly came to the conclusion that he probably had. Taking ten of the slips, Izuku handed them out to his side of the classroom, from Shoji to Yeirazu. Returning to his seat, Izuku stared down at his own slip, debating who to vote for. On one hand, Ida was authoritative and organized. However, he lacked the ability to talk to people on the same level as them most of the time, coming off as high and mighty. On the other hand, Yeirazu was calm and level-headed, capable of seeing through Aizawa's logical ruse, but she lacked Ida's authority and presence. Making his decision, Izuku scribbled it down and handed it to Yuraka as she came round to collect them. At Aizawa's desk, Yuraka tallied up the votes and wrote them on the board, stepping away to reveal them. Izuku froze in shock. Midoriya four votes. Ida two votes. Siro two votes. Akugo two votes. Yeirazu two votes. Minda two votes. Yuraka two votes. Ayama one vote, Ashida one vote, Kaminari one vote, Kirishima one vote. Various sighs and shouts reached Izuku's ears as he continued to stare at the results. Sure, he had said he wanted the position, but he hadn't actually expected to get it. Whoa, Midoriya's class representative. Kaminari gave Izuku a thumbs up, clearly not that upset by missing out. Who voted for that fucking nerd? Izuku had to agree. It was a very good question. 
Uraraka looked away nervously. Ida chopped the air again. Midoriya has the most votes, however six of us are tied for second. Izuku jumped when he realized that Ida was looking to him, expecting for him to tell him what to do. All right, we should do the vote again. With just those who got two votes, Ada produced even more cards. Excellent idea, class representative. Izuku paled at the realization of just quite the responsibility he had taken on. A new card was placed on Izuku's desk by a beaming Uraraka. Wasting no time, Izuku wrote the same name as before, calling on the positivity that Uraraka's quirk, now a part of Slingshot, emanated in the confidence of Bakugos. Izuku stood and moved to collect the slips himself. Once the class had finished voting for the second time, Izuku quickly tallied up the votes, before scribing them onto the board, next to the last set of results. Yeyurazu 5 votes, Ada 4 votes, Iraraka 3 votes, Siro 3 votes, Bakugo 2 votes, Minda 2 votes. Ada slumped in defeat. I lost. The class continued to react to the results, mostly congratulating Yeyurazu, as well Bakugo yelling in disgust at losing out. Aizawa rose from his sleeping back. This over now. Aizawa stretched. Izuku nodded, joined by Yeyurazu at the front of the class. Fine, Midoriya is the class representative, and Yeyurazu is the vice representative. A polite round of applause came from the rest of the class, with a few whoops and cheers added in by Kirishima and Kaminari. Izuku smiled, thanking them all for their support, but inside his head he was screaming in panic. Aizawa sighed. Now let's get on with some actual classes. Who's ready to make some noise? Present Mike's yell rattled the windows as he entered the classroom. In English, Izuku stared down at his rice, trying to decipher the world's mysteries from a bowl of rice. Looking up, Izuku saw Yeyurazu looking back at him from the opposite side of the table. You haven't eaten anything. Why yeah? Izuku poked his rice with his chopsticks. I'm more trying to decipher how I managed to end up the class representative. Yeyurazu smiled. That's pretty simple. People trust you and you're resourceful, both in the quirk tests and the battle trials yesterday. Hiroraka nodded in agreement, opposite Ada. Who was on Izuku's left? Your plan for the battle trial is why you got MVP. And the beating Bekugo bit as well. Iraraka smiled. I got MVP. Izuku's voice raised in pitch, displaying his surprise. Yeah. Iraraka gave Izuku a thumbs up. It was pretty close between you and Yeirazu. It was your refusal to give up that decided it in the end. W wow. Izuku was thoroughly taken aback. He totally expected that Yeirazu or Kirishima would have been MVP. Ida spoke up. Worry not, your decisiveness and grit are what make you a good leader. It's why I voted for you. Izuku gaped. One of those votes was you. Ada nodded. Ada's right. Uraraka smiled. But didn't you want to be class representative too? You've got the glasses for it and everything. Lowering his drink, Ada shook his head. Wanting a role and being the right choice for the role are not the same thing. I humbly believe I selected the most suitable for the role. Izuku's eyebrows raised. Humbly, Uraraka turned to look at Ida. The way you talk, are you a rich kid like Yeyurazu? Ida sighed. I don't usually like people to know, but yes, I'm from a renowned hero family. Yeyurazu caught Izuku's eye, mouthing at him while pointing at herself. Am I a rich kid? Izuku nodded. Idaten was founded by my grandfather, but my older brother is the hero in charge now, I am the second son. So your brother is the turbo hero, Ingenium, right? He employs 65 psychics at his office in Tokyo. He is, I forgot you were a hero fanboy, Midoriya. Ada continued, unaware of Izuku's protests. He leads people with an unwavering adherence to rule and regulation. He is the reason why I desire to become a hero. The Araka, Yeyurazu and Izuku continued to listen as Ida gave his speech. I'm not ready to lead yet, I realize that. You were the superior candidate, Midoriya. Ida finished with a small smile. Yuraraka beamed. I haven't seen you smile before, Ada. I am known to smile, on occasion of course. Izuku stared at Ada, with a smile of his own. So ingenium is Ida's all might then. So, how does it feel, superior candidate? Yeyurazu teased. You feeling up to the job now? I think so. Yeah, I'm going to do my best. Izuku held his hand out, clenched as a fist. Izuku dug into his rice as Yuraraka and Ida continued their lighthearted argument. So, Ada's a shoe in for the class committee, right? Yeyurazu tilted her head in agreement. Right. A mischievous smile slipped onto Yeyurazu's lips. That was a rousing speech he gave. Maybe he should be in charge of writing ours. Izuku shook his head and chuckled at the joke. I think you have to pay people to do that. I have the money. Feeling bold, Izuku replied. Bet you do, rich kid. Superior candidate. Yeyurazu mimed pushing glasses up the bridge of her nose. Izuku grimaced. Don't remind me. A tray was placed down next to Yeyurazu, with Makumo dropping into the empty seat. Gee good afternoon, Izuku. Why Yeyurazu? Makumo nervously greeted them. Izuku had introduced him to Yeyurazu at the previous day's lunchtime, 
the black-haired girl producing the material Makumo wanted there and then. This is Makumo Akatani. Izuku introduced the boy to Yuraka and Ada, giving their names in the process. Whoa, are you Deki's brother? Yuraka stared at Izuku's near double. Izuku spluttered. Be brother. Makumo frowned. You mean Izuku, right? Yuraka bobbed her head. T then, no. Really, the resemblance is quite uncanny. Ada examined the dark-haired boy. Makumo sighed. The invisible girl from your class said the same thing. You mean Hagakure? Offered Ida. Mikumo nodded. Here, both Izuku and Mikumo jumped, turning their heads to see the invisible girl, in her UA. Uniform, sat on Izuku's right. Izuku started. H have you been here the whole time? Yeah. Hagakure gave some sort of hand gesture, the sleeve of her jacket rising. How did I miss that? Izuku sighed. Yeyarazu gave a small giggle. You were staring at that rice for an awfully long time. I was. Hiroraka. Ida and Yeyarazu all made motions or words of confirmation. Izuku sighed. He really hadn't been paying attention. How W was your morning? Mikumo looked to Izuku. Weird. Izuku scratched his chin awkwardly. I was voted class representative. Well done. Anything interesting happen with you? Mikumo lit up. Why yeah. Hatsum and I finished the armor. Power Loader said if we get it safety checked this afternoon we can trial it with some rescue simulation. Yeyarazu spoke up. I'm impressed you managed to build it so fast. You were still designing it yesterday. Hatsum, she's a demon. When she gets going, she just doesn't stop. I, it's kinda scary. Mikumo paled slightly at the thought. But at least we weren't stuck on costume repair like one Fahrenheit. Silence fell before a new conversation started up, allowing Mikumo to move into the background, idling watching Hagakira as she ate. Something in the back of Mikumo's mind told him there was something he wasn't seeing. Your food. Mikumo exclaimed, making half the table jump in surprise at his sudden outburst. Hagakure blushed invisibly. My food. Yeah. Mikumo's normal nervousness blotted out as his brain fired on all cylinders. Your food, as soon as you put it in your mouth, it's invisible just like the rest of you. The rest of the table watched the interaction with interest. Mikumo reached down, rooting through his tool belt until he found a pencil, holding it out to Hagakure. Here, put this in your hair. Hagakure slowly reached out for the pencil, taken aback by Mikumo's unusual and sudden request. Okay. Hagakure slipped the pencil inside her ponytail, a section of it vanishing as she did. Mikumo beamed. This means that Hagakure's quirk is definitely a mutant class, or maybe transformation, but definitely not emitter. Her body must produce some sort of substance that renders her invisible. It's possible it could be extracted as a coating. There's two of them. Mikumo was broken from his theorizing by Yuraka's shout. W what? Hagakure laughed. You mutter just like Midoriya, it's uncanny, we're doomed. Mikumo frowned. How does that mean we're? Doomed, I say. Doomed. The table, bar Ida, burst into laughter at Hagakure's exclamation. Mikumo went to recoil, before he realized something. They weren't laughing at him, they were laughing with him, even Izuku was joining in. Mikumo smiled, a warm feeling in his chest. The laughter went on for another five minutes. Every time it slowed down Hakakur would proclaim their doom once again. In the end even Ida managed to crack a smile. Yuraka was hit the worst, laughing and crying uncontrollably. Eventually they calmed down, with Yuraka continuing to giggle every few seconds as they went back to their food and conversation. Mikumo felt Hagakir's attention on him. So, what's with your interest in my quirk? Glancing over to the others, Mikumo saw them in a deep conversation about the tensile strength of a scarf, bizarrely enough. Hagakir spoke again. You're not interested in it for those reasons, are you? Mikumo looked puzzled. The amount of pigs I get asking if I'll show them what it's like for someone invisible to do that sort of stuff to them, you know what I mean. Hagakir made a gesture with her hand. Despite it being invisible, Mikumo immediately caught on to exactly what she meant. Mikumo's cheek lit a flame as he waved his hands in denial. And no, nothing like that at all. Okay, Hagakure replied in a sing-song voice. No, I it's just that we had to analyze costume specifications in class this morning. Mikumo paused, the inability to see body language or expression throwing him off. Oh one of the ones I got was yours and it just seemed really impractical. I am mean. Any ice villain you would face would be a serious threat. You've got no physical protection and to use your quirk fully you have to remove what little costume you do have. Mikumo got more confident as he went on, falling into analysis mode. What do you suggest then? Hagakure shrugged. Um, since your quirk is likely mutant class I could. Mikumo looked around for something to write on, before seeing Hagakure's empty tray. I'd be able to explain it better at the workshop. If that's okay for you, that is. Hagakure hummed, clearly thinking it through. Sure, why not, I've got time. Mikumo smiled and nodded. Standing, the two of them left the table, carrying their trays with them. Well, they seemed to be getting on like a house on fire. Yuraka looked to where Mikumo and Hagakure were leaving the lunch hall. Izuku nodded, making a noise of agreement. Ada looked back and forth between Yuraka and Izuku. 
A house on fire. What about Mr. Aizawa's scarf? Hiroraka giggled. Ada, that was just a cover conversation so we could listen in on what Hagakira and Akatani were saying. Izuku nearly yelped in surprise, forcing himself not to react, finally making the connection that had been staring him in the face. Akatani, the same name that American man had called his dad in that weird dream. Oh, shit. Iraraka and Hagakir were right. Makuma was his brother. Ada chopped the air. Iraraka, that is very rude behavior, unfitting for heroes in training such as ourselves. Iraraka giggled. Ada, it's fine. It most certainly is not. Ada's voice conveyed his horror. Vice class representative, surely you were not eavesdropping as well. Yeyarazu smiled. Ada was aghast. Class representative, Midoriya, jerked from his thoughts by his name. Izuku mentally caught up to the conversation, looking to Ada. Izuku shrugged guilty. I'm sorry, Ada. Ada began to chop the air with both arms at the same time, making Yuraka dissolve into fits of laughter. Deku, Izuku froze. Oi, Deku. Turning his head, Izuku was shocked to see Bakugo looking, nervous, since when did Katsuki Bakugo show any emotion other than rage? Can we talk? Izuku hesitated, before nodding his head, slipping away while Ida's outrage continued. Yeyarazu watched the two boys leave, the sudden change in the tone of their interactions leaving her surprised. Snip. Hagakir lowered a lock of her invisible hair into Makumo's open palm. Whoa. Makumo exclaimed as the hair turned visible as soon as it stopped touching Hagakir's skin. Makumo examined the hair. Does it turn invisible again if you touch it? Yup, that's great. That way if I extract the substance it can use it to coat something more durable. Plus it would be visible when Hagakir isn't touching it. Makumo placed the hair into a sample tray, inserting it into a machine on his workstation. Tapping away on his laptop, Makumo began an analysis of Hagakir's hair. While he waited for it to carry out that task, Makumo accessed the 3D scan taken for Hagakir's costume. I won't have enough here to do a full suit. Makumo selected a generic sports bra and shorts. An aluminium steel alloy would allow the flexibility and strength needed, as a mesh weave, Kevlar padding on the inside for protection. Completing the initial design, Makumo glanced over his shoulder. What do you think, Hagakure? She was gone. Makumo frowned, moving over to where she'd stood, looking around. Spotting something, Makumo crouched down, finding Hagakure's uniform hidden under a workstation. Without his keen eye he would never have spotted it. A faint footstep reached Makumo's ears, the slap of a bare foot. Hagakure, standing, Makumo set off, tailing Hagakure's, using the faint sound of her footsteps to track her. Bakugo watched as Izuku squirmed. The two of them stood in the corridor outside the lunch hall. Finally losing his patience, Izuku spoke. W what is it you want, Bakugo? Bakugo didn't reply, gritting his teeth. If you're just going to waste my time I'm not going to. I'm fucking sorry, okay. Bakugo's sudden bark caught Izuku off guard. W what? Bakugo growled, balling his fists. I went too far yesterday. Izuku sighed, surprising Bakugo. For yesterday. Really? Yeah, what off it? Izuku just stared at him. Yesterday was nothing. I don't even care about yesterday, because that time I could fight back. But what about all the times I couldn't? When you punched me a couple of weeks ago, or all those times you and your cronies attacked me, did you go too far then as well? Bakugo stayed silent. Are you sorry for those? Are you sorry for the time you cracked my tooth, sprained my wrist? Are you... His argument with All Might. The fact his father was a supervillain and also dead. That Makumo was probably his brother. Izuku just couldn't handle it anymore. Bakugo grunted. TCH, whatever. Shut up. Izuku's shout silenced Bakugo. Izuku's rage ebbed away, thinking of Bakugo's defense of Makumo on the train. Bakugo, all I ever wanted to be was your friend, but instead you tormented me, and I don't even know why. Pausing, Izuku looked Bakugo directly in the eye. If you want to apologize, then you're about 10 years too late for that. Don't fucking walk away from me, Deku. Bakugo broke into a sprint, chasing after Izuku. Alarms suddenly blared. Within seconds both Izuku and Bakugo were swallowed by a stampede fleeing the lunch hall. Makumo ignored the alarms, following Hagakir's footsteps, making sure to stay out of sight as he did. Peeking around the corner of a corridor, Makumo caught sight of a door opening and closing by itself. Slowly moving to the door to the classroom one over, Makumo slipped inside the empty room and made for the window. Pushing it open, Makumo looked out to see the main gates to Yue. Open, reporters flooding in. You can do this, you've snuck out of the home plenty of times before. Makumo glanced down. Maybe not from this height though. Stealing himself, Makumo climbed out, standing on a ledge as he shuffled over to the window of the classroom Hagakure had entered. Good work, Hagakure. 
Makumo peeked through the open window, careful to stay out of sight. Hagakir was holding a folder, in front of her was a pale, blue-haired man, his voice monotone. I'm sure you parents will be glad to hear you made the right choice. The pale man scratched his neck, his dry skin flaking. For their sakes, drawing a pen. Holding it with four digits, the pale man added the last. The pen crumbled to dust. And yours as well. Mikumo's eyes widened in horror. Hagakir whimpered in fear. Mikumo watched in horror as the pale man brushed his hand on his coat, the dust drifting to the floor, still looking supremely bored. The folder. Hagakir shakily held it out, the pale man gripping it with one finger lifted away. Good girl. The pale man slipped the folder into his coat. Hagakir spoke. Why yes, Mr. Shigaraki. Oh, and by the way, good job on picking the room to meet. Managed to avoid running into any of the ants on my way. Staring at the pale man, Hagakir clearly wasn't sure what to say. The pale man shrugged. Kirajiri is always saying I should be more supportive of my allies or whatever. Anyways, NPC, run along and do your next task. Hagakir nodded, her posture and expression showing she was uncomfortable. The pale man sighed. What are you waiting for? A quest reward. Go. With that, Hagakir fled, heading in the opposite direction to the workshop. The pale man scratched his neck again, almost drawing blood. Makumo resisted the urge to jump in and attack the pale man. Instead he waited until the classroom was empty. Once the pale man had left with the folder, slipping inside the window, Makumo collapsed onto all fours, his breathing fast and shallow. That man was threatening Hagakir and her parents, using her to get whatever was in that folder. Makumo's fists tightened. He couldn't even go to the teachers. The pale man had made it clear he would kill Hagakir and her parents if things didn't go his way. Makumo couldn't put them at risk. You wanted to be a hero, didn't you? Mikumo cried out, yelling at himself. Save her, save them all, even without a quirk. Mikumo slammed his fists down on the floor, resolute. I'll be shatterproof. Izuku struggled through the crowd, as it crushed him from every side, keeping his eyes focused on Bakugo. Izuku pushed his way towards the blonde boy inch by inch. If he could just reach Bakugo, he could use slingshot to get them both above the crowd. Izuku felt a sudden tug, as one of his gloves was pulled from his hand. No, no, this couldn't be happening. The first three quirks came quickly, filling up his quirk space to the maximum. Then, Izuku got his answer on what happened to his quirk space once he passed his quirk limit. Izuku's eleventh quirk burnt like fire in his veins, green sparks flickering around his body. Three more quirks came, sending the pain to the stratosphere. His knees gave way. Izuku dropped to the floor, the stampede swallowing him. He felt a foot crush his hand, a sickening crunch telling him what had happened. Nearby, Bakugo pushed a student out the way. He couldn't use his quirk in a situation like this, even he knew the collateral damage would be too high. Yet Bakugo forced himself onwards, towards Izuku's fallen form. Red flashed through Bakugo's view. Oi, Metapod, Kirishima, currently using his quirk to stand his ground. Kaminari next to him looked to Bakugo. Bakugo, Deku, what? Kirishima couldn't hear him over the shouts of the crowd. Bakugo gritted his teeth, pointing to Izuku. Midoriya's getting tramped, use you shitty quirk. Kirishima nodded, pushing another student out the way. On it, pushing sideways through the crowd, Kirishima made his way to Izuku, before hardening his back, dropping down and using his body as a shield. Bakugo growled, hang on, you damn nerd. Oh, stop shoving, you dolt. Don't call me that. Fight me, I literally can't. Stop pushing you too, I'm gonna fall. Tenya found himself slammed against the window, next to Yeyurazu, in another hallway leading away from the lunchroom. Seeing her opportunity, Yeyurazu grabbed the window frame, pulling herself onto the windowsill, out of the crush. Ada, look. Yeyurazu pointed out the window. Tenya followed Yeyurazu's finger, watching as reporters flooded the grounds, hounding anyone they found. We want all might. Just one quote, we'll leave then. Showed aside, resisting the urge to gag that particular reporter, the same one who'd insulted him earlier, with his scarf. No, if we give you one quote you'll just ask for another. No we won't. As Ashi leaned across to Shota, whispering into his ear. These reporters are technically trespassing. You could even say they were villains, you know. Shota shook his head. Then they'd just write a load of garbage to get back at us. Let's just wait for the police, unless they get violent. As Ashi smiled. Always the voice of reason, aren't cha? With you around, definitely. You wound me. Good. It's just reporters. Please, everyone calm down. Yeyurazu sighed. Her voice was lost to the roar of the crowd. She needed someone with the voice of a foghorn. Ida, it has to be you. Tenya turned his head to look at Yeyurazu. Me. Yeyurazu nodded. Absolutely. Tenya nodded, feeling the weight of the great responsibility the vice class representative had placed on his shoulders. What would my brother do? What would Midoriya do? Ida. Yuraka was struggling to push her way through to him. Yuraka, I have a plan. Huh? Tenya edged his way through the crowd, reaching out to Yuraka. Yuraka, please make me float. 
Uraraka's eyes widened, realizing what Tenya planned to do. Right, Tenya and Uraraka surged forwards, towards each other, their fingertips just brushing. There, Tenya floated into the air, above the panicking masses. I need somewhere I can easily be seen. The sign, using his engines, Tenya pushed himself at the emergency exit sign, flipping wildly before painfully slamming into the wall. Everyone, everything is fine. Chopping the air with his arm, Tenya saw he had the crowd's attention. This is just the press. This is UA. We are supposed to be the representatives of this great institution. Act like it. There's nothing to panic about. A wave of murmurs passed through the crowd, back into the lunch hall, slowly calming the masses. Tenya pushed his glasses back up the bridge of his nose. Also, could someone please help me down? Iraq, emergency exit Ida. Thank you, Ashido, but I would really appreciate a ladder. Izuku opened his eyes, finding himself standing in his quirk space, one for all glowing with green and blue light, while threatening red lightning surged all around him. Young Izuku. Turning, Izuku saw a woman, wearing a dark navy, almost black, bodysuit and a red cape. Her hair reminded him of his mother's. It was like seeing someone you could only half remember. W who are you? What are you? The woman smiled, filling Izuku with the same warmth that All Might's did. I am a vestige, the consciousness of a previous holder of one for all, contained within the quirk itself. For now, you can call me Seven. Seven, that's not your real name, is it? No, it isn't. Seven paused. But circumstances require it. They also require another thing. Do not tell Toshi about this. Toshi, it's short for Tashinori. You call him All Might. Seven beamed. He was my student. Izuku was taken aback. You're All Might's mentor. Why wouldn't you want him to know about this? Seven sighed. A day is coming, where a powerful villain will attack Toshi and his mind. If he knows of us vestiges, then so will that evil man. What about me? Won't he take it from me then? He will not harm you, not seriously. After all, you are his greatest creation. At all for one, Seven nodded. He's still alive. Barely, he's just existing. All he wants to do is hurt Toshi. Seven looked at Izuku. He wants to kill the man who nearly defeated him. None of us before Toshi managed to come as close as he did. So all for one hates him for that. He reminded him of his mortality. Izuku paled, feeling the weight of one for all growing heavier. And I'm guessing I can't tell All Might he's alive either. Yes, I'm sorry to burden you with this. Seven pulled Izuku into a surprisingly strong hug. All I wanted was to see you smile. Izuku sniffed, wiping away tears. No, I'll beat him, I'll save All Might. Seven broke away. I know you will, but first, you need to fix this mess. Izuku looked to Quirksmith, watching as red lightning shot from it. W what's happening? Seven placed a hand on Izuku's shoulder. I went through this too, as did all holders who possessed a quirk of their own. Are you aware of what a quirk awakening is? It's when a person's feelings and desires reach a point where their quirk suddenly adapts or evolves to aid them. Izuku nodded. For a holder of one for all this puts strain on the quirk, forcing it to increase in power at an abnormally fast rate. Normally, most people only ever undergo one or two awakenings. Seven looked to Quirksmith. However, when your quirk exceeds the number of quirks it can hold, it has the same effect as an awakening. So, the more quirks I copy, the faster one for all increases with power. Seven nodded. You must be cautious, if you continue to tax your quirk like this, one for all will become too much for your body to handle. Izuku shuddered as he remembered All Might's explanation of what would happen if he'd given him one for all before his body was ready for its power. What do I do? How do I stop it? Seven looked at Izuku. That is your journey alone. We will speak again soon. With that, Seven vanished. Izuku cried out as the pain he'd been feeling before he lost consciousness returned. Dropping to his knees, Izuku squeezed his eyes shut, trying to block out the pain as it reached a fever pitch. Izuku opened his eyes. Whatcha doing down there, Izuchin? Four-year-old Katsuki Bakugo hung upside down from the monkey bars by his knees. Izuku wiped the tears from his eyes. I I fell, Kakin. Katsuki dropped to the ground, holding his hand out to Izuku. You shouldn't cry so much, you can't when we're both heroes. Allowing himself to be pulled up, Izuku hung his head. My quirk hasn't shown up yet like yours has. Katsuki lit sparks in his palms, little more than a light show. So which one of your parents do a thing you'll get? Your dad's would be pretty cool. You could roast every villain in your path. Izuku shook his head. No, I want my mom's quirk. That way I can rescue everyone, like All Might. Katsuki pounded a fist into his opposite palm. Yeah, and I'll beat up the villains while you do that. We'll be an unstoppable hero team. Izuku nodded vigorously. Why yeah, what's your name going to be? Ground Zero. So cool. Katsuki grinned at the praise. What about you, Izuchin? Izuku paused, thinking hard. He didn't want to say anything Katsuki was dumb, like Mighty Boy or All Might JR. I've got it. I'll be Detroit. Katsuki laughed. You're such an All Might fanboy. So are you. Izuku shot back. I'm a fan. You're a nerd. Nerd? Questioned Izuku, tilting his head. Yeah, it means someone who knows loads about something. 
Katsuki explained. Then I'm happy to be an All Might nerd. Izuku beamed. We're gonna be great heroes. Of course we are. Ground Zero in Detroit will be unstoppable. Still inside his quirk space, Izuku dropped to his knees, crying away. He'd forgotten that day, the day before his mom had taken him to that doctor. The day before Izuku Midoriya was declared quirkless, useless, worth less than everyone else around him. His and Bakugo's friendship hadn't suffered at first. The blonde boy had just declared that Izuku would be his psychic, that he could use his quirk analysis to help him fight the villains. Those words were the first time Izuku felt like being quirkless wasn't the end of his dream. But those days came to an end, slowly at first. Bakugo grew distant, but not cruel at least. The final straw wasn't until Izuku's seventh birthday party. They had been playing catch the villain, but Bakugo had taken it too far. His equally emotionally explosive mom had taken him aside and said something to him, no doubt reprimanding him. After that, Bakugo had gone out of his way to avoid Izuku. He stopped coming over and when Izuku tried going over to his house, the blonde boy did his best to ignore him. It didn't help that after that Bakugo stopped defending him from his classmates. He just sat and watched as they told him he couldn't be a hero. As they told him he was weak, useless, Deku, it hurt, but even then things hadn't reached their eventual low. That started in their first year of middle school, when Tsubasa had gone missing. The winged boy had been the closest thing to an actual friend that Bakugo had had, the only one who could calm him down. Tsubasa had been one of the crueler ones after Izuku's diagnosis as quirkless. In fact, he had been the one to tell the entire class, his grandfather being the doctor who saw Izuku. But he didn't resent him, how could he? Around the same time Tsubasa's father suddenly left, marks began appearing on the winged boy's arms, followed by his usual vest swapping for long-sleeved t-shirts. Everyone had noticed, nobody had said anything. Not the other kids and not the teachers. After all, Tsubasa's mother had been the head of the school board at the time. And his grandfather, the one who had told Izuku he was quirkless, was a well-respected doctor, pioneering quirk research. Once Tsubasa vanished, no one was around to hold Bakugo back, no one that Bakugo would listen to. The final straw was in Izuku's second year. Bakugo had gone after a sand villain on the way home from school one day, in the hopes of getting a recommendation for Yue. From it, Izuku had followed, deducing the true nature of the villain's quirk, before the pro-hero, Airjet, had swooped in to save the day. Something Izuku had done that day had made Bakugo angry and his anger had landed directly on Izuku. It started with Bakugo telling him to give up on his dream of being a hero, telling him he was worthless without a quirk, just like the rest of his classmates had done for almost a decade. Then the fights had started. At first the green-haired boy had tried to defend himself, and every time Izuku was the only one who got punished, Bakugo just walked away scot-free. The boy with the perfect quirk, the boy with the free pass. Izuku felt the anger bubble up again, remembering Bakugo's non-apology. The pain only got worse. That's what's fueling it. My anger. Izuku slammed his fists down on the non-existent floor of his quirk space. What if I want to be angry? I want to hate Bakugo. He made my life miserable for years, and he thinks he can just apologize for the battle trial and everything will be okay. Tears dropped from Izuku's face. Why? Why did no one stop him? Izuku sobbed. Was I just a good test dummy to see the growth of his quirk? Izuku saw them all. The teachers who punished Izuku when he spoke up. The guidance counselor that claimed he had made it all up for attention. Izuku wanted to hate Bakugo with all his heart, truly and completely, but he couldn't. As soon as it had come, Izuku's anger faded. He couldn't hate Bakugo as much as he tried. How else was Bakugo going to turn out when the people whose job it was to show him how he was supposed to act behaved like that? Encouraging children to bully another just because they didn't have a quirk. Plunging his fists, Izuku reached a resolution. Katsuki Bakugo, I forgive you. From now on, I'll judge you by your present, not your past. The pain receded, the red lightning dying out. Izuku stumbled to his feet, reaching out to touch one for all. It's stronger. One for all. 105%. Much more, and it will be too much for my body to handle. Izuku collapsed. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Izuku groaned, feeling a hand repeatedly slap his cheek. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Izuku caught Bakugo's wrist, stopping him. Finally, you fucking nerd. Before Izuku could realize what was going on he felt himself being pulled up. Call Kakin. Bakugo grunted. Who else, nerd? Opening his eyes, Izuku saw he was stumbling along towards recovery girl's office, Bakugo supporting him. W.Y. You hate me. Izuku's throat felt like it was on fire, his voice croaky. I believe you. Bakugo paused. If this is what your shitty quirk does to you, I can see why you fucking hit it. Izuku gave a weak smile. Thank you, Kakin. No, I mean Katsuki. I mean if you want me to call you that. Call me whatever you want, nerd. Bakugo was apologizing, in his own weird way, not the forced attempt from earlier. This time, he meant it. 
Together, the two boys hobbled down the corridor, Bakugo yelling every time Izuku nearly tripped him up. I am sorry, Keikatsuki. Are you trying to cripple me? No, when did you get so fucking heavy? Izuku squeaked. Kirishima watched the two go, grinning. I guess Bakugo isn't all that bad after all. Izuku listened carefully as Katsuki explained what had happened. The green-haired boy mentally translating his profanity-laden diatribe into normal, human speech. Kaken, I'm sorry I gave up on you. Mikumo stepped back into the workshop, his feet moving on autopilot towards his station. Hagakir's clothes were gone. Dropping into his seat, Mikumo stared at the costume design he had created for the invisible girl. A pop-up in the bottom corner of the screen announced that the invisibility substance had been extracted successfully. What do I do? Mikumo dropped his head into his hands. Mikumo, you can be a hero. Midoriya's words rang in his ears. Could he? Mikumo certainly didn't feel like a hero. No, I can't think like that. I have to be strong. Mikumo's fist slammed down on his bench, the sound echoing through the empty workshop. Finding his resolve, Mikumo closed the notification, returning to the costume design. Editing Metal Weave Mikumo added a second layer underneath, made from a titanium steel alloy, as opposed to the outer layer's aluminium steel alloy. While it would be heavier than the outer layer, the titanium steel alloy would be more durable, capable of stopping even bullets. But it won't be anywhere near as flexible. Mikumo stared at the screen. Unless, expanding the design, Mikumo altered the titanium steel layer to be a series of interlocking pieces, capable of sliding over each other. There, it will be a bit more restrictive than just one layer, but far more protective. Adding the invisibility solution to the design simulation, coating each strand of the aluminium steel and titanium steel layers with it, Mikumo saw he had some left spare. Enough for a weapon. It couldn't be anything large, but it would at least give Hagakure some offensive capability. Pulling up the gauntlet design that he had used for the entrance exam, Mikumo removed the arm section and grapple, leaving only the hand and wrist armor. Enlarging the size of the wrist armor, Mikumo shifted the miniaturized power source, normally stored in the arm, inside the wrist. Next he added eight small repulsors, altered to emit UV light, and a ring around the wrist cuff, angled back away from the hand. That will enhance Hagakure's punches. Mikumo turned his attention to the palm, adding a larger UV repulsor, this time as a weapon. Double-checking the design, Mikumo stared at it. Mikumo clenched his fists. I will save you. Hitting a button, a machine of the back wall sprang into life, coating a strand of titanium steel alloy in the invisibility solution. Hagakir watched as Mikumo busied himself creating the costume, his long, curly hair tied back out of his eyes. I'm sorry, Mikumo, but you can't save me. I'm already too far gone. Izuku laid in the bed as Recovery Girl explained his injuries to All Might in his true form. She had been less than pleased to see Izuku when he'd turned up with Bakugo, before sending the unharmed boy away. At least when he told her what had happened she hadn't complained about Izuku having to see her again. Well, not too much. I've healed the cracked rib and his broken fingers. Recovery girl paused, looking at All Might. But he'll have to recover overnight from the strain the quirk overload put on his body, so no quirk usage for at least 12 hours. Izuku sighed. Recovery girl rounded on the team, tapping his knee with her cane. You hear, 12 hours, 24 if you can manage it. Izuku nodded, not bothering to speak. He couldn't tell them the truth anyway. It made Izuku feel even worse that on his first day as class president he'd ended up useless while Ida and Yeirazu had been forced to pick up his slack. If only his glove hadn't come off. But at least it made Izuku's decision easier. Izuku would quit as class president and make Yeirazu as his replacement, with Ida as the VP. The engine boy had already shown he could do the job. Whatever pessimistic thoughts you're having, stop it. Izuku looked up at Recovery Girl. What? Recovery Girl sighed. What happened today wasn't your fault. Izuku started. Of course it was, I should. All Might interrupted him. Could you have seen that it was only the press? Izuku looked down. No, I was on the wrong side of the building. All Might placed a hand on Izuku's shoulder. It's tough, but as a hero you can't be everywhere at once, no matter as much as you want to be. Izuku wiped the tears from his eyes. I just felt so useless. I know. But this a burden of a hero, knowing you could have helped, if only you'd been in the right place. It never gets any easier. But we all feel it. T thanks. Izuku gave All Might a weak smile. I think. All Might smiled, before ruffling Izuku's hair. You're very welcome. Izuku leaned into the gesture, reminding All Might of a cat. A big, very green cat. All Might moved his hand back to Izuku's shoulder. I want to apologize for last night. You were right. Izuku hesitated, wondering if he should tell All Might that All for One was still alive, before remembering Seven's words. All for One is my father. All Might was taken aback at Izuku's acceptance of the notion, after his vehement denial the night before. And I'm not the only son he had. Izuku looked to All Might. Mikumo Akatani. He's a quirkless support student, he never knew his parents, and he looks just like me. It isn't hard to figure it out. All Might nodded. I see. 
He remembered the boy from the entrance exam. He'd almost managed to make it into the hero course with his inventions, falling short by only a few points. Tashinori had noticed the resemblance then but brushed it off a cousin or another relative. But after Izuku's natural quirk had been discovered, All Might had realized then the likely connection between the dark-haired boy and his greatest foe. No doubt All for One had discarded him for being quirkless, instead focusing his efforts on Izuku. Not that he would tell the green-haired boy that, it would only make him feel guilty. Breaking himself from his thoughts, All Might looked to Izuku. So, what quirks did you copy? Anything interesting? Izuku's eyes shined at the thought of discussing quirks with his idol. The green-haired boy nodded, realizing that Recovery Girl had left at some point. I copied eight quirks, origami, seed breath, variable mist, weld, speed, wave motion, rock fist and then hardening from Kirishima when he protected me. I haven't had a chance to test any of them since, you know. Recovery Girl would beat you up with that cane of hers, pretty much. So what do they do? All Might's interest was piqued. Er, well you already know about hardening, you've seen Kirishima use it. Speed is a passive boost to my running speed and reactions. It's not a very large boost though. Seed breath will allow me to fire seeds from my mouth that grow vines where they hit. Variable mist means I can emit mist made from various compounds from my mouth. But I need to know the chemical formula for it to work. All Might tapped his chin with his finger. That speed quirk, though minor, will be helpful, while the seed and mist ones will be great for capturing villains. Izuku nodded. Right. Wave motion allows for the conversion of vitality into energy that can be discharged as blast waves from the hands, kinda like Bakugo's quirk. Origami sounds really weird. It allows the holder to turn their hands into origami, but I'm not really sure how that works. Neither am I All Might chuckled at the teen's confusion. The last two. Weld's really interesting. It can merge both inorganic and organic materials on an atomic level, so long as I'm touching them both. The only quirk I can't use is Rock Fist, since it's mutant class. All Might continued to think over the quirks Izuku had explained to him. Izuku spoke. The first three filled up the remaining quirk space inside Quirksmith. All Might didn't flinch, his eyes focused directly on Izuku. But the next five made something weird happen, I'll show you. All Might frowned. Show me. Izuku placed a hand on All Might's arm. All Might blinked, finding himself in what could only be Izuku's quirk space, in his muscle form. Looking around, the number one hero took in the sight of a black void filled with quirks of many colors. Tokusei once told me that I was the only person he'd met with a black void as their quirk space. All Might continued to examine his protege's quirk space. Izuku nodded. Mine was a white void until you gave me one for all. That must be why. All Might nodded. It must. So, what did you want to show me? Izuku pointed. This, stepping closer to the center, Izuku indicated a large, green quirk. That's one for all. But that isn't the interesting part, this is. Izuku pointed to a red quirk next to one for all. Within it were ten individual quirks. Four more quirks resided outside the red quirk, each connected back to it by a strand of white light. The red quirk is quirksmith. Before the quirk I copied today they were contained within it. That's how I determined what my limit was. Ten, yeah. But the first three quirks filled it up. When the other five quirks joined them, Quirksmith was overstretched. That put the strain on my body. Until Quirksmith cracked, like an egg, and five quirks leaked out into the outer quirk space where one for all and Quirksmith are. Five, one, two, three, four. All Might paused. Where's the fifth? The quirks that leaked out were the five oldest quirks I have. Slingshot. Since it's merged from zero gravity and attraction, as well as heal, a denatured version of attraction, quirk space and explosion. All Might nodded along, only vaguely understanding what his successor was staying. Denatured. Oh, that's what happens when I try to alter a quirk too much, it just kind of falls apart into junk data. The denatured attraction just dispersed and joined the rest of the junk data in the void when it leaked out. All Might looked pensive, so you can alter one for all. Izuku shook his head. No, I can't alter compound quirks like one for all or slingshot, I might be able to denature them. All Might's eyes widened in alarm. Izuku panicked. E but I'm d-definitely not going to try that, of course. Thank goodness. All Might released a sigh of relief. Izuku smiled, before it suddenly faded. There's something else I need to tell you. Go ahead. One for all has gotten stronger. When Quirksmith was overtaxed, it strained that quirk, and made it stronger. Izuku looked to All Might, before they both returned to the physical world. All Might took stock of his surroundings, before speaking. My master told me that quirk strain would make one for all's stockpile grow rapidly, but I never paid it much mind since I was. He stopped, realizing what he'd been about to say. Izuku tilted his head in confusion. All Might made a decision. I never paid it much mind since I wasn't born with a quirk. You were quirkless. S-H-H-H. Izuku's cheeks flushed. S-sorry. It's fine. Yes, before my master passed one for all onto me, I was quirkless. Is that why one for all doesn't hurt you when you use it? Because you didn't have a quirk. All Might shook his head. 
No, but one for all was much weaker then. Since I was the first truly quirkless holder of the power, I relied on it fully, while my predecessors used their own quirks as well. Since I received it, one for all's strength has roughly doubled. Whoa, Izuku looked at his hero, admiration shining in his eyes. All Might coughed nervously. Well, I have used it an awful lot, but considering your training both before and after receiving one for all, your body could withstand 115% without your limbs, well, exploding off my body. Izuku offered. All Might nodded, before placing a hand on Izuku's shoulder, seeing the teen stifle a yawn. For now, let's not worry about one for all and all that. Just get some rest. You've been excused from your afternoon classes. Izuku nodded sleepily, making Ada the new class rep could wait till the next morning. We'll work on your new quirks tomorrow after school, how's that sound? Great, I look f forward to it. Izuku was asleep, the strain from his quirks sending him out like a light. All Might smiled, true and genuine. This kid, this certainly wasn't natural. Nanzu regarded the crumbled remains of the UA. Baryu, Aizawa, Yamada, did you see the moment the reporters entered? Aizawa shook his head while Yamada crossed his arm in the shape of an X. We were on our way to the staff room when we heard the alarms. Aizawa shifted his scarf. Yeah, the reporters were already in by the time we made it here. Yamada added. Nedzu nodded. I see, considering the fact all the cameras facing this spot failed at that same time, we can assume this was planned. Scratching his furry cheek, Nedzu stepped forward. But why they did it is the real question. Aizawa and Yamada looked to Nedzu. The person who instigated this, were they giving us a warning, or did they slip in, with the confusion as their cover? Nedzu looked up. The metal UA sign on the gate had half crumbled away. Or perhaps, both. Calm down, Tamura. Tamura Shigaraki sighed, stopping his pacing and looked to the speaker, behind the bar. The man was tall, his head and hands made of purple mist, dressed in a shirt and waistcoat. Sensei should have responded by now, Kirajiri. Kirajiri placed the glass he was wiping down on the bar. Tamura, you gave him the intel on the UA. Staff schedule and Hagakir's files on her fellow students only an hour ago. Kirajiri gave the pale man a piercing look. Master will analyze it and assign additional resources for tomorrow's operation when and as he sees fit. Tamura wasn't satisfied. He itched to scratch his neck. But he knew Kirajiri would just get upset about it. A screen on the wall flickered into life, showing a man in black, metal mask, covered in pipes. Tamura, a raspy voice came from the speaker. Sensei, Tamura took a seat. I have read the intel. The Hagakure girl did a good job. Not only did she hack the UA database, but apparently she copied the work of a fellow student, someone with a hobby for quirk analysis. Tamira rested an elbow on the bar. But you're not going to tell me what quirks the brats have, are you? Hirajiri shot Tamira a look. The pale man rolled his eyes. Originally, no, I wasn't. The raspy man paused. But the circumstances have changed. This class is strong, stronger than I've seen in a long time. Tamura's interest was piqued. As such, I will grant you additional intel and resources. You will be allotted three of the good doctors Namo, two Alpha series, and the Omega series I have already given you. Tamura smirked. The anti-symbol of peace. Yes, you will also have access to Project Geminati. The raspy man coughed, the others waiting while he recovered. Type 2, Type 3 and Type 11 are at your command. What about the brats? Tamura questioned. Images of three teenage boys appeared on the lower half of the raspy man's screen. These three students pose the majority of the danger in the class. Shoto Todoroki, quirk, half hot half cold, the son of the number two hero, endeavor, he'll be well trained. Katsuki Bakugo, quirk, explosion, he scored the highest in the entrance exam anyone has since All Might took it, with only villain points. And the last one, Kurajiri inquired. Izuku Midoriya, quirk, quirksmith. Tamura frowned. Quirksmith, the raspy man replied. When he physically touches someone he permanently copies their quirk, so long as he hasn't already copied it. He can also manipulate and alter the quirks he copies. Kurajiri and Tamura stayed silent. Outside of All Might, this boy is the most dangerous target you will face tomorrow. The raspy man smiled. Tamura, I want you to recruit him to our side, bring him home. Tamura spoke, and if I can't, kill him. Makumo's body felt like it was moving in slow motion. His hand stretched out, reaching for Hagakure. The pale man laughed, a cold, cruel sound, his fingers wrapping around the invisible girl's face. No, Hagakure. The crumbling girl looked to Makumo, her invisible skin falling away to reveal her very visible muscle. Why didn't you save me? Makumo's arm surged forwards, his hand grasping empty air. Hagakure was dead. The pale man laughed again, turning to look at Makumo. Pathetic. You actually thought a quirkless loser like you could save her. That you could be a hero. Makumo dropped to his knees. I, I failed. The pale man reached out again. This time aiming for Makumo. Akatani. Makumo looked up at the pale man. The pale man gave a sinister smile. Akatani, wake up. Makumo jerked awake, sitting up. 
Looking around, Makumo saw he was on the floor of the development studio. The stool he had been using before he fell asleep was on its side next to him. Finally, I thought I was going to have to go and get present Mike so he could wake you up, Mr. Majima. Mikumo started, before looking up at his workbench. No, I fell asleep. I didn't finish it. Mikumo reached out, desperately trying to pull himself up. Power Loader hooked a hand under Mikumo's arm, helping him to stand. It's fine, kid. Mikumo paled. The half-completed costume for Hagakir was gone. W where is it? Mikumo looked to Power Loader, before his eyes flicked over to where Dusty hung on the wall. Power Loader chuckled. Calm down, Hatsum saw it in the plans when she came in this morning, she finished. In fact, she's running the safety checks, at my insistence, in the testing studio right now. Makumo breathed a sigh of relief, standing his stool up and sitting down on it. I'm so used to doing things by myself it's still weird to think I have a partner to work alongside. Pulling up a stool of his own, Power Loader looked at his student. I take it you were here all night. Makumo nodded, not saying a word. Power Loader sighed. Is there anything you want to tell me? Makumo shook his head. It doesn't have to be me, Akatani. If you'd be more comfortable talking to another teacher, or maybe a student, Hatsum or Midoriya for example, then it can be arranged. Mikumo looked up. I'm fine. Power Loader placed one of his large hands on the teen's shoulder. We both know that isn't true. Mikumo clasped his hands together. I could tell him, couldn't I? About that man, what he's making Hagakure do. Mr. Majima would help, right? Mikumo gave a small nod, looking Power Loader directly in the eyes. There is something I need to tell you, it's about. I quote him finished. Hatsum burst into the development studio, wheeling a mannequin in front of herself, the costume for Hagakir displayed on it. Power Loader sighed. Damn, Hatsum. Could you have picked a worse time to burst in? Makumo jumped to his feet, taking in the sight of Hagakir's completed costume. Thank you for finishing it, Hatsum. Makumo bowed to the pink-haired girl. Hatsum gave a smug smile. I know, I'm just that great. Besides, what are partners for? Despite the stress he felt crushing down on his chest, Makumo returned Hatsum's smile. Power Loader patted Makumo's shoulder. You still have an hour before homeroom starts. How about you go and get some breakfast from the food hall? Maybe a shower too. Makumo nodded, still smiling. Don't worry, Mr. Majima, I'll tell you soon. I trust you. Oi, nerd. Izuku sighed, stopping his progress towards the class 1 a homeroom, turning to face Bekugo. Izuku watched as his former friend slouched up to him. The green-haired boy had hoped that after yesterday things were going to be at least a little better between them. Bakugo looked directly at Izuku. Those stupid quirks you got yesterday. You'd better fucking learn how to use them for the sport festival. Izuku frowned. Was Kakin, acknowledging him. If I'm going to surpass All Might as the number one hero, I need a strong-ass rival to fight along the way. Bakugo paused. I'd rather it was you than Daddy Issues. Daddy Issues? Questioned Izuku. The half-and-half -half bastard. Bakugo saw no recognition in Izuku's eyes. You know, Captain Canada, Candy Cane, where's Wally, Icy Hot? You mean Todoroki? Bakugo grunted in affirmation. How could you possibly know he has daddy issues? Bakugo shrugged. He's the son of Endeavor who never uses his fire powers. What else is it going to be? Izuku smiled. You know, sometimes all your yelling and shouting makes me forget just how perceptive you are. Bakugo exploded. What do you mean yelling and shouting, you fucking nerd? Izuku slowly raised his eyebrows. Bakugo shrugged, realizing Izuku's point. TCH, whatever, just make sure you're nice and strong, so I look all that more impressive when I beat you. With that, Bakugo pushed past Izuku, stomping down the corridor and towards the classroom. Izuku shook his head slowly, still smiling. Bakugo, neither of us can change our pasts, but we can have a better future. You said that out loud, you fucking nerd. Izuku jumped, before racing off after Bakugo, the two entering the classroom seconds apart. Deki, he lives. Midori, looking good. Izuku beamed, before nodding his head. Thank you. I could never have imagined this. They actually care. Thank you, All Might. Ada walked over to Izuku, his face as serious as ever. Midoriya, I am most glad to see you well. All right, thank you. Izuku rubbed the back of his neck. I am sorry was so useless. Ada interrupted him. Midoriya, we all have our weaknesses. Mine is carbonated drinks. They make my engine stall. Yours are crowds. Izuku sighed. But I think crowds are going to be more of an issue as a pro hero than Soda. Perhaps. Perhaps not. Ada chopped his arm, angling his fingers at Izuku. Suppose someone were to offer you a carbonated drink as thanks for saving them. You could say no. Preposterous. By refusing their generous offer you would be insulting them. Izuku nodded along. If he tried to argue this it could go on all day. As sure, it would have been fine if my glove hadn't gotten snagged and pulled off. Ada looked down to Izuku's hands. Both were covered by gloves, one is normal black, the other sparkly white, covered in sequins. Izuku shrugged awkwardly. It's from an old Halloween costume, it's all I had. Fear not. 
Ada reached into his blazer, producing Izuku's other black glove. Hagakure found it after the incident yesterday. She passed it to me for safekeeping. Izuku accepted the glove, swapping it into the place of the white sequine glove. Thank you, Ada. The engine team nodded. Now, if you'll excuse me I need to inform Takoyami about the proper usage of a desk. Sure. Turning his body slightly, Izuku bowed to the invisible girl. Thank you, Hagakure. Hagakure laughed and struck a pose. You're welcome, Green Akatani. Taken aback by Hagakure's nickname, Izuku barely noticed the tap on his shoulder. Shacho, Izuku turned to see Yeyarazu. Shacho, right, I'm class president, aren't I? Yeyarazu raised an eyebrow. Did you sustain a head injury yesterday? No, I mean, probably. I can't really remember, so maybe. Yeyarazu hit a laugh before handing Izuku a piece of paper. We were supposed to select class officers yesterday, after lunch. However, since you were injured we decided to hold off until this morning. Izuku nodded, reading the list. Yeyarazu spoke again. I enlisted Ida's help to draft a proposed list. We started by picking from those who made it to the second round of voting. HM, Yuraka as treasurer and Ashido as events manager look like good choices. Same for Siro as historian, but discipline officer and sergeant at arms. Yeyarazu made an expression of displeasure. Back Hugo and Minda were the last two who made it to the second round we hadn't found a role for. We were kind of stuck with them. Izuku frowned. Back Hugo should be sergeant at arms, not discipline officer. He may have gone too far in the battle trials but that was a one-off. Normally he's all about safe training. Yeyarazu nodded. I'll take your word for it. You have known him a lot longer, but mind as discipline officer sounds dangerous. He'd probably implement some disgusting rule like skirts have to be 30 centimeters above the knee. I see what you mean, but why didn't you choose Ida? Izuku turned his head to look at Yeyarazu. He's the only one from the second vote that didn't get a position. Ada insisted since he was involved in creating this list, him getting a position would be self-interest. Yeyurazu paused, so Ida is discipline officer and Minda doesn't get a role. Izuku gathered his confidence, seeing his out. No, I'll be the discipline officer. Yeyurazu frowned. You can't be, you're already the class representative. I'm going to nominate you to replace me as class representative and Ida as your vice representative. I'll take the discipline officer role. Izuku paused. You can assign someone else to that role other than me later if you and Ida want. Midoriya, you can't. Yeyarazu placed a hand on the green-haired boy's arm. The class put its trust in you as class president, not me. Izuku shook his head. I can't represent the class's trust if I don't trust myself. Midoriya, I voted for you, Yeyarazu, in both rounds of the vote. Words abandoned Yeyarazu, leaving her in shock. Midoriya, Yeyarazu. The two teens looked round to see Aizawa in the doorway, the rest of the class moving to their seats. Aizawa walked over to his desk. The class president and vice president will now be assigning the class officers, just have it done in five minutes. All right, of course, Mr. Aizawa. Izuku and Yeyarazu moved to the front of the classroom, standing in front of the blackboard. Swallowing his nerves and leaning on the confidence of Bakugo's quirk, Izuku stepped forward. W we'd like to announce the class officers, but before that there's something I wanted to say. Izuku looked at the faces of his classmates, staring back at him. Ada proved yesterday he has what it takes to be a leader, a real leader, not just one given the position. That's why I want to announce, to announce that Ada will be joining myself as a joint vice president. Yeyarazu stepped forward. He will have the responsibilities of both the discipline officer and leadership of the class should Midoriya and I be unavailable, with the backing of the class of course. The class cheered, especially Ashido and the others who had seen Ida's calming of the crowd the day before. Yeah, I'm all for emergency exit Ida. Ida looked taken aback, his mouth moving but no words coming out. Finally finding his voice, Ida stood. I accept. I aim to fulfill the duties of my office to the best of ability. No, even better than that. Yeyarazu nodded, holding the class officer's list out to Ida as he marched up to join them. If you would be so kind, please announce the officers of Class 1A, Ida. Izuku watched on with shock, his head slowly turning to look at a rather smug Yeyarazu. Do you enjoy my suffering? Izuku questioned, quiet enough that only Yeyarazu could hear. You were wrong. The class put their trust in you because you are a natural-born leader under all that nervousness. You showed that in the battle trials. Yeyarazu gently bumped Izuku with her shoulder. Besides, I trust you. Why else would I have voted for you yesterday? Izuku started in shock. You voted for me. Yeyarazu smiled. You just need a bit more confidence, that's all. Izuku returned her smile. Thank you, Yeyarazu. Please, if we're going to be working together like this, call me Momo. Then call me Izuku. Deal. Aizawa sighed and rolled his eyes from his place on the floor, cocooned in his garish yellow sleeping bag. Ida chopped the air. The selections of the class representative and vice class representative are final. But I think Moa would make a perfect fashion officer. 
Ayama struck a pose. The position of fashion officer does not exist. Ida aimed his hand at the blonde boy. Besides, what kind of job would that be? Ayama flicked his hair. I would ensure that everyone's costumes were in the height of fashion, like mine. Ashido laughed. Like you, I saw that red visor of yours. Talk about clashing colors. Clashing colors. Have you seen your costume, mademoiselle? It is made of clashing colors. It's supposed to look like that. He had placed his thumb under his chin, finger bent over, pressed against the front, deep in thought. Perhaps the position of fashion officer is more viable than I first thought. Ashido and Ayama's argument continued to rage on, Kaminari cheering them both on. Enough. Aizawa stood, folding his sleeping bag away. Your five minutes are up. Midoriya, Yeyarazu, Ida, return to your seats. The three teens followed the instruction, Ida bowing to Aizawa as he did. Now, let's get on with today's announcements. Izuku knocked on the door. Come in. Sliding the door open, Izuku stepped into Recovery Girl's office. Recovery Girl. Mr. Aizawa said I was to come here for a checkup during lunch. Yes, yes. Recovery Girl turned her chair to face Izuku. Take a seat. Izuku sat down opposite Recovery Girl. So, how do you feel? Er, okay I guess. I was really tired last night but I've been fine today. Good, good, open up. Recovery Girl placed a thermometer in Izuku's mouth. Quirk exhaustion is a serious deal, even for people with multiple quirks like you. Izuku nodded, unable to speak. HM, a little high, but nothing to really be concerned about. Recovery Girl made a note on her computer before removing the thermometer from Izuku's mouth. Do you know how quirk exhaustion affects people like me? With multiple quirks, Izuku queried nervously. Well, I've not treated many people with multiple quirks like yourself, but from what I've seen each quirk has a separate limit for quirk exhaustion. Recovery Girl paused. However, what you did yesterday was overtax Quirksmith, the parent quirk of all the others you have copied, as well as one for all. It's why I told you not to use any of your quirks overnight. Izuku nodded, taking in Recovery Girl's words, storing them for writing in his notebook later. Recovery Girl stood. However, for now, you have a clean bill of health, just don't end up back here anytime soon. Right, I'll try that. Now run along, do whatever it is you kids do these days. Izuku bowed, thanking the nurse, before leaving. Walking down the corridor, Izuku made his way back to the Wana classroom. The class had been told to meet there at 12.50pm for more hero training, but Aizawa had given them no further details. Slipping into the classroom, Izuku made to his desk with seconds to spare, Kirishima and Kaminari racing in after him. Aizawa stepped through the doorway, moving to his podium as he had during homeroom that morning. Looking out at the class already sitting in their seats, Aizawa nodded. Two seconds, better. The class released a collective sigh of relief. For today's basic hero training there has been a change of plans. Aizawa paused. As I'm sure you are all aware, Yue suffered a security breach yesterday. Murmurs came from the class. Therefore, I will be joining today's basic training. It will be led by All Might and one other. Aizawa raised a hand, silencing the class. Additionally, two students from the support department will be joining us today to test a new piece of equipment they've built. Please enter. Izuku looked to the door as Makumo and a pink-haired girl walked in both dressed in their gym uniforms, the latter wheeling a case almost as long as she was tall. The pink-haired girl's eyes scanned all the students before she spoke. I'm Mei Hatsum. I look forward to testing my babies with you. Mikumo jumped forwards. He was holding a smaller case, with the number 16 stenciled onto the side. She means her inventions. I'm Mikumo Akatani, by the way. The class stared at the support duo before Ashido spoke up. Cool, are you Midori's brother or something? Izuku suppressed the urge to wince. Sato shrugged. Nah, he said his last name is Akatani. Must be Midoriya's cousin or something. Makumo shook his head. W were not related, to the best of my knowledge. The class slowly turned to look at Izuku, who started when he realized he had their full attention. I, I, um, well, Siro spoke up. Mr. Aizawa, what are we doing today exactly? Izuku breathed a sigh of relief. Today we'll be preparing you for disaster situations, from floods to forest fires. Aizawa drew a white card, holding it out to class. Rescue was marked on it in bold, in a green-blue color gradient. It's rescue training. I'll be right at home in a flood, Kiro. Kaminari groaned. Rescue training. Sounds like another hard day. Kirishima banged him on the head. Oi, this what being a hero is all about. I wasn't done. Aizawa didn't raise his voice, but everyone listened. Drawing a remote, Aizawa pressed a button, the costume racks rolling out of the wall. It's up to you whether you wear your costumes. Some of them will be ill-suited to this sort of activity. Aizawa paused. A review of the costumes was held after the battle trials on Monday. Some of you will find your costumes have been altered. Izuku hardened his resolve. Rescue training. This will help me on my way to the great hero I want to be. The great hero I know I can be. 
The training facility is somewhat remote, so we'll be going by bus. Aizawa tucked the remote back into his clothes. That's all, get ready. Meet at side entrance B. With that Aizawa left, the students moved to grab their cases. Huh, mine's not here. Hagakure tilted her head, a blue bow in her see-through hair. H. Hagakure. The invisible girl turned around to see Makumo, holding out the case he'd carried into the classroom. I, well Hatsum and I, finished the costume upgrade. Power loader signed off on it this morning. Hagakure took the case. Cool, thanks, Makumo. The invisible girl bounced up to Makumo, hugging him. The black-haired boy blushed madly. Why are we welcome, Hagakure? Hagakure broke away from Makumo, striking a pose. I'd better go get changed. No peeking. Makumo's cheeks somehow got redder. I w wouldn't, I would and never. Hagakure laughed. I was joking, I'm invisible, remember? Oh, all right. Makumo rubbed the back of his neck. It would be be super gross to do something like Tida anyway. Why you'd have to be depraved to do that? On the other side of the classroom, Minta sneezed. Hagakure giggled. See you at the bus. Makumo nodded, smiling as Hagakure joined the other students, heading for the changing rooms. Izuku and Momo stood a short distance away from the bus, watching as Ida organized the class. Well, he's certainly taking his role very seriously. Momo glanced over at Izuku. Izuku smiled. Ida takes everything seriously. True. Momo paused. I thought your costume was repaired. I saw Bakugo return it to you yesterday, with his usual personality. Izuku self-consciously brushed the shoulder of his gym uniform. Yeah, he did. But it's not strong enough to handle my quirks. Momo nodded. I see. A support company that works with UA is making me a new costume from scratch. But I did buy a new one of these. Izuku tapped his mouth guard. I took your advice. I had a zipper added to my costume. Boo. Quiet. Mind to. And line up. Ada chopped his arm, forcing Siro to duck. Izuku looked away from the rest of the class, back to Momo. I saw, and that you got your shorts. Momo nodded. Black shorts appeared from below her belt, made from the same material as the rest of her costume. White lines running down the outsides of her thighs. I did. Apparently the support company broke costume regulations so the support department made them instead. Izuku bobbed his head, smiling at Momo. Can I ask you a question? You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Momo looked uncertain. It's fine, go ahead. Why do you want to be a hero? Izuku frowned. I guess, all might, really. All might, yeah. The first memory I have of him is a clip from that disaster, the one where he saved over a hundred people. Izuku paused. I've watched that video thousands of times. I still have it saved on my phone. Something about the way he just climbs over that bus, holding all those people, smiling and laughing. I guess, I wanted to help people like that. Momo smiled. I thought so. Izuku's head span around. W what do you mean? You want to be a hero to help people, to save them. Momo looked over at the green-haired boy. No ulterior motive. You're not looking for money or fame, are you? W well, not really, but don't you? Momo sighed. I didn't really get a choice. My family has been heroes almost as long as there have been heroes, or quirks themselves. Todoroki is the same. Look at Bakugo. He wants to be the number one hero just to prove he's the strongest. Oh, I see. I'm sorry if I insulted you. Momo shook her head. Don't worry. You didn't. I guess I just wish I could be more like you. You want to be a hero purely to help others. For me it's more of an obligation, a burden, a legacy to continue. Izuku reached his hand out. Geyarazu, Momo, being a hero. Midoriya, Geyarazu, it's time to get on the bus. Izuku sighed, of all the times for Ada to interrupt. We're coming. Momo adjusted her costume, readying herself. Well, we'd better get going. All right. Izuku and Momo took their places in Ada's perfectly organized queue as the bus doors opened, Aizawa leaning out of them. It's time to go. Everybody file in, remain in numerical order. Ada indicated for the class to enter the bus. Ada sagged his seat, his head in his hands. All that, just for nothing. How was I to know it would be this kind of bus? Ashido patted the navy-haired boy on the shoulder. There, there. Izuku gave Ida what he hoped was an encouraging smile. It's okay, Ida. You couldn't have known. Suyu so tapped Izuku on the shoulder. I'm generally pretty straightforward, so I just say my mind, Midoriya. Oh, okay, what is it, Asui? Call me Tsuyu. The frog-like girl paused. That strength quirk of yours, did you copy it from All Might? It resembles his quirk. W what? Really, I guess I never noticed how similar they are. Hiroshima interrupted. Nah, can't be. All Might's quirk doesn't injure him, so there's at least one difference. Suyu tilted her head, before nodding. I guess you're right. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief as he raised his head. Todoroki was looking at him. No, Todoroki was watching him, examining him. Hiroshima spoke again. Man, what I wouldn't give for a strength-enhancing quirk like that. You could do a lot of cool stuff with it. The students listened to Kirishima intently, watching as he raised his arm and activated his quirk. By hardening, it means I'm good in a fight, but it's not very flashy. 
Izuku copied Kirishima's motion, calling on his copy of hardening. The quirk only affected up to his wrist, instead of his whole forearm like Kirishima. I think it's pretty cool. Izuku leaned forward to look at the red-haired teen. It's more than strong enough for you to go pro, especially with a bit more training. Izuku called on the power of one for all, except manifesting in the hardening quirk instead of his actual body. The hardening effect massively increased. His entire arm and most of his chest took on the signature crenulated texture. Wow, that's way more than I can do. How did you manage to do that? The connection between the two quirks snapped, allowing the hardening effect to return to normal. The power amplifier quirk I copied, it allows me to supercharge the effect of other quirks I've copied. Izuku shuffled nervously, realizing he had half the bus attention. I can only do it for a few seconds at most, it's pretty draining. So cool. Yuraraka beamed at Izuku, from where she sat next to Momo. Ayama struck a pose. Pro heroes have to grab attention. My quirk is the perfect combination of flashy and strong. Ashido frowned. I thought it made your stomach explode if you use it for more than a second. Ayama slumped. Now if you want to talk strong and flashy, Todoroki and Bekugo are where it's at. See you placed a finger to her bottom lip. He'll never be popular, he's too unhinged. Bekugo growled. I'm fucking sat right here, you know that, don't you, you damn frog face. Huh. Suyu tilted her head, puzzled at Bakugo's muted, for him, reaction. Kaminari laughed. Man, we've only known Bakugo for like three days and it's already clear he has the personality of a flaming trash can seeped in sewage. This broke what little composure Bakugo had left. Fucking say that again, you Pikachu looking motherfucker. Momo shook her head. This conversation, so vulgar. Yuraka nudged the dark haired girl, laughing. Come on, this is fun. I didn't think Bakugo's mouth could get any fouler. Kaminari didn't look very bothered by the explosive teen's outburst. Hey, Kaminari. Kaminari looked over to Gyro. Yo, what's with the ear gear? Gyro pointed to the large white earpiece on the right side of Kaminari's head. It's a communication device. Actually it's basically just a phone. Kaminari pulled a slip of paper out of his jacket. It's got a phone number and everything. A phone number? Gyro questioned. Just, why? Kaminari grinned. It's so I can give it to all the cute girls I save. Wow, just, wow. Kaminari, you have reached a new low. Kaminari held the paper out to Gyro. Go on, you know you want to take it. One of Gyro's ear jacks poked Kaminari's wrist, hitting a nerve and making him drop the paper. Hey, what was that for? Izuku leaned down, picking up the slip of paper. The class turned to look at the green-haired boy. Izuku flushed red. And no, I it's not like that. I J just thought it might be be handy to have it. Sorry Kaminari, why you're not my type? Kaminari raised an eyebrow. Because I'm a guy. Izuku shook his head. Because you're loud. I am loud. Kaminari looked around the bus at a sea of nodding heads. Yuraka piped up. So what is your type, Deki? Rubbing the back of his neck. Izuku desperately looked for a way out of the conversation, short of jumping out the window. Well, is it the silent, broody type like Todoroki? Yuraka bounced in her seat. Or someone calm and confident like Yamomo. Izuku and Momo blushed the same shade of red. Todoroki continued to stare out the window, ignoring the other students entirely. Ada perked up, seeing their destination out the window. We have arrived. Everybody, please prepare yourself to disembark. Shut the fuck up, four eyes. Back Hugo, please act in a manner befitting of the institution you attend. Ada chopped his hand rapidly. Yeah, get him Ada. Uraraka cheered loudly. Class 1 looked around themselves as they entered the massive building, gathered together on a raised platform. Below them they could see an array of areas, ranging from flood to ruins. Well, it's like Universal Studios Japan. Hiroshima exclaimed, pumping his fist. Conflagration zone. Flood zone. Landslide zone. Every accident and incident you can expect to encounter as a pro hero. I built this place myself. A person in a large astronaut costume appeared from the stairs, joining Aizawa and the class on the raised platform. The unforeseen simulation joint. Uraraka jumped up and down in excitement. It's the Space Hero 13, they're my absolute favorite. They're super cool. They do their best work in rescue scenarios. Izuku was slightly taken aback that, for once, he wasn't the biggest hero nerd in the room. Look, Yuraka is going full Midoriya. Ashido pointed to the brown-haired girl, who was rapidly bobbing her head. Aizawa moved to join his fellow hero, lowering his voice so only they could hear. Where's All Might? He was supposed to meet us here. Thirteen shifted awkwardly, before holding up three gloved fingers. About that, Aizawa. Izuku's eyes honed in on Thirteen's gesture, noticing that it matched All Might's three-hour limit as well as the current absence of the number one hero. Aizawa sighed, resisting the urge to pinch the bridge of his nose. Let me guess, he used up all his time on his way to UA. This morning, right, pretty much, Thirteen said. He's in the staff room. He said he's going to try and join us for a few minutes at the end. Aizawa sighed. Fine, whatever. This exercise was originally planned for just two of us to run it. 
Let's just get started. 13 nodded, raising their voice so the class could hear. But first I would like to say something. The gathered heroes in training watched as the space hero raised a single finger. I just have one thing to say. 13 paused. Well, actually it's more like two things. Or three maybe. Four. Five. Izuku frowned. That's a lot of things to say. Anyway, as I'm sure you're all aware, my quirk is called Black Hole. Like its namesake. Anything that is sucked into it is torn apart by the gravitational forces. Mikumo tilted his head. That's not really how black holes work. Excited murmurs rippled through the class, before a look from Aizawa silenced them. Izuku spoke. You've used your quirk to save people in loads of different disasters. That I have. However, my quirk could also be easily used to kill. I'm sure many of you here are the same. The atmosphere in the class grew apprehensive, unsure of where 13 was going with their speech. In our society, the use of our quirks is heavily monitored and restricted, it may seem stable. But all it takes is one wrong move with an uncontrollable quirk for people to die. I read your quirk descriptions. Bakugo, for example, could injure civilians with his explosions if he didn't check his surroundings. Todoroki could easily freeze or burn someone to death. And, Midoriya, you quirk has the most danger, you could easily copy, accidental or otherwise, a truly uncontrollable power. Makumo watched as 13 spoke. It was a strange sensation. His entire life Makumo had desperately wished for a quirk. Anything, no matter how useless. Just for once, just for a few seconds, Makumo was almost glad he didn't have a quirk. That he wasn't a walking time bomb. Almost, 13 spoke again. In Aizawa's physical fitness tests you got to see the hidden potential of your quirks. In All Might's battle trials you got to see the danger your quirk can pose to others. 13 struck a pose. Today, this class will give you a new perspective. Today, you will learn how to save lives using your quirks. Mikumo looked away from the space hero, down towards the water fountain in the center of the facility. I hope you leave today with the understanding that your quirks are meant to help people. 13 bowed. That is all, thank you very much for listening. The class clapped politely, Yuraka somewhat more enthusiastically than her peers. Mikumo's eyes widened as he watched a purple mist begin to swirl at the base of the fountain. Down in the main plaza, Aizawa turned to follow Mikumo's line of sight, observing as the mist grew in size. Huddle up and don't move, Aizawa ordered, holding an arm out. 13. Protect the students. The mist continued to grow larger and larger. Mikumo couldn't take his eyes off it. Figures emerged from the mist, more and more coming flooding in with each second that passed. Kirishima raised a hand to block the light as he looked at the figures. Whoa, are those battle robots like the entrance exam? Aizawa unraveled his scarf, moving it to a fighting stance. Stay back, those are real villains. Mikumo reached into his pockets, pulling out a collapsible visor. Unfolding it, Mikumo put it in place, a silver metal unit on each temple, a blue plexiglass visor connecting them. Activating the zoom function, Mikumo honed in on the center of the mist, a pair of yellow eyes appearing in it. Just 13 and a racer head, then, the miss spoke. That staff schedule I received the other day said All Might should be here. So the break-in yesterday, that was you. Aizawa raised his goggles into place. Scum, the miss spoke again. We've come all this way. Brought so many playmates, and All Might, the pathetic symbol of peace, isn't here. Mikumo froze in fear. He knew that voice, the same one that had haunted his dreams. The pale man. Tamura Shigaraki appeared from the portal, his face and body covered in severed hands. I wonder, Shigaraki grinned maniacally. Dot 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 will killing some kids bring him here? Bakuma was frozen in fear, unable to look away from Shigaraki. Three more figures appeared from the portal, all of them as tall and muscular as All Might, but more akin to monsters than men, with beaks and exposed brains. The first of the trio was the shortest, its off-white skin covered with bark-like armor. The other white monster lumbered next to it, its hands replaced with meter-long claws. The final monster had pitch black skin, red scars covering its shoulders and arms. It was the tallest of the three, its beaker longer, dressed in tan trousers, with skull-shaped knee pads. Villains, here, Kirishima questioned. But this UA, there can't be villains. Momo looked to 13. Doesn't the USJ have some kind of intruder sensors? 13 nodded. It does, they must be jamming them somehow. Are they just here? Or have more of these villains appeared in the rest of the campus as well? Todoroki wondered aloud, before glancing at Momo. One of their quirks must be the one jamming the alarms. A wave of villains began to spread out from the fountain, the majority heading towards the raised platform where the students and the two pro heroes were. Todoroki spoke again. These villains aren't stupid. This place is far from the main campus, at a time where only a few people are here. This is a well-coordinated operation. This isn't just some wild attack, they must have some kind of objective. 13. Begin evacuating the students. Aizawa moved to the top of the stairs. One of the villains must have the electric type quirk that's blocking communications. Kaminari, try using your quirk to contact the school. G got it. Hatsum, 
Akatani. Akuma was jerked out of his paralysis, allowing him to deactivate the zoom on his visor. See if you can make his work. Aizawa reached into his jacket and drew his phone. Mikumo caught the device. Mr. Aizawa, if you get through, call Principal Nenzu. Aizawa prepared to launch himself down the stairs. Sensei, Izuku called out. You can't fight them all alone, your quirk can't affect them all. Izuku thought back to his hero notes. Notebook 5, page 27. Eraserhead's fighting style is characterized by erasing the opponent's quirk and rapid binding using his capture scar. Aizawa sighed. You really are a hero nerd, aren't you, problem child? Remember this, a hero cannot afford to be a one-trick pony. 13. Take care of them. Wrapping each end of his scarf to both the handrails of the stairs, Aizawa pulled, flying into the air, towards the approaching villains. At the bottom of the stairs, three villains lined up. Shooting squad, form up, yelled a man with a helmet-like mask and gun barrels for fingertips. You're not my fucking boss, finger guns. A woman with grey dreadlocks glared at the back of the man's head. The intel Shigaraki gave us said it was supposed to be 13 and all might. Who's this loser? The third member of the shooting squad, a large, muscular man with white horns and a strange gas mask stepped forward. I think I've seen him before, Medusa, dunno what his quirk is though. Finger guns aimed his hands at Aizawa, grinning. I don't give a damn about his quirk, light horn. He's gonna be a dead loser, soon. Fire, Medusa raised her palms, plasma gathering as her dreadlocks began to float. Next to her, Lighthorn clenched his fist as the two barrels in the mouthpiece of his gas mask began to glow. Aizawa's eyes glowed red beneath his goggles, his hair floating around his face. Finger guns barrels clicked uselessly. Medusa's hair fell limp, the light from Lighthorn's gas mask barrels faded away. Blah, my quirk's not working. Finger guns looked down at his hands. The two ends of Aizawa's capture scarf shot out. One wrapping up Medusa in finger guns, the other binding the far heavier light horn. The three villains were lifted into the air, the scarf twisting in on itself and slamming their heads together. Aizawa landed in the middle of the other villains, the shooting squad falling to the ground unconscious. What the hell was that? You idiot, that's a racer hat, said a villain with bandages wrapped around his head. He can erase the quirks of anyone he looks at. A villain with four arms and rock-like complexion tilted his masked head. The race, you say, Azubas. Aizawa looked to the four-armed villain. Stonehenge, don't try it. Azubas warned. Stonehenge ignored the call of his fellow villain, charging at Aizawa. Let's see if that trick works against us with a mutant-class quirk. Aizawa glared at Stonehenge. No, it doesn't. It only works against emitter or transformation types, or active parts of a mutant-type quirk. The capture scarf lashed out, wrapping up Stonehenge and lifting him into the air. However, statistically, mutant quirks tend to focus on close quarters. Aizawa pivoted on one foot, pulling on his scarf to slam Stonehenge into two other villains, one with gorilla arms and the other with a snail head and metal claws for hands, which is why I have countermeasures for you and your quirk. Aizawa recalled his scarf, staring down the circle of villains that surrounded him, weighing up his options. Shigaraki watched the fight from a distance, scratching at his neck. His hand-to-hand -hand combat is impressive, with those goggles of his making it hard to see whose quirk he's cancelling. No wonder he's tearing through the fodder like this. One of the villains, with prehensile hair, gasped as her quirk vanished, before a kick from a racer head sent her flying. I hate pro heroes. Ordinary people don't stand a chance against them. Shijiraki glared at Aizawa. Aizawa's scarf shot out, wrapping up a worm-like villain, yanking him towards the hero and punching him in the chest. A villain, covered in teal-colored bone mold armor, charged at Aizawa, forcing him to use his scarf to pull himself out of the way. You can call me Calcium. The villain's voice was muffled under his bone mold helmet. I don't care. Aizawa launched a kick at Calcium. The villain blocked Aizawa's leg with his armored forearm, forcing the hero backwards. You'll regret disrespecting me, hero. Calcium grew spikes on his armored hands and forearms. Aizawa's eyes flashed red under his goggles, the bone mold armor falling away from Calcium. The trap was sprung. A blue, one-eyed villain with large horns charged at Aizawa's back. In one fluid motion, Aizawa sent his scarf out to bind the cyclops, adding to his momentum with a pull and stepping to the side, allowing him to crash into calcium. Izuku watched as his homeroom teacher launched himself back into the fray, the rest of his class racing towards the exit. The racer head is good, but I can already see him slowing down, just slightly. He can't go on forever. He's unsuited to one versus many fights, no matter how many tricks he has up his sleeve. Midoriya. Izuku's foot lifted off the ground. He wasn't thinking, he was just moving. Class representative. Ada's shout broke Izuku's focus, making him look at the taller boy. The class needs you. I'm sorry, Mr. Aizawa. Izuku sighed, before nodding. You're right, let's go. Ada and Izuku turned, running after their classmates, the former using his engines, the latter tapping into his new speed quirk. They quickly caught up, 
Izuku trailing a few seconds behind Ada, both of them slowing to jog alongside Yuraka and Siro. Further up, Mikuma looked across to Hatsum, her pink dreadlocks bouncing with every footfall. We need to deploy, Mikuma called. Hatsum glanced at her partner, the large case still on her back. All right, this is the ultimate field test for our baby, Hatsum. We're running away from the villains, not fighting them. Mikumo fell back, lining up behind the pink-haired girl. Authorization code, Alpha 1986, Configuration A, in motion deployment. A light on the case flashed. Before a panel opened up, two metal devices shot out of the case, hitting the ground in front of Mikumo and opening up, allowing him to slip his feet into them as he ran. The metal panels wrapped around the boy's lower legs, forming a set of boots with repulsor soles. His footsteps now heavy and metallic, Makumo pushed himself forwards, placing both hands inside the case. Like his prototype gauntlets, titanium alloy plates arranged themselves around his forearms, creating his gauntlets. Finally, a chest plate shot out of the case, hitting Makumo's chest and securing itself, panels sliding together to form light back armor. The whole process took less than 15 seconds. A soft, mechanical voice spoke in Makumo's ear. SHTR system online. Model Alpha I ready for use. We're going to have to drop the deployment speed for the chest plate. Mikumo winced. That's going to hurt in the morning. Wimp. Hatsum replied. Mikumo rolled his eyes. Just a beacon of support, aren't you? Yep. Suddenly, purple mist appeared in front of the doors, blocking their exit. The yellow eyes glowing from within the mist. Greetings, I am Kirajiri. We are the League of Villains, and I'm afraid we can't allow you to leave. The class came to a screeching halt. Thirteen prepared to use their quirk. Forgive our audacity, but... Shut the fuck up, Misty fucker. Bakugo launched himself at Kirajiri, forcing Thirteen to stop their quirk. Bakugo, stop. A massive explosion engulfed Kirajiri, blocking him from the view of the class. The dust began to clear. Bakugo was standing, breathing heavy, glaring at Kirajiri. Impressive. Just a student and you actually got close to hurting me. Kirajiri reformed. I guess that's to be expected from the best of the best. Bakugo growled. You're not going to get a chance to kill All Might. I'll take you fuckers down myself. Thirteen called out. Back Hugo, get back. Kirajiri laughed, before swelling in size. Be gone, hero brats. The purple mist engulfed the students, swallowing them up. Writhe in torment, until you breathe your last. The number you have called cannot be reached at the moment. Please try again later. Tashinori sighed, lowering the phone from his ear. That was the fourth time he'd tried to call Aizawa, as well as the three attempts he'd made at contacting Thirteen. They may have had good reasons, but my actions this morning were foolish. Tashinori sighed. I put hero work ahead of my teaching, but maybe I can show up at the end. Tashinori trailed off. No, that does it. Tashinori stood, his body swelling as he assumed his muscular form. Hold on. The door to the staff room opened. Am I a mouse? A bear? A dog? Who knows? All you need to know is I'm the principal. Nenzu, turning his head, Tashinori took in the sight of Nenzu, as well as a tall, green and yellow-haired man standing behind him. Tashinori barely managed to stop himself from vomiting blood as he suddenly deflated in shock. M. Murai. The tall man pushed his glasses up his nose, his eyes glinting dangerously. Hello, Tashinori. Tashinori gulped. Momo hit the ground hard, followed by the sound of two more bodies landing next to her. Pushing herself up, Momo looked to see she was with Gyro and Kaminari. They had been warped to the mountain zone, judging by their surroundings. Kaminari stood. We're still in the USJ, aren't we? Momo nodded, helping Gyro to her feet. Are you okay, Gyro? Momo asked. Gyro nodded. I'm fine, I just landed a bit funny. That's all. Can you fight? Gyro placed her foot down, testing it. Yeah, I can. But I could do with a weapon. Momo held out her arm, the hilt of a sword appearing from her wrist. Thanks. Gyro pulled on the hilt, drawing the sword from Momo, before testing its weight. Can I get one of those? Kaminari gave a thumbs up. Can't you just shock any villains? Gyro questioned, as she tested the weight of the sword. Kaminari raised an eyebrow. Weren't you paying attention during the battle trial? I can charge my body up with electricity, but if I discharge it I can't control it, like Todoroki's eyes. Kaminari, use this. Momo's skin lit up. A katana protruding from her shoulder, which she then held out to Kaminari. A katana. Kaminari wondered as he took the blade. Momo smiled. Like you said your quirk only allows you to charge your body with electricity, not discharge in a targeted manner. Kaminari nodded in agreement. That's why you used Minta spheres to conduct your electricity into gyro and... That weapon, its hilt is partially metal, connected to the rest of the blade. Kaminari realized what Momo was saying, grinning as he did. Awesome, nice idea, vice rep. There they are. The three heroes in training turned to see a crowd of villains coming for them, 35 by Momo's quick count. Momo held out her hand, creating a staff, gripping it tightly as she steeled herself, getting ready to fight. They're just three kids, we can fucking take them. 
one of the villains said, his lips entirely made of metal, holding a spiked club in one hand, a knife in the other. The villain charged directly at Momo, prompting more to swamp Gyro and Kaminari, ducking a swing of the spiked club. Momo spun her staff around, bringing it down on the villain's wrist. The villain dropped the club, recoiling. Shit, you fucking bee. Momo smacked the villain in the face with the end of her staff before he could finish his sentence, before kicking him in the chest, sending him flying back. Nasp, another villain, a long, wide buster sword strapped to his back moved to help Nasp up. I'm fine, Heltz. Nasp pressed his hand to Heltz's shoulder, his hand glowing red. Nasp pressed his metal lips together, forming a thin slot. The slot word, before a life-size 2D version of Houts was printed from it, holding a similarly 2D copy of his sore. Nasp grinned as both Houts and Paper Houts advanced on Yeyarazu. Yeyarazu flicked her wrist, creating two kunai. Both of them rocketed at Paper Houts. The photocopy knocked one kunai away with his sword, the other ripping through his shoulder, leaving a tear. Houts swung his sword at Yeyarazu. The teen dodged to one side, Houts's weapon cracking the ground, the force augmented by his strength quirk. Yeyarazu recovered herself, before jamming a taser she'd created into the villain's neck, taking him out of the fight. Paper Houts launched himself at Yeyarazu, who quickly ducked to one side and swung her staff, crumpling his sword, tossing the ruined weapon away. Paper Houts swung a fist at Yeyarazu. Yeyarazu didn't move, the punch hitting her shoulder, leaving a long, shallow paper cut. Nasp laughed. That was a mistake, girly. Yeyarazu smiled. No, it wasn't. Fire engulfed Paper Houts's arm, a lighter in Yeyarazu's hand. The photocopy stumbled away. The photocopy was swallowed by the flames. Nasp glared at the dark-haired girl. No matter, I can make him again. Another Paper Houts was created, stalking towards Yeyarazu. Yeyarazu's thigh began to glow, before a large flamethrower was created from it. Grabbing the flamethrower, Yeyarazu raised it and fired, burning Paper Houts to a crisp. No, 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 Nasp created another photocopy. Yeyarazu burnt it. No, photocopy after photocopy was created, burning up in seconds as Yeyarazu slowly approached Nasp, stepping over the ashes of another photocopy. Yeyarazu slammed the side of the flamethrower into Nasp's temple, knocking him out, dropping the spent weapon. Yeyarazu turned to take stock of the battlefield, only for a brown-haired villain to charge at her, hands raised, dust fired from the villain's palm, enveloping Yeyarazu and leaving her unable to see her surroundings. Suddenly, the dust began to explode like firecrackers, leaving Yeyarazu disorientated. A fist struck the teen across the jaw, sending her sprawling. The villain loomed out of the dust, holding his palm out, ready to fire again. A wave of sound blasted the dust away, slamming into the villain and exploding. The ear jacks disconnected from Gyro's amplifier boots as she held a hand out to Yeyarazu. Need a hand? Yeyarazu allowed Gyro to pull her up. Thanks for the save. A villain with pale green skin rocketed towards Gyro's back propelled by a mini cyclone in the palm of each hand. Before the villain could reach his target five long, steel spikes shot out of Yeyarazu's palm, pinning the villain to the rock wall. Gyro smiled. Thanks, Yamomo. That one is catching on, isn't it? You can blame Ashido and Yuraka for that. Gyro fired another sound wave at another villain, with the body of an iguana slamming him into the rock wall. The two heroes in training split apart, Momo launching herself at a large villain, wearing clothes of dark red fur, while Gyro engaged a villain wearing a grey trench coat. Gyro ducked the swing of trench coat's sickle, firing a pulse from her left boot, knocking the weapon from the villain's hand. A pink-skinned villain dived in, slicing his knife towards Gyro. The purple-haired girl disconnected one of her jacks and wrapped it around the pink villain's wrist, squeezing tight and forcing him to drop the weapon. The pink villain grabbed Gyro's wrist, holding her in place, leering at her. Sickle, get her, now. Trenchcoat had retrieved his sickle, swinging it at Gyro. Kaminari was suddenly in the way, blocking the sickle with his katana. Looks like somebody's in for the shock of lifetime. Indiscriminate shock. 100,000 volts. Both Kaminari and the katana lit up with electricity, through the sickle and into Trenchcoat. That was a terrible one-liner. Gyro sighed as she slammed a fist into the pink villain's temple, knocking him out. Kaminari shrugged. I thought it was pretty good. It has sucked. Trenchcoat gasped, before collapsing. A toad-like villain jumped at Kaminari, from all fours, his strong legs giving him the momentum to slam into the electric teen, the katana falling from his grip. I'm gonna enjoy this. The toad villain's tongue shot out, wrapping around Kaminari's neck, choking him. Kaminari grinned, making the villain nervous. Do you know what happens to a toad when it's electrocuted? The toad villain frowned. The same thing that happens to everything else. Kaminari lit up with electricity, shocking the villain and forcing him to release him. Pushing the unconscious villain of him, Kaminari retrieved his katana and stood. I've always wanted to use that line. A red-haired villain suddenly swung a fist at Kaminari, sending him stumbling back. 
readying himself. Kaminari raised his katana and charged it, as well as himself, with electricity. Burn, kid. The villain grinned. As C-O-R-C-H. The second the O sound left the villain's lips a cone of fire burst from his mouth. Kaminari raised his arm to protect himself, the heat singeing his costume. As the fire burned out, Kaminari yelped and dropped the katana, glancing down to see it was a puddle of molten metal on the ground. Fucking burn, you brat. Dodging another burst of fire. Kaminari came face to face with a massive villain, twice his height, wearing a silver helmet, bearing down on him. Kaminari screamed, before ducking a swing of silver helmet's huge fist, turning on his heels and running towards Gyro and Momo. Have you seen this guy? I seriously think I just saw the river sticks. Gyro blocked the sword of the iguana villain with her own, before kicking him away, while Momo batted away a villain's arm, in the form of a large spike, with her staff. The blue-skinned man stabbed his other three arms at Momo, forcing her to take a step back to avoid being impaled. Kaminari rejoined Gyro and Momo. These guys are crazy. Worry about that later. Gyro replied. The three teens were grouping as the villains did the same. Right now we need to figure out how to get away from these villains. We can't win, they're just toying with us. Kaminari turned to look at Momo. A villain melted my sword. Could you make me one again? Gyro spoke before Momo could react. You're the electric guy, right? Just get up close and shock them with your quirk. Kaminari shook his head, starting to panic. I can't discharge with any sort of aim. I'd fry you too as well. It's like Todoroki's quirk. And I can't even call for help thanks to whichever one of these villains is jamming communications. Right now, you two just can't rely on me. Gyro rolled her eyes. Stop whining. You should have asked for something to aim your quirk with when you asked for your costume. Silver Helmet charged again, forcing Kaminari to jump back. Kaminari, charge up your body. Gyro planted a foot in the small of Kaminari's back and pushed. Yelling in fear, Kaminari flooded his body with electricity just as he stumbled into the large villain, lighting both him and the flame villain next to him up with yellow energy. Kaminari turned his head to look at Gyro. Look, it's working. I'm strong. You two can count on me. Gyro sighed. You are way too happy-go-lucky. Stop messing around, kid. A villain with a yellow jumpsuit and white visor charged at Gyro, his right arm a long, black cable. At its end was a number of rocks fused together into a single boulder. With an overarm swing, the stone villain brought the boulder down towards Gyro. Without even blinking, Gyro plugged both her jacks into her boots, firing a continuous blast that obliterated the boulder back into its individual parts and fired them back at the stone villain. What the oof? The stone smashed into the villain's gut, dropping him to the ground. You say your quirk is strong. A deep voice caught Kaminari's attention, turning his head to see a tall, thin villain wearing metal gauntlets. Then why don't you try using it on me? The villain flexed his thin arms. That's Yaoi Armstrong, the stretch arm villain. Don't run in fear yet. You're facing the technique that's been passed down in my family for generations. The villain released a mighty yell as his arm stretched, his metal-covered fist weakly hitting Kaminari in the face. Yaoi Armstrong yelled out in pain as his body was filled with electricity, unable to pull his hand away. A villain in a gray boar mask jumped over the mass of his electrified comrades, a knife in each hand. Momo flicked her arm, a capture net firing from it and wrapping up the boar villain, his loss of momentum dropping him into Kaminari's electrification effect. Both of you should be taking this more seriously. Momo returned her staff to a two-handed grip. Sorry, I thought it was a good idea at the time. Gyro said, her tone almost bashful. At the same time, Kaminari's quirk gave out, the yellow energy dissipating, the four villains caught in its effect crumpling to the ground, their bodies smoking. Gyro activated her quirk again. Her boots firing the amplified sound of her heartbeat at the villains, the sound waves crashing over five villains. They screamed, covering their ears. A villain with a white mask and long, black hair jumped down from the cliff above Gyro, a tomahawk in each of his hands. Gyro dodged, freeing the villains from her sound waves. Before the villain could swing again Momo delivered a double-footed kick to his chest, slamming him back against the rock wall. Momo landed. It's done. Gyro looked to her classmate. What's done? This, a large, white blanket burst from Momo's back, tearing a hole in her costume as it unfolded and landed on top of herself and Gyro. Larger creations take more time, Momo explained, before peeking out of the blanket. Kaminari. This blanket is an insulation sheet a hundred millimeters thick. Kaminari grinned, giving the dark-haired girl a double thumbs up. I see. Electricity sparked through Kaminari. In that case, I can go all out. Indiscriminate shock. 1.3 million volts. Yellow energy burst from Kaminari's body, jumping from villain to villain in less time than it took to blink. After 10, long seconds the lightning ceased, leaving every villain smoking and shocked. One by one the villains collapsed, until only Kaminari was standing. Momo raised the blanket to look out, seeing they had won. We should join the others as quickly as we can. I fear they could be in grave danger. Yeah Momo, your costume. 
Jairo pointed to the dark-haired girl. Momo examined her outfit. The back had ripped open, but thanks to the added support of the zipper it had stayed together, replacing it would have cost a portion of her lipid stores she didn't really have to spare. It's fine, Jairo. Momo smiled, before throwing the blanket aside. Kaminari, are you okay? The teen in question had moved, his hands still giving thumbs up, his expression vacant. He must have overloaded himself or something. Jairo offered an explanation. Hello, hello, Kaminari, can you hear me? Jairo frowned. Is that... Izuku, Momo reached out, taking the communication device from Kaminari's ear, placing it on her own. Momo, it's great to hear your voice. The dark-haired girl blushed slightly. Likewise, Shacho, are you uninjured? I'm fine, I'm with Asui, I mean Su, and Mainta in the flood zone, they're fine as well. Jairo's lips pressed into a thin line. I actually could do with a favor, Fuka Shacho. The purple-haired girl rolled her eyes. God, you two are such a couple. W what? No, no, I mean. A uh, CC coupe play. Jairo grinned. She could actually picture Izuku's blush, idly wondering if his cheeks might actually set on fire. The two teens eventually recovered from the heart attacks Jairo had given them. Momo spoke, unable to stop her blush. What was it you wanted, Midoriya? Ah, oh, right. Yeyarazu, I need the chemical formula and structure for Disperse Red 9. Disperse Red 9. Why yeah, it's a dye. Momo frowned, before taking the dictionary from her belt, opening it and flicking through. Here it is. Disperse Red 9. Chemical name 1 Methylamino Anthroquinone. Chemical formula C15 H11 No 2. Thanks, Momo. You are welcome, Izuku. We've taken out the villains in our area. We'll come to you. Oh okay, see you soon. That you shall. Momo lowered the communication device as the line went dead. Drop that, or your friend fries. Momo and Gyro turned around to see a tall, muscular villain in a white skull mask holding a still-dazed Kaminari in the air with one hand, electricity sparking in the other. Hands up, and no using your quirks. Both Momo and Gyro hesitated. The villain's hand sparked again. Do it, or else your friend dies. Kaminari's distant expression suddenly became very worried. He got us, we completely let our guard down. Gyro said, an ambush after we thought we got them all, I should have seen this coming. The two teens followed the instruction, raising their hands, the communication device still in one of Momo's hands. I told you to drop that. The villain warned. Momo let the device fall to the ground. Now kick it to me. The dark-haired girl did just that. The communication device coming to a halt at the villain's feet. An armored boot slammed down on the transceiver, turning it to scrap. Good, we can't have you calling your boyfriend again. Momo resisted the urge to reply. The villain spoke again. I don't want to kill an electric type like me, but I guess I'll have to. Electric type, you must be the one jamming communications. Right you are, Ponytail. The electric villain began to walk towards the two heroes in training. Gyro glanced down, before speaking. You and Kaminari are a couple of born winners then, aren't you? Huh? The villain stopped in his tracks. Momo looked across, worried at what the other girl might say next, before spotting an earjack creeping down Gyro's back. Well, even if you weren't a hero, there's plenty of industries that would be clamoring for you. You'd be in high demand, it's just a thought I had. Gyro paused. I was just wondering, why would someone with a quirk like yours would become a villain? The villain's hand sparked again. Stop that, or I fry the kid. Gyro froze. Did you think I wouldn't notice? The ear jack returned to its normal position. If you don't resist, I'll let this kid live. The villain began to walk towards them again. If you do, I'll fry him and then you. Momo steeled herself. Do it. The villain stopped mid-step. What? Do it? Momo ignored the look of betrayal in her classmate's eyes. Fry him. Fine, but his blood is on your hands. The villain pressed his hand to Kaminari's chest, flooding the blonde teen's body with electricity. Fry, kid. After a few seconds the attack ended. Kaminari's clothes looked a little singed, but his dazed expression was gone. His body crackling with lightning. Kaminari, use your quirk. Momo snatched up the discarded insulation sheet and pulled over her and Gyra. Right, have a taste of your own medicine, Skullface. Indiscriminate discharge, 800,000 volts. Electricity burst from Kaminari's body, making the villain spasm and drop him. The villain grunted as the attack ended, before keeling over backwards. Whoa, Yeyarazu, how did you know his quirk wouldn't kill me? Kaminari asked as Momo and Gyro climbed out from under the sheet. Momo smiled. You must have some kind of immunity to electricity since you charge your entire body. It was clear he didn't have any immunity since he assumed you didn't as well. Nice idea, Yeyarazu. Kaminari smiled and gave her a thumbs up. A massive burst of wind blew through the area. The scattered, unconscious villains suddenly piled up not far from the three teens. We're saved, Kaminari exclaimed, throwing his arm up into the air. That was totally all might. Momo and Gyro breathed a sigh of relief. Thirteen called out. Back Hugo, get back. Tenya watched as Kirajiri laughed. The villain's misty body swelling in size. Begone, hero brats. The purple mist engulfed the students, blinding them. 
Tenya made his decision, looking to his side, seeing where Midoriya stood. Class representative, the class needs you. Lurching forwards, Tenya activated his engines, slamming into Midoriya and Sato and sending them flying. Clear of the villain's mist, writhe in torment, until you breathe your last. Tenya was falling. Flaming buildings surrounded him, the oppressive heat making him sweat. Igniting his engines, Ada bent his legs and boosted into one of the buildings, sliding down it to land on the ruined street below. The conflagration zone, that villain must have warped us all to different parts of the USJ to make us easier to defeat. Seems that way. Ajiro landed on a lamppost, his tail cushioning him. Ajiro, I am glad to see you safe. Tenya nodded to his classmate. What about me? Katsune skidded to a halt on the road, the large case still on her back, wearing chest armor with two grapples and carrying a very pale Ayama in her arms, bridal style. Ayama dropped out of Hatsune's arms onto all fours, his breathing shallow. I thought I was going to die. Ayama looked up at Tenya, his eyes wide and haunted. Hatsune laughed. Oh calm down, Frenchie, it was only a few backflips. 16. Ayama weakly pushed himself to his feet. It was 16 backflips. Ajiro jumped down from the lamppost. We have company. The four teens looked around themselves. Six villains were approaching from one side, seven from the other. Ajiro, you take that direction. Tenya pointed to the six villains on one side. I will take the other. Ayama, protect Hatsum. Ajiro nodded in agreement, using his tail to launch himself at the nearest villain, a blue-haired woman with fists covered in needles. Hatsum laughed, dropping her case to the ground, a gauntlet similar to Makumo's on each arm. There's no chance I'm sitting on the sidelines when I can use this as an opportunity to test my baby. Firing off her grapples, Hatsum shot into the air, flipping as she did, before pulling on the side of a building, punching a 15-foot-tall villain in his face. Tenya processed the change of situation before looking at Ayama. The plan has changed. Help Ajiro instead. Oh we. Ayama struck a shaky pose. Charging up his engines, Tenya burst into motion, heading for the same gigantic villain as Hatsum, before delivering a kick to the inside of the villain's knee, shattering it. With an almighty crash the villain slammed down on the ground, on top of two other villains, holding his knee as he screamed in pain. Another villain, an older man with green skin, came for Tenya, flicking his arm and releasing a stream of green acid at the hero in training raising his arm to intercept the acid. Tenya jumped into the air and fired his left engine. Tenya span, allowing him to deliver an engine-powered kick to the green acid villain across the temple, dropping him immediately. Tenya landed, unclipping his acid-covered gauntlet and letting it fall to the ground, slowly melting. He readied himself to engage the next villain, a woman with hair of fire, when Hatsum suddenly grabbed one of his arms. Your quirk is super interesting. I wonder, maybe arm booster to increase maneuverability. Hatsum examined Tenya's arm. Tenya pulled it free in a single chopping motion. Hatsum, I do believe this is not the time for such a conversation. A villain sprinted at Hatsum's back. Tenya ignited his engines in response, ready to defend her. Hatsum smiled. Do you mind testing this out for me? Blue liquid shot out of the nozzle, splashing onto the ground. I call it anti-friction fluid, AFF for short, enjoy. The villain's eyes widened comically as he completely lost traction with the ground, sliding off and smashing into the lamppost. Hatsum fired one of her grapples, hitting her case and pulling it, sliding across the tarmac and coming to a halt at her feet. Kicking it open, Hatsum retrieved a single metal glove, the same silver color as the rest of the SHTR gear. Here, try this out. This is the SHTR liquid arm. Model Alpha I Hatsum pushed Tenya's left arm, bare from the acid villain's attack, into the glove. The glove lit up, unfolding and armoring almost up to his elbow. Thank you, Hatsum. Tenya nodded. Is this safe? Hatsum shrugged. Probably. Watch this. Grabbing the cuff, Hatsum rotated it, revealing a nozzle similar to her own gauntlet, this one with a red tip. Make a fist and aim at a villain. Press the button on the outside of the middle finger with your thumb to fire. Tenya paused, before slowly nodding and raising his fist at the fire hair villain, firing the gauntlet. Extinguisher foam fired from the nozzle, covering the flame hair villain and killing the fire. Rotate the cuff clockwise, two notches. Hatsum fired off a grapple and disconnected it, wrapping up a villain, securing him tightly. I will, Hatsum. Tenya followed the pink-haired girl's instruction. The extinguisher nozzle retracting, replaced by one with a white tip. Fire. White foam shot from the nozzle, covering the flame villain up to her neck, before it expanded and hardened, encasing her entirely. That's the immobilization foam, useful for capturing villains and rescuing civilians. Hatsum dodged a villain's energy-covered fist by firing one of her grapples, pulling herself away. Landing, Hatsum turned as the villain fired black energy from his bare feet, blasting him towards the pink-haired girl. 
Tatsum, watch out. Tenya wasn't fast enough. There was no way he could reach her in time. Tatsum raised her left arm. The panels retracting to allow a large, diamond-shaped shield in the same metal as the gauntlet to unfold. The villain's fist hit the shield, reflecting his own energy back on himself. Dropping the shield, Hatsum switched to the immobilization foam on her right arm and fired it at the energy villain, point-blank range. His body was covered in rapidly hardening foam. The villain gave a muffled yell before pitching backwards, unable to stop himself as he slowly rolled away. Taking care to make sure each of the seven villains were defeated, Tenya turned to Adajiro, finding the boy fighting three villains at once in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Ayama nowhere to be found. Before Tenya could move to help Ajiro, the ground shook, and then it shook again. The Namu, L let's get out of here. One of the villains fighting Ajiro pointed behind the teens. Before all three bolted in the opposite direction, each dragging a comrade, Tenya turned. The white monster with claws lumbered towards them, the ground shaking with every step, its eyes wild, like an animal. Ajiro, the villains. Tenya leapt into act, firing his engines, scooping up the energy and flame villain, one on each shoulder. On it, Ajiro sprang forward with a flick of his tail, quickly collecting the bound and acid villains, leaving only the 15-foot villain and the two trapped under him. Dropping the energy and flame villains at Hatsum's feet, Tenya fired his engines to launch himself back into the fray. The clawed Namu stopped as it reached the massive villain, grabbing him by the neck and lifting him up. The two villains who had been squashed under the massive villain desperately filled their lungs before scrambling to their feet and running down the street as fast as they could, bringing his clawed hand back, light glinting off the metal, before plunging them into the massive villain's stomach. With a bored grunt, the clawed Namu dropped the injured villain, who shrank down to a normal size as he fell. Tenya caught the villain before he could hit the ground, firing his engines and returning to his classmates. Lay him down, Hatsum said, her tone suddenly authoritative. Tenya did as he was told, watching as the clawed Namu slowly lumbered towards them. Hatsum rotated her cuff, switching to a green-tipped nozzle, spraying a viscous liquid on the villain's wound. This will stabilize him, but he'll need serious medical treatment and fast. Ayama came running out of one of the buildings. Run for your lives. Ajiro grabbed Ayama's cape, holding him back. Ayama, look after Hatsum. Ida, let's go. Tenya nodded, standing. We have to stop this monster here. If we let it go it could kill our fellow students as well as the villain. Right. Ajiro joined Tenya. Hatsum and Ayama took shelter in a building, the former dragging the injured with her. You have a plan, vice rep. Tenya clenched a fist. What would Tensei do? Ajiro, use the lamppost. Attack its head as a distraction. Ajiro nodded, using his tail to fly into the air and spring off the side of the lamppost, spinning in the air, charging up his engine. Tenya pushed them past anything he'd ever dared to try before. Engine boost. Tenya's armored leg slammed into the clawed Namu's gut. His attack was turned back against him, sending him flying away, Ajiro alongside him, both of them crashing into the ground. Ajiro grunted. It must have some kind of impact reflection quirk. The claws must just be grafted onto its hands, not its quirk. The navy-haired teen looked up, watching the injuries to the Namu's gut and cheek healed at a rapid pace. It's healing, it has two quirks, at least. Tenya started to push himself back up when a massive hand grabbed him around the waist and lifted. Ida. Ajiro forced himself to his feet, slamming his tail into the ground, shooting him towards the Namu with a kick. The clawed Namu lashed out, grabbing Ajiro's leg and tightening its grip. Ajiro's leg snapped, the blonde teen crying out in pain as the Namu continued to squeeze harder. Grabbing blindly at the cuff of his SHTR gauntlet, Tenya rotated it, looking for the immobilization foam. Ajiro's screams amplified. Tenya threw caution to the wind, raising his gauntlet and firing. A stream of water shot from the ice-blue nozzle, suddenly freezing and impaling the Namu in its exposed brain. Roaring in pain, the Namu dropped both Tenya and Ajiro, scrabbling to pull the ice spike from its brain. Tenya fired his engines, kicking off the Namu's chest, catching Ajiro and landing on the road. Hatsum, the pink-haired girl took Ajiro into her own arms, surprising Tenya with her strength and the ease she carried the blonde boy. I Ida, we need to run. Ajiro grunted as Hatsum set him down. Tenya shook his head. No, we have to stop it. Others will die if we don't. What would Midoriya do? What would Tensei do? I know what to do. Tenya's glasses glinted under the harsh light and flames. Hatsum, do you have any more gauntlets? Hatsum nodded. Just one, the match to the shield arm I have. Tenya moved over to Hatsum's equipment case, opening it, taking the last shield arm. Unclipping his right arm guard, Tenya replaced it with the shield gauntlet, undeployed. I hope you have a plan. Hatsum commented. Tenya pushed his glasses up his nose. I do. Follow my instructions please. Hatsum examined Tenya for a few seconds, before nodding in agreement. Ayama. Tenya looked at the shaking teen. I need your help. You want to be a hero, don't you? Something inside Ayama hardened. I'll help you, Monami. 
Good. Tenya watched as the clawed Namu pulled the ice spike from its brain with a roar, regaining its agency, its exposed brain matter quickly healing. Katsum, stand next to the lamppost. Get ready to launch me with your shield, Ayama. You go further back, get ready to fire. Tenya charged up his engines, his exhaust ports flickering blue inside the orange flames. Maximum turbo boost. Racing towards Hatsum, Tenya watched as she lowered her shield, allowing him to plant a boot on it, the pink-haired girl launching him into the air, igniting his engines. Tenya shot out of the way of the clawed Namu's fist, deploying the shield in his arm. Tenya angled it towards Ayama. Ayama, fire your laser at me. We. The sparkly blue laser hit Tenya's shield, reflecting and hitting the Namu in the face, stunning it. Firing his engines, Tenya clenched his left fist and slammed it into the Namu's exposed brain, his arm sinking almost up to his elbow. Pressing his thumb to the fire button, Tenya discharged a mobilization foam directly into the Namu's brain, encasing the Namu's head, sealing the gauntlet in place. Monster, this is your finish line. Tenya released his arm from the gauntlet, planting his feet on the Namu's chest and kicking away. Landing on the ground, Tenya looked up, watching as the Namu fell backwards, hitting the road with a massive crash, cracking the tarmac. Nice work, Ada. Hatsum approached Tenya, giving him a thumbs up. You'll make a great hero. T thank you, Hatsum. Ayama stepped forwards. Is it dead? No, Hatsum said. That monster can heal itself. At an accelerated rate, it has sealed the gauntlet into its brain so it cannot heal itself. Tenya nodded. We should tend to Ajiro and the injured villain, then head towards the main enter. A blast of wind shot through the conflagration zone, extinguishing the fires, leaving behind a pile of villains, a mixture of those the teens had defeated and those that had run away from the Namo. Tenya turned to watch as the wind tore away from them. All might, he's here. Landslide zone. Shoto stared at the eight villains, frozen in a circle around him, an apathetic look on his face. How pathetic. Shoto's tone was dull. You all lost to a student in his first week in an instant. None of the villains spoke, quietly shivering. So none of you are willing to talk. Shoto stepped forward. So the plan was divide and conquer. Still no response. Shoto started walking down the landslide, through the middle of the frozen villains. I hate to say, but you guys are just a bunch of idiots with quirks they don't know how to use properly. T this Kai kid, he f froze us all mm immediately. The second W we warped here. A villain with gray skin spoke. Finally, they're talking. Is he really just a kid? A pink-skinned villain bemoaned, trying and failing to move. He's like a pro hero already. A beast-like villain moaned pitifully. At first I thought that Pale Man had gathered his elite to kill All Might. Shoto said, but looking at you sorry lot makes it clear that's not the case. Another villain charged out from behind a crop of ice-covered rocks, a green band of skin across the eyes the only unusual aspect to him, a large knife clutched in one hand. Hey, fuck you, kid. Shoto turned his head, before slamming his foot down and encasing the villain with a stripe of green across his eyes and eyes. Without looking away, Shoto dodged a metal staff thrust at his head from behind, grabbing it with his right hand, freezing both it and its wielder, a hawk-like man, solid. Shoto sighed. You're just a ragtag bunch of thugs. Thickening the ice covering the hawk villain to protect him from shattering, Shoto pulled the staff free, letting the villain fall to the ground, rocking gently. From what I saw, there were only six or seven truly dangerous villains in that plaza. Shoto looked up. Therefore, the next step I must take is simple. Turning back towards the green striped villain, Shoto raised his right arm, his hand hovering over the villain's face. At this rate your cells will slowly wither and die. Shoto paused. I want to be a pro hero, so I don't really want to do something so cruel, so tell me. Icy air floated from Shoto's palm. On what basis do you think you can kill All Might? The green striped villain shivered. From the ice or fear, Shoto didn't know. He didn't particularly care either. I it's a mo monster. Die, brat. Shoto turned his head. A blonde-haired villain was charging at him, fist drawn back. A villain that Shoto had already frozen. Shoto stamped his right foot, creating an ice barrier between himself and the villain. The villain smashed thought it with ease, but found only empty air. Where did he go? The villain looked around himself, seeing no trace of Shoto. You have a strength-based quirk. A freezing hand suddenly touched the villain's back. Don't worry, I can counter that. Layer after layer of ice covered the villain, encasing him entirely in thick sheets of ice. Shoto lowered his arm. He could have sworn the amount of ice he'd used on the villain earlier had been enough to immobilize him. And yet he had somehow broken free, allowing him to attack Shoto. Are you not going to use your fire, Sho-chan? Shoto stilled, the breath catching in his throat. Toya, turning. Shoto was face to face with a doppelganger of his brother, his hair white instead of its natural red. His brother who had died eleven years ago, standing in front of him. Whole and healthy, casually dressed in jeans and a white turtleneck. You can't be here. Shoto shook his head. Toya had to be the result of some villain's quirk. He was unburned, still the same age he was when he died. Eighteen, just months from graduating from UA. Hi, you're not real, you're dead. 
Shoto paused. His voice had lost its usual dullness. I saw you die. Toya's eyes hardened. You didn't see me die. You saw our father try and murder me. Murder you. Toya rolled up the sleeves of his turtleneck, revealing extensive burn scars. The flames that burnt me weren't my own, they belonged to Endeavor. Shoto shook his head. I saw it. I saw it. The flames were blue, they were yours. I couldn't save you. My ice wasn't strong enough. My quirk had only just manifested. Toya returned his sleeves to their normal position and looked around at the frozen villains. It certainly is now. Last time I saw you all you could make were ice cubes. I'm sorry, I tried. Don't be. Toya interrupted. Endeavor tried to kill me, but in the end he lit the path to my salvation. Salvation. The paramedics that took me to the hospital. Toya lit blue flames in the palm of his hand. I arrested on the way. Declared dead on arrival, they couldn't save me. Toya extinguished the flames. But he could. Hey. Toya nodded. Mr. Takabana. He used his power to bring me back. Placed me in a stasis. It's taken all this time to heal my body. His power. Shoto took a half step towards his brother. You mean his quirk. Toya rolled his blue eyes. Power and quirk are not the same thing. Power can be so much more. It can be property, influence, authority. The white-haired boy paused. Domination. Shoto raised an eyebrow. So this Takabana is a villain. Toya shrugged. I guess that's one interpretation. What's the other interpretation? Mr. Takabana was my savior. He granted me new power. Toya looked his brother directly in the eyes. The government says Endeavor is a hero. We both know that isn't true. How many more heroes are given a free pass to hurt their families just because of their jobs? Relighting the blue flames in his palm, Toya took a step back. I'll use Takabana's power to burn this corrupt hero society down. Toya slammed the palm of flames down on the ground. An intense wave of heat washing over the area, melting all of Shoto's ice. Don't fight me, Shoto. Toya walked towards his younger brother. These thugs won't hurt you, I'll make sure of that. You can join me, we'll stop Endeavor together. The ten villains Shoto had frozen earlier were free, advancing towards the teen. Shoto paused, his right hand slowly covering with ice. How many innocent people will die? For revenge. Don't you want revenge? Toya looked angry now. Revenge for what he's taken from you, what he's done to you. It doesn't take a genius to figure out where you got that burn from. Shoto breathing quickened. You don't know, do you? Toya stopped in his tracks. Don't know what. Reaching up to touch the scar over his left eye, Shoto replied. Endeavor didn't give me this scar, our mother did. Toya's face flushed red. Don't you dare lie about this. You're covering for that monster, he's made you say this. She used boiling water from the kettle. Shoto paused. She scalded that side of my face, because it looked like his face, Endeavor's. The only reason I didn't lose my sight in that eye is because the water had cooled slightly. Toya didn't speak, he couldn't. She was arrested. She got ten years in a mental facility, I haven't seen her since then. Shoto stopped speaking, staring at Toya. He was crying. You're not fake. Shoto realized. This isn't just an illusion. Toya didn't hear him. Oi, Juchigata. A villain with a fish head poked Toya's shoulder. You there, blue boy. You're just trying to trick me. Toya said, his arms lighting on fire. His clothes resisting the flames. Endeavor gave you that scar. I know it. And he framed mom for it. I'll make you admit it. Igniting his palms in a similar manner to Bakugo. Toya blasted himself towards his brother as the ten villains closed in on Shoto as well. Before any of them could react, a blast of wind blew through the landslide zone, slamming into each of the villains, as well as Toya. Shoto took a step back. All might, he's here. Fucking hell. One of the villains stumbled back to his feet, before looking around. Haha, <laughs> All Might must have though he'd knocked me out. Reaching out to touch Toya, his skin glowing, waking the white-haired boy. Shoto charged forwards, the villain was healing the others, undoing All Might's work. A column of blue fire forced Shoto off target. He brought up an ice wall to protect himself from immolation. Landing beyond the villains, Shoto turned to see the healing villain was restoring a fourth villain. Slamming his right foot down, Shoto sent a wave of ice at the healing villain. Blue fire melted it before it could even get halfway. That won't work, Shou-chan. Toya's eyes flicked, his expression furious. That was just the distraction. A block of ice sailed through the air, appearing from the steam cloud of the ice wall's destruction, hitting the healing villain in the forehead, knocking him out cold. Endeavor trained you well. Toya set his left arm ablaze. But he trained me just as well. Better even. I don't want to hurt you Shou-chan, but what I have to do is bigger than both you and me. A wave of blue fire shot at Shoto, forcing him to dodge, creating an ice slide to skate around Toya, slamming his hand into the chest of the gray-skinned villain, refreezing him immediately. Another ice slide. Shoto came to a halt a short distance away. Before he fully negated his velocity, Shoto watched as Toya melted the gray-skinned villain free. Shoto sighed. This is going to be a problem. He would need to alter his fighting style. He needed to get close to Toya and knock him out physically, otherwise he'd just keep freeing the other villains. Using an ice column, Shoto launched himself at his brother faster than the white-haired teen could react, 
driving a fist into his gut. Toy aside, grabbing Shoto's wrist as he straightened up. Before slamming his palm into his brother's chest, Shoto was flung back, hitting the ground and rolling, slamming his hand down to create an ice slide to carry himself away. Not bad, you'll make a powerful hero. Toy aside, once I've torn this corrupt system down it'll be up to you rebuild it, better than before. Shoto didn't reply, but there is something in the way. Toya paused, you need to use all of your quirk, not just your ice. I'll never use his fire. Shoto encased his right arm in ice, dropping into a fighting stance. It's your power, Shoto. Use it. That fire will never be my power. All I see is him every time I use it. Toya sighed again. If you want to be a great hero you can't just handicap yourself. Slice, show him the errors of his argument. One of the villains nodded, holding his hands together and pulling them apart, forming a blade of condensed air. Slice burst into motion, moving at unnatural speed towards Shoto, slamming his right foot down on the ground. Shoto created a wall of ice in between, using his right hand to form a blade of ice, readying himself to fight Slice. The air blade cut through the ice wall like a hot knife through butter, the top half sliding away to reveal empty space. Hearing a noise behind him, Shoto twisted around, bringing his ice blade up to block Slice's. Slice smiled. That won't work on me. The air blade cut through the ice without resistance, carrying on and slicing through Shoto's arm. He felt no pain. Shoto blinked, staring down at the stump where his left arm had been. Just below the elbow, the end was covered in smooth and clear skin, not a drop of blood to be seen. My arm. His arm was on the ground, yet he could still feel it, even the sensation of his palm touching the ground. Shoto commanded his left hand to form a fist. The arm on the ground clenched its hand into a fist. Slice shrugged, a smug look on his face. My quirk, it allows me to cut things with a blade I form myself, without harming them. Don't worry, your arm will be back to normal in an hour or so. You won't always be able to use your eyes, Shoto. Toya nodded to Slice, the villain walking back towards his ally. Consider this a lesson. You three, attack him. The three remaining villains charged into action, racing at Shoto. Shoto stared down at his detached arm, a plan forming in his mind, forcing me to fight with just fire. Shoto picked up his detached arm with his other arm. You really have turned into our father. Toya physically recoiled. Shoto had his opening, throwing his detached arm down on the ground. Shoto activated his quirk, ice forming from where his palm made contact, engulfing the three villains entirely. Using an ice column under his right foot, Shoto launched himself at Slice and Toya. Landing, more ice bloomed from under his foot, encasing both of the villains. Shoto slammed his elbow into his brother's temple with his momentum, before Toya could melt the ice. You brat. Slice formed an air blade in one hand, breaking it through the ice as he did. Before he could free himself, Shoto lashed out with a back fist, sending Slice to join Toya in unconsciousness. Shuddering, Shoto looked down to see his right arm had returned to its normal position. Even the sleeve of his costume was repaired and whole. Taking stock of the situation, Shoto made sure each of the villains, including his brother, were restrained or unconscious. With one last look at his brother, Shoto turned and set off for the main plaza, the last place he had seen those three monsters. Reaching the edge of the landslide zone, Shoto turned, running towards the main plaza. A sudden blast of air shot up from the center of the USJ, smashing a massive hole in the roof and blowing Shoto clean off his feet. Using another ice slide to negate his momentum, Shoto glided to a halt, staring up at the sky though USJ's newest skylight. What was that? Shoto wondered. One of the monsters from before slammed down not far from Shoto, out cold, the bark covering its body broken and shattered, revealing the pale skin below. A booming voice echoed through the USJ, rattling the remaining glass in the facility. It's fine now, because I am here. Thirteen called out. Back Hugo, get back. Makumo activated the UV mode of his visor, searching for the ring of UV lights on Hagakir's glove. There was every chance the pale man would dispose of her now he'd gotten what he wanted, breaking into USJ. Kirajiri laughed, before swelling in size. There, be gone, hero brats. Makumo surged forwards, reaching out for Hagakure. The purple mist engulfed the students, swallowing them up, writhe in torment, until you breathe your last. The ground vanished out from underneath Makumo. Wind and rain whipped around Makumo as he fell towards the ground. Activating his repulsor souls, Makumo slowed himself, hitting the surface of the road hard enough to crack it. Makumo looked around himself, the rain obscuring his vision. Hagakure, are you here? No reply. Hagakure. She isn't here. Makumo turned, activating the enhanced sight of his visor to see through the torrential rain. A man in his twenties stood in the middle of the road, his long, white hair tied back. Mr. Aizawa. The man snorted. Not exactly. My name is Sengata. How do you look like him? Sengata shrugged. Would you believe me if I said a racer had started very early? Makumo stared at Sengata, nonplussed. Sengata rolled his neck. Yeah, didn't think you would. You're with those villains, aren't you? Makumo questioned, watching the man warily. The pale man, 
You mean the brat? Shigaraki. Sangata shrugged again. Pretty much. Father said I should. Father. Sangata's eyes narrowed, examining Makumo. Our father, you know, all for one. All for one. Makumo replied, confused. My father. Yeah. All for one's love child. One of the ones he didn't grow in a vat? Lucky brat. Sangata paused. I guess your mother never told you your father was the greatest supervillain the world has ever seen then? Izuku. Mikumo started. I Izuku. Surprised I know your name. Izuku Midoriya. Sangata smiled, the warmth never reaching his eyes. I know a lot more as well, like the fact you were bullied as a child for being thought quirkless. The dark-haired boy flinched, being reminded of his own childhood. Sucks, doesn't it? Sangata continued. I know how it feels. I was quirkless too, the only one in my batch, the only one of the perfect clones of all for one to fail to manifest his quirk, or a variation thereof. Mikumo let him talk, giving more time for help to hopefully arrive. Cloning is illegal. Has been for over a century. Mikumo commented. And you think someone like all for one cares about the law? Mikumo frowned. Good point. Sangata smiled. I've got plenty more where they came from. So where was I again? This guy is pretty airheaded for a maniacal villain. Sangata pulled a set of cue cards out of a pocket, flipping through them. Oh yeah, I remember now. I was created quirkless, but all for one recognized potential in me, in my mind, he gave me a quirk, made me strong. Reiteration. The ability to copy the quirk of anyone I can see, until I blink again. Raising an eyebrow, Makuma watched Sangata recite the pre-prepared speech, the casual disinterest clearly written on his face. It's a quirk similar to yours, but yours is so much more. The ability to copy the quirks of those you touch, you could copy all for one's quirk. You said it before, who the hell is all for one? And why would I care about his quirk? Sangata rolled his eyes at the interruption. All for one, you know, the merchant of quirks? The first demon. That's just an urban legend. And Makumo didn't believe in legends. An urban legend that can give and take quirks at will. A quirk you can have as well. All you need to do is to copy it, you could be a god. Join us, Midoriya. Makumo sighed. I'm not Midoriya. Sangata looked taken aback. What do you mean, you're not Midoriya? You look just like the picture, except the hair dye. Class 1 is going to find this hilarious. Mikumo groaned. I'm not Midoriya, we just look similar. Sangata rolled his eyes. Damn it, Kurajiri. So, considering your appearance you must be another of father's bastards, right? Never met my parents. So, yeah, you are one of them. Sangata tucked the cue cards back into his pocket. That's okay. That's okay. I'm sure father would like to have another of his children rejoin him. Mikumo's eyes darkened. He isn't my father, and I'll never join him or you. I'm going to be a hero. Sangata sighed. Fine, another failure. Remember at least make it interesting while I kill you. Makumo charged up the repulsors of his gauntlets, ready to fight. Sangata's eyes glowed red, his white hair floating around his head. Why can't I copy your quirk? Makumo smiled. Simple, because I don't have one. Sangata looked put out. Pity, I was looking forward to seeing what kind of crazy quirk you might have got from our father. Igniting his repulsor souls, Makumo launched a kick at Sangata, but found it passed through empty air. Tilting his head, Makumo watched as Sangata threw a punch at the back of his head, firing the repulsor in the palm of his right hand. Makumo twisted out of the way, flipping into the air and using a grapple to move out of Sangata's range. That suit won't save you, Sangata said, looking to where Makumo stood. I may not have a quirk I can copy. That doesn't mean father didn't design this body to be stronger and faster than a normal person. Sangata burst towards Makumo at a near inhuman speed, his fist outstretched. That's where you're wrong. Aspect, activate Excel mode. Of course, pilot Yamakumo, may I recommend 15% power. Do it. Suddenly, Makumo was a blur, bouncing from wall to wall with his repulsor souls, his speed dwarfing Sangata's. This suit isn't a crutch because I don't have a quirk. Makumo delivered a kick to Sangata's chest, slamming him against a wall. This suit is my quirk. I am shatterproof. Shatterproof speed increased, reduced a little more than a blur of orange, the lights from the repulsors forming. Two punches hit Sangata in quick succession, driving him to the ground. I'll never give up again. A final kick slammed into Sangata's crossed arms, twin cracks sounding before the villain was flung back the length of the road, tumbling over and over. Coming to a halt, Sangata weakly struggled to climb to his feet, his arms hanging limply by his sides. In a swish of air, Makumo was holding Sangata in the air with one hand, his other formed in a fist. Aspect. Initialize capture scenario 009. Affirmative. Pilot Yamakumo. Driving his free fist into Sangata's chest. Part of the gauntlet attached itself to the villain as he was slammed against the wall behind. Unfolding, the device spewed cable in every direction, snaking around Sangata's body and securing themselves to the wall. This won't hold me, quirkless. Mikumo frowned. 
No, it won't, but this will. The electricity surged through the cables, originating from the device on the villain's chest. Zangata cried out in pain and shock. Before lapsing into unconsciousness, silence fell, broken only by Makumo's heavy breathing. Makumo poked Zangata in the cheek, confirming he was out for the count. Oh, thank heavens. Releasing a sigh, Makumo collapsed to his knees, using Excel mode had taken a serious toll on his stamina. The computerized voice spoke again. Pilot Yamakumo. The internal monitoring systems are showing an elevated heart rate and breathing beyond what was expected. It appears Excel mode requires some refinement. Makumo nodded, before realizing his mistake. Why yeah, it does. Run an analysis on the data once your connection to the main server is restored. The unit in the suit doesn't have the processing power for it. Of course, would you like me to guide you to where the tracker in Miss Hagakure's gauntlet is indicating? Yeah. Makumo took a deep breath, before forcing himself back to his feet. That pale man could be on the hunt to dispose of her. Following Aspect's instructions, Makumo trudged through the simulated wind and rain. Aspect had been his first invention. He'd known he wouldn't be able to handle all the complex processes a system like STHR would have manually. She was fairly rudimentary, capable of running the suit in simple pattern recognition, but Makumo still considered the AI his greatest creation, although she had developed the habit of calling him that nickname all by herself. Ungrateful bitch. Makumo tensed. He knew that tone of voice he had heard whenever his old foster parents talked about or to him. A slap echoed. Makumo peered around the corner of a building, finding an empty street. I am sorry. Something in Makumo's chest clenched. That was Hagakure. You've been very bad, Toru. This voice was masculine, as opposed to the previous one which had been feminine. I I be be better, I promise. The woman spoke again. We are very disappointed in you, Toru. First you cut part of your hair, which you know you're not allowed to do, for stupid costume and now you refuse to join us. You owe us this, the man this time. You belong to us, Toru. You will do as we say. Makumo's stomach sank as he made the realization, remembering the interaction between Hagakure and the pale man the day before. Hagakure was holding a folder, in front of her was a pale, blue-haired man, his voice monotone. I'm sure you parents will be glad to hear you made the right choice. The pale man scratched his neck, his dry skin flaking. For their sake, that man hadn't been threatening to hurt Hagakure's parents if she hadn't gotten that folder. He had been threatening that Hagakure's parents would hurt her if she hadn't gotten that folder. Hagakure's parents were villains, and they were forcing her to become one as well, against her will. I'm sorry, Makumo. Without a quirk you just can't be a hero. Maybe you should think about policing instead. Heroes can't be quirkless, you idiot. Why don't just become a stupid villain, Akatani? Everyone knows that's all quirkless losers are good for, so heroes can look good when they take you down in one hit. Makumo's feet moved before he could think, Aspect activating the visor's thermal mode as he launched himself at Hagakure's father, the invisible man's hand coming down for another strike. Hagakure closed her eyes, bracing herself for the coming slap. It never came. You fucking brat. Opening her eyes, Hagakure took in the sight of Makumo standing in front of her, his armor reflecting a simulated lightning bolt, fist outstretched. I'm sorry, Hagakure, I should have got here sooner. Makumo looked back, shooting her a small smile. What hell do you think you're doing, you stupid kid? Hagakure could see the translucent outline of her father, an outline that only others with invisibility quirks could see. He was visibly vibrating with anger. This is a family matter. Makumo's face hardened, suddenly looking a lot older than 15. You're not going to touch her, in fact, you're never going to touch her again. Hagakure's mother spoke. Toru, I order you to get away from that boy. Hagakure looked down. I I don't want to. Don't want to. Hagakure's father roared. We are your parents, you will do as we say. Mikumo spoke before Hagakir could. You know, I can't remember what my parents were like. I don't know what having parents is like. Igniting his souls, Mikumo rocketed forwards. But I know this isn't it. A punch nailed Hagakir's father in the chest, an invisible look of shock on his equally invisible face. You can see us. Hagakir's father wheezed, bent over, trying to suck the air back into his lungs. Mikumo smirked, tapping his visor. Thermal vision. Not bad for a quirkless kid, right? Quirkless, Hagakir's mother repeated. Well then, it won't be hard to beat a useless child, even if he can see us. Quirkless, not useless, Mikumo said, his tone resolute. There's a big difference. Hagakir's parents didn't reply. Do you know what the difference is? Mikumo paused. The difference is, I'm going to beat you, without a quirk. Hagakir watched in disbelief. Until now she'd assumed Mikumo had some kind of intelligence or technopathy quirk. And more than that, I will be a hero, and a quirkless hero at that. Hagakir's mother launched herself at Mikumo, only to find her arm gripped in the teen's hand. 
Makumo pivoted and sent her flying with a throw, slamming her back down on the unforgiving concrete. Her invisibility failed, revealing a brown-haired woman in her late thirties, dressed in a form-fitting red jumpsuit. Yoko, Hagakir's father charged at Makumo, only to find empty air. Turning, Makumo met Hagakir's father in a brutal melee. A series of punches and kicks thrown with increasing speed, Yoko Hagakir coughed as she rolled over, her back a mass of pain, looking to her daughter. Help your father, dear, he cares about you in his own way. She coughed again. All we do, we do it for you. A world without heroes, a world we can use our quirks freely, isn't that what you want? Hagakir curled in on herself. I want to be a hero. Her mother smiled. You can be, you can be our hero, okay. Hagakir shakily got to her feet as her mother did the same. Yoko Hagakir smiled as she took Hakegir's hand. We can be together, a family Toru, happy and free. Pausing, Hagakir shook as her mother brushed away her tears with her thumb, before reactivating her invisibility. You're my light, Toru, I'll be so proud of you. Hagakir nodded, fresh tears replacing those that had been wiped away. Tashiaki Hagakir grunted in pain as he was knocked away, hitting the ground hard enough to force the air out of his lungs. Makumo turned, seeing Hagakir and her mother ready to fight him. Hagakir, you don't have to do this. Makumo pleaded, taking a step forward. I have to, I have to. Hagakir shouted, unable to stop her tears. What other choice do I have? You have a choice, right here, right now. Makumo said, a choice between what is expected of you, and of what you know it is right to do. Idealistic brat. Hagakir's father grasped one of Makumo's feet from where he lay. Toru, now. Hagakir paused, before shakily nodding. Light refraction. Hagakir's body suddenly flashed brightly, blinding Makumo. Stumbling back, Makumo tripped, one of his legs still held in place. As he hit the ground, Makumo heard a smashing sound, dreading what it meant. Opening his eyes, Makumo blinked rapidly as his sight slowly came back. His visor was smashed, blue plexiglass scattered on the road surface, one fragment buried below Makumo's left eye. Hagakir and her parents were gone, without his visor he couldn't see them. A set of hands grabbed his arms, holding them behind his back with surprising strength. Excellent work, darling. Makumo tilted his head at the sound of Tashiaki Hagakir's voice, the direction making it clear he wasn't the one restraining him. I knew that super move was ready. You need to stop doubting yourself so much, dear. That was Hagakir's mother, the voice coming from behind him. So she was the one holding his arms in place then. The sound of a knife being unsheathed reached Makumo's ears, watching as a knife seemed to appear from thin air. Toru, it seems only fitting you should do the honors. The knife was held out. Another invisible hand took it, this one shaking. Your first kill to mark the start of your new life, your awakening. Makumo took a deep breath, before looking to where he now knew Hagakir was standing. You don't need to do this. This isn't you. Hagakir's hand shook more violently, taken aback by the way Makumo was somehow able to look her in the eyes without being able to see her. How? How could you possibly know that? Hagakir's voice was shaky. You've only known me a day. Makumo chuckled, without any mirth. I grew up in a series of foster homes and orphanages, a quirkless freak everyone wished would just go away. Even the ones who pretended to be nice were just doing it to hurt me. So, I learned to read people pretty quickly. It didn't take me long to work out what kind of person you are. Mikumo gave a small smile. You have a good heart. You care about people. I saw that yesterday. You made sure to pick a classroom out of the way, so that pale guy wouldn't decide to dust anyone he came across on the way. The knife was shaking even more now. Hagakir was barely even holding it. Mikumo's smile widened. That's why I know, Hagakir. I know you can be a hero. The knife clattered to the ground. Mikumo felt something brush past his shoulder, before his arms were suddenly free, followed by the sound of two bodies hitting the road. Toru, you ungrateful bitch. Hagakir's father went to charge at his daughter, only to be stopped by Mikumo grabbing his leg, tripping him. Yoko Hagakir's hand went to slap her daughter. It never came. Hagakir's grip tightened around her mother's wrist. I won't be controlled by you two again. How dare you speak to me that way? I'm your. Toru struck her mother with the back of her hand. You're nothing to me. Not anymore. Yoko Hagakir recoiled. All my life you controlled me. You only allowed me to try out for you, eh? To be a mole, a traitor. Toru activated the repulsors in her glove, punching her mother hard enough to send her flying backwards. From now on, I'll make my own path. Nearby, Makumo stood in the middle of the road, slowly looking around himself. He'd lost track of Hagakir's father, and now the invisible man was stalking him. Give up, quirkless. Toshiaki Hagakir taunted. I'll make your death painless. Will I lie? It will be very painful, but that's besides the point. Makumo didn't reply. A punch suddenly struck him in the face, driving the plexiglass fragment deeper into his skin and sending him stumbling. Pathetic. Without that fancy eyewear of yours you really are useless. Makumo could hear the sneer in the man's voice. Worthless. I'll kill you for twisting my daughter's mind. Actually, you know, I torture you first, then have her kill you. 
then she can never be a hero. Mikumo's fists clenched before another punch came, this one to his gut. The invisible man was playing with him, arrogant, believing his invisibility made him invulnerable. And still you won't give up. Toshiaki Hagakure kicked the boy in the shin. How can you fight what you can't see? Another blow struck Mikumo across the face. Hagakure's father laughed. Your eyes can deceive you. A fist buried itself in Mikumo's gut, just below his chest plate. How can you fight what you can't see? Your eyes can deceive you. Mikumo's demeanor suddenly changed, his posture relaxing, his eyes closing. Hakegir's father snorted. Idiot. Launching a punch at the dark-haired boy's face, Tashiaki Hagakir cried out in shock as Mikumo knocked his arm to the side and delivered an open palm strike to his chest, his eyes still closed. How the hell? Hagakir's father slowly regained his balance, retreating away from the armored boy. Mikumo smirked. All my life I've had people out for me, to punish me for daring to be quirkless. I guess I got pretty good at hearing threats before I could see them. The invisible man changed his angle of attack, sending a kick at Mikumo's back. Before it could land, Mikumo twisted it and caught it, holding it in place. You've hurt Hagakir, forced her to undermine her dream. Mikumo charged up his repulsors, before bringing his gauntlet-covered fist down. Tashiaki Hagakir's leg snapped, making the man yell out in pain. Aspect. Capture Scenario 007. Understood, pilot Yamakumo. The grapple fired from the side of the chest armor, wrapping around the invisible man and restraining him. You'll never hurt her again. Mikumo stood tall over the captured villain. We'll see about that. Tashiaki drawled. You may have won the battle, but you've already lost the war. All might will die. Hero society will fall. I will stand in its ash. Mikumo silenced the villain with a punch to the face, leaving him unconscious. Turning, Mikumo prepared to go to help Hagakure. Akatoni. Mikumo turned. Hagakure was wearing the boots and gloves of her normal costume again. H. Hi, are you okay? Hagakure's hands gathered into fists. How can you be so nice to me? I hurt you. Mikumo took a step forward, a soothing smile on his face. It's okay. It's not. It can't be. I'm a villain. All of this is my fault. Hagakure's arms dropped to her sides. I didn't want to get hurt again, so I did what my parents and Shigaraki told me to do. Mikumo took Hagakure's hand. She pulled away. You're not a villain. A villain doesn't care about others like you do. Mikumo nodded reassuringly. If this is your fault, then we'll set it right, together. Mikumo held out an armored hand. Looking up, Hagakir hesitated, before slowly taking the hand offered to her. We'll face this together, okay. Mikumo smiled. You didn't have a choice before. That pale man would just have killed you if you'd refused to give him that folder, but right now, we'll stop them. Hagakir nodded, finding her resolve. Then let's go. Together, setting off together, Mikumo and Hagakir quickly encountered their first crowd of villains. They looked like they'd been beaten once already. The two teens made short work of them. The only one of villains, with a very minor shock absorption quirk, had posed any threat at all, forcing Mikumo to briefly use 5% Excel to overpower his resistance. The main plaza is this way. Mikumo boosted his strength and slammed into the main doors of the downpour zone, breaking them open. Stop right there. Mikumo turned. Hagakir was being restrained by an equally invisible person. Sangata, you escaped. Mikumo looked to the empty air behind Hagakir's gloves and boots. I told you that you couldn't hold me. Sangata sneered. Until now I was just doing as father asked, but you've royally pissed me off. The knife at Hagakir's throat tightened, threatening to cut, but I am feeling a little generous. Sangata faded back into view. He had blinked. Give me the suit and all your plans, and I'll let little Toru live. Can't say I'll do the same for you. Why do you want the suit? Simple, you proved today I'm pretty much useless when fighting a quirkless. With your suit I could level the playing field. Hagakir called out. Don't give it to him. We all have a choice, right, Akatani? Mikumo hesitated, his eyes drifting behind Sangata and Hagakir for a few seconds. Sangata drew a few drops of blood. I'll kill her. No, you won't. Hagakir fired her palm repulsor, tearing the glove covering it to shreds, directly in Sangata's groin area. Sangata doubled over, dropping the knife and releasing Hagakir. Taste my spirit of vengeance, foul villain. Takoyami dropped from a building, dark shadow slamming into Sangata and pinning him to the ground. Are you okay, Hagakure? Mikumo queried, approaching the invisible girl as Takoyami and Koda restrained the quirk-copying villain. Hagakure nodded, regaining her usual cheer and giving Mikumo a thumbs up. Yeah, I'm okay. Mikumo placed a hand on her transparent shoulder. It's okay to not be okay, you know that, right? Hagakure paused, before speaking quietly, so only Mikumo could hear. You're right, I'm not okay, but right now, I just have to be. With a small smile, Mikumo replied. Okay then, then let's be okay for now. Hagakir matched his expression, before turning to her classmates. Thanks for the help, Takoyami, Koda. You are most welcome, Hagakir. Both Takoyami and Dark Shadow bobbed their heads in acknowledgement. Koda mumbled a response, too quiet for Mikumo to hear. 
We should return to the entrance. It is the logical place to meet. Takoyami looked to his fellow teens. Dark shadow picking up the unconscious Sengata. Mikumo nodded. Let's. A blast of wind suddenly tore through the area, forcing Mikumo to fire both his grapples into the ground and grab Hagakir's wrist to stop themselves from being blown away. Kota crouched down, his bulk and frame allowing him to weather the blast, while Dark Shadow dropped Sengata to secure both Takoyami and itself to one of the zone's main doors. What was that? Hagakir questioned as the wind died down, landing on her feet. Mikumo released his tethers. The wind had taken Sengata's motionless form with it. I think that was. It's fine now, because I am here. All might. Ten minutes earlier, Tashinori cleared his throat awkwardly. I didn't realize you would be coming today, Murai. No point waiting around. Nidai adjusted his glasses. Tashinori noted his former partner was noticeably more muscular than he was the last time they had been face to face. Then again, Nidai wasn't his sidekick anymore. As a pro hero is his own right he couldn't rely on the strength of others. You look, well, Tashinori offered a genial smile. You look like crap. Still straight to the point, aren't you, Murai? Nedzu patted Nidai on the knee. There's no point wasting time with niceties at times like this. Nidai looked to Tashinori. I want to do this and leave as quickly as possible. Tashinori sighed. Murai, don't, Tashinori. Nidai interrupted. If we get into that argument we'll be here all day. And I'm not willing to spend any more time with a man throwing his life away for any longer than I have to. Nedzu dropped from the sofa. I'll leave you two to talk. Tashinori shot Nedzu a pleading look, hoping he would stay. Nedzu left. An uncomfortable silence fell over the two men. Murai, I understand you are upset I didn't pass one for all onto young Tagata. Upset? Absolutely not. Nidai paused. Disappointed. Very. Tashinori sighed. Murai, I recommended Mirio as your successor, a student I had been training for nearly a year at that time. Tashinori sighed. Murai, instead, you chose a random, quirkless boy, with no physical training, off the street, without ever even bothering to meet Mirio. Murai, Tashinori's tone was clipped. You said back then I should find a successor who embodies the same ideals as I do. I didn't choose Izuku Midoriya because I thought he could be like me. Tashinori paused. I chose him because I know he can be better than me. Besides, Izuku is far from quirkless, something that was only discovered after you had already passed one for all onto the boy. Nidai sighed. That isn't the point. Whether Izuku had a quirk or not is irrespective of why I chose him. His parentage is the point. Nidai steeped his fingers, the annoyance clear on his face. How did you manage to just so pick the son of all for one as your successor? I'll admit, I dismissed the idea of Izuku being the son of that man, despite the resemblance, for one reason. All for one would kill any quirkless child of his, but he isn't quirkless. Nidai looked at Tashinori over the top of his glasses, and now that is known, all for one will be coming for his son, to have him join him. Izuku would never become a villain, that's something I'm sure of. Just because he's the son of a villain doesn't mean he's destined to become one himself. All for one is a villain. He's the villain. The first demon. That doesn't matter, Izuku has the heart of a hero. Well then, lead the way, I'll see if that's true. After all, that's why you asked me to come. Tashinori stood, collecting his suit jacket. This way then, Tashinori and Murai set off side by side, heading for the USJ. Just for a second, Tashinori could believe that they were All Might and Sir Nidai, partners in crime fighting. But times change. What has been done could not be undone. 